Since March, we have all experienced many challenges we never expected, both personally and professionally. B41 Workplace Wellbeing will look at issues in the workplace, including mental health, fitness, working remotely, and much more. Good morning everybody, welcome to B41, coming to you live from Blenheim Palace. I'm joined this morning by my co-host Emma Gascoigne, and I'm also joined by CEO of Blenheim Palace, Dominic Kerr. Good morning, darling. Morning, it is lovely to have you here. Fantastic, well, what, what, a, what a wonderful place to start our first B41. Um, well, we're very proud to have that, that um, blessing. Actually, we'll get some sort of plaque outside maybe at some point. <laughs> Definitely. Great, so, so the format of the day, we, we've got um, Brief chat with Dom first, then, then our, our talk start at 8.40, and we run all the way through till um, 5 p.m. Um, if you want to check out the agenda, please do so at b4-business.com. Uh, you'll see the full list of speakers there uh, for today's um, web webinar. I'd just like to thank all the team here today. We've got quite a team. I don't know, Barbara, whether you can swivel around or not, but um, with the camera, no, you can't. <laughs> but um, they're, they're nobody wants to be seen, but we've got a good 10 strong team here. Uh, we've got Justin, we've got Clark, we've got Matt, Rob, Lorna, Ed, Barbara, Abby, and we've got Keith at home. So thank you everybody for, for supporting us and to all of you for, for, for joining us um, online. So it is a first, so we might have the odd hiccup, but we're, we're trying our best, and, you know, so do bear with us. If anything does go down, we'll, we'll put the uh, put a screen saver up, but let's keep our fingers crossed and hope we, we're, we're live all day long. So Don, workplace wellbeing. How is the last, was it six months now, five months? It took, Whiz by being for you, sort of managing the ship here at the Blenheim? Uh, it's been a huge challenge. I think a lot of the routine stuff that you, know, you take for granted every year, everything from a budget cycle to planning a marketing campaign, every bit of that has suddenly changed. And we've had to learn to do it with people far more distanced as well. So we've, we've learnt an awful lot the hard way of, of, of lessons about how we take care of our staff. Um, also impressive is how the wider community has done it as well. And I think we've learned as, as much, if, if not more, from businesses and other people we deal with and the way they've looked after staff. And some truly impressive examples that we can explore later. But you know, in particular, a, a law firm that is essentially spending £200,000 per partner per year purely on communicating with their staff and making sure they're okay through this crisis. And you know, law firms are pretty mercenary. But also, you know, ticketing Bye. systems, it's true. <laughs> well, they, they know the value of their time. Um, they, they cost this stuff. And, and also, you know, ticketing system providers in America who spent the whole of the summer running seminars for their whole business ecosystem to make sure they were okay. Um, and so I think there's a huge amount to learn from outside as well as inside. Emma, we haven't heard from you yet this morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's the lockdown been for you? Oh, it's been, it's been it's been um, certainly something which I've learned a lot about myself during this time. I um, have found it difficult at times, actually. Mm. Um, so I'm really looking forward to today. It's a great subject to, to kick off B41. Well, it certainly resonated with a lot of the B4 community and, and beyond. So yeah, we're really looking forward to some fantastic speakers. But going forward now, Dom, uh, at Blenheim, uh, how normal or abnormal are things? And how, I mean, you obviously had a, a big event last week, Salon Privé in with, with you know, a good number of people in through the gates, have you got other events planned and obviously got the lights coming up in, uh, in November, December? Yeah, I think the next big thing for us is the light trail, which luckily is an outdoor thing and has always run with timed, separated capacity so that we can stretch that and keep it safe. Uh, business for us, you know, our, our property businesses, to be fair, are doing fine. There's a lot of activity in the property world. The visitor attraction is running at about somewhere between 50 and 60% of normal, which we couldn't sustain for the long run, but frankly is better than almost any other attraction we know, and we're very, very grateful for public support. But there are elements like weddings and, and uh, corporate events, which are, are, are zero at the moment. And I think we were once upon a time optimistic that you know, next year would see a real massive recovery as all these deferred events suddenly move to next year, but I think the, the Prime Minister's guidance about six months has really taken the wind out of the sails of, of both customers and, 
and uh, venues like us. So, yeah, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, Oxfordshire is very dependent on international tourism. Uh, Blenheim, actually, weirdly, slightly less so. The annual pass product means we get an awful lot of local support um, compared to most. But that international tourist market is virtually zero. And, and the latest guidance from Visit Britain and their sentiment work and from Heathrow and people like that who, for whom this is their lifeblood is they don't think we'll get back to normality until about 2024. So that part of our business is going to be a, a, a slow, patient recovery. period of time where we were in lockdown uh, we had um, that one hour or so to, to go and actually get some exercise have you found that a lot of people have discovered Blenheim? I, I think they have uh, at the beginning of the lockdown it was purely local people because that's what you could do and people came from a, maybe a five mile radius but they came in big numbers and they were really careful of each other um, but the summer saw an outdoor programme on a scale we've not done before responding to a customer demand particularly for young families needed places for their kids not just to have some freedom but also to kind of make make contact with nature and and discover new safe things and so i think that will be the pattern for the next eight months we'll see that increasingly so we'll become a much more outdoor place even in the depths of winter uh, families are looking for the safest kind of experience dominic has half the person so you've been tending to your well-being haven't you dominic tell us a bit more well, it's, it's, the inability, it, <laughs> it's the inability to consume daily cappuccinos and eat pizza at the Blenheim Pizzeria and afternoon teas in here. I think that's what's done it. Uh, yeah, we have to, um, you have to look after yourself too. And I think, uh, for me, exercise patterns went through the floor, that kind of thing. So I dealt with it the only way I could, which is uh, an intermittent fasting diet. And I have, yeah, I feel okay for it. I feel okay. You look well. Don't get recognised. <laughs> Put the mask on and lose the weight. People are going, who the hell are you? <laughs> but you feel better for it? Yeah, I do. I do. I'm looking forward to maintaining it, actually. Increased energy levels? Possibly. It's difficult to tell when your routine has gone from being on your feet much of the day to sitting on a video mm. camera uh, at the dining room table. Uh, but I, I, I think, I, I, I'm sure one of the lasting things will be a, a, a kind of leaner, healthier, more ener energised me. God help everyone. So you'll be getting back and running around the park occasionally or? I'd love to do triathlon next year. Yeah. I was, I was so thrilled. How did that, that go first, this year? It went really, really well. I was so thrilled because it raises 600,000 pounds or something for yeah. great causes, not least blood wise, the, the leukemia charity, but a whole bunch of other ones too. And, and yeah, raising money for good causes is a huge part of our purpose and ambition at Blenheim. And, and a lot of that has been wiped out this year. Uh, just because you couldn't do mass events and a lot of our fundraising comes from mass participation sports. But we were probably the first event of its type to run in this country. Uh, we closed everything else down at Blenheim. There were no other visitors to the palace. We, we limited spectator numbers, but we pretty much had a, a full um, roster of triathletes raising money and they all said they felt safe. We had no concerns from the public at all. And uh, we don't have the final total yet, but I'd be amazed if it was any less than the £600,000 they managed last year. Brilliant. Well, we look forward to seeing you in a wetsuit next year, Dom. <laughs> and that river's a pain, so... Uh, oh, you've done it before, though, haven't you? I have done it a few times before. I'm, I, I may, having boldly said I'm going to do the triathlon next year, I also have a vote in the when are we going to drain the lake and dredge the Queen Pool bit. So I may be able to get myself off the hook by choosing the wrong moment to dress the lake. Brilliant, fantastic. Brilliant, John. Well, we'll hear from you later. We're going to go to our first live link. Um, so we've got uh, Cheryl Britton um, from YOLO. Um, in, in 2019, Cheryl launched YOLO Wellbeing, a unique experience designed specifically for businesses to help employers improve the physical and mental health of their workforce. Cheryl, are you with us? Fantastic. Technology is working. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I just... Uh, you're joining us from, uh, from Lancashire? Sorry, say that again. You're joining us from Lancashire, aren't you, this morning? I am, yes. Yeah. Fantastic. What well, do you want to tell us a little bit about YOLO and, and how it came to be? You had um, uh, a, a career before YOLO, obviously, and decided to, to change your path. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I launched YOLO Wellbeing and the YOLO Experience uh, last September to help employers improve the mental and physical health of staff 
through a combination of massage and meditation that I deliver in a, a mobile calm space that I can bring to the premises. Uh, Hands-on massage was something that stopped quite abruptly. Um, but what I did find quite quickly, and um, Dominic just alluded to it there, um, working at the kitchen table, a lot of people were kind of thrown into working from home without having much time to plan. And as a result, over 60% of people have been working from uh, improvised workstations. And some of that has caused um, problems with posture and aches and pain. So um, I now offer online um, consultations to help people improve the posture by making reasonable adjustments at the, the stations that they're working from, but also help with stretch and relaxation sessions as well. Fantastic. And, and what sort of clients do you have? Like if you, uh, you, you said before, I mean, you, you've got a fantastic people store, I saw your van online, you've got a fantastic customised van, you go out to clients with, but obviously you're doing a lot of what you do now online. Has that increased your, your client base and your geography that you work with? Absolutely. It just means that I can reach a wider audience in terms of being able to, um, I'm, I'm with, with the van itself, I'm limited usually to the northwest of England, but with the online consultations, I, I can work globally. Fantastic. So give us a bit of a flavour of, of what you do with the business if they got in contact with you. And we're going to see one of your videos later, I think, during the day. So give people a bit, of, a bit more of a flavour of what you do. But obviously, you've got your website that people can visit. But uh, give us a bit of a flavour. Anybody interested in your services, what, what, what's the sort of procedure they gave, go through? Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of the online consultations that I provide, um, prior to, to doing the consultation, we do an online survey, which helps employees understand one, how their employees are working from home, but also if it's actually having an impact on, on the health. And we also look at some of the working habits as well. So one thing that I found is that the longer people sit without taking a break and getting up and moving has a, a massive impact on, on posture and on aches and pains. So we find out all that information in advance and once we've got that information we'll then run a consultation depending on um, how much intervention people need so if if they're in quite a good place we'll we'll do a training session or if they need more intervention we'll do a consultation where we'll look directly at, at their station and how we can improve it um, but within that we do um, some breathing exercises and we also do a stretch and relaxation which helps to ease the tension and stiffness in the muscles and joints um, so yeah, it's it, it's it's not just looking at the assessment; it's also looking at the solutions and introducing good working habits for employers and the staff. And I think one thing that's come up quite a lot with employers, they ask the question: Is if I run this session with you, will my will my employees be knocking on my door for new desks and for new um, expensive office equipment? And the answer is no. The way that we approach the, the consultations is very much a case of um, let's make reasonable adjustments to the stations that you're working from at home and let's give you the tools and the education that you need to be able to look after your own health. So we're empowering the employees to be able to manage their own health at home. It's interesting. Uh, I was talking to a client the other day and um, they were talking about one of the junior members of staff who was working from home. And it came to light that that junior member of staff had been perched under the their bed for three months with a laptop on a windowsill and hadn't told anybody about it. And it's sort of getting that information and that intelligence back from, from your teams that maybe don't want to share their home experiences with you. So how do you get you know, that intelligence before it's, uh, before it's too late, potentially? I think and serious injury, potentially, as well. I think that's, that's the important thing. And because we've been now working from home coming up to six months and potentially it could be another six months before people start returning to the office on, on a regular basis, I think now's definitely the time to, to start reviewing that and understanding um, how, how your staff are working and making sure that they're healthy and, and they've, they've got some good habits in place and they're well supported. Because I think it's not just the, the physical side of things. I think we're also seeing the fallout now in terms of the, the mental impact that this is having on people's health um, and you know the uncertainty of, of the situation, not being able to plan, maybe having to give up um, certain elements, you know, lifestyle changes in terms of home life and work life, the lines are blurred. It's just being able to give people that, 
that support that they need to ensure that the productivity is there as well. Brilliant. Joe, sure, really appreciate you joining us this morning. Um, and hopefully we'll, 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 we'll see the video later. And hopefully we'll catch up again soon. Uh, for the presentation. But um, nice to see you again. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Excellent. So with over 20 years fitness experience, Jeanette Cardi aims to resonate, inspire and motivate individuals and change their body, health and lifestyle through fitness. So I think we're joined by Jeanette now. Hi Jeanette. There she is. Good morning Good Jeanette. Jeanette. Yeah. She's probably finishing a workout first. Is she finishing a workout? I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, we're good, thank you. So what are you going to talk to us about today, Jeanette? I can't really hear you. Hold on. Can you hear us now? Yeah, it's a little bit muffled. Well, you yeah. can tell us a little bit about what you've been doing during lockdown. You've been incredibly active on Instagram and uh, all the other social media platforms. Um, you seem to be doing endless uh, courses in your, in your lounge. So tell us how that's been for you and your clients. Yeah, so um, obviously I run my own fitness company and quite a lot of that is face to face. So when lockdown happened, um, very quickly had to move everything online. Um, so I continued sort of training my clients by Zoom and um, still coaching triathlon um, remotely. But we also set up or I set up a online health, fitness and well-being program. And we've now got over 100 and We've got 136 members on that um, within the six months. And it's, that's like live classes, but also access to over 350 workouts, um, motivation, nutrition, life coaching. So it is the whole ethos of well-being um, under one umbrella. And it's been really well received. So it was always something I wanted to do, but always came up with the excuses that I didn't have time. Um, so when your hand is forced, it makes you do that something, doesn't it? And how's your um, fitness and well-being? Is, is it improved? I mean, by doing all this, have you found doing it virtually has, has been more effective for you personally? Yeah, I've had some rough days. Um, definitely. I and, and surprisingly, I had them in the normal lockdown, but I actually had one last Wednesday after Boris's latest announcement. Um, and there's research to say that after six months of going through something, you hit a bit of a wall. And that literally was the six month period. And last Wednesday, I was very low, very um, moody, I would say. <laughs> um, but I'm quite a positive person. And so I use exercise myself to help my own well-being and it lifted me out of the mood quite well. So, I mean, for not everybody is, has got exercise in their lives. Uh, maybe want, wants to embrace exercise, but it's just getting that that spark to make it a part of their lives. How would you how would you sort of try and sell it to them? That, yeah, I mean, important now especially. More than ever? Yeah, originally when we set up the program, we you know we were doing like sixty minute classes, forty five minute classes. And actually, we just finished a 21 day transformation program, which was 21 days, 10 minute workouts. And that has been the best thing ever, because if, if you can't find 10 minutes in your day to exercise, then really we need to look at your time management because everybody has got that 10 minutes. But you're right. It's about the motivation and it's about the drive. For me, when I speak to my clients, I did a talk last night on motivation, and I think it's about knowing your why and having short-term and long-term goals, but also knowing that you've got support. I think that really helps as well. So, you know, if, if what we encourage our people to do is to, on a Sunday, to message me what classes they're going to do so they're accountable for it. And then if they don't do a particular class, you know, it's not like me coming down hard on them, but I might just message them and just ask them, you okay? Do you need anything? Because it is hard and we're spending a lot more time on our own. Um, and you're right, not everybody has motivation to exercise, but I think if you can focus and if you can set in your 
in your diary three lots of 10 minute workouts a week, you're going to feel better for that. And build on that as you get more, it becomes more of a part of your life. Yeah, totally, totally. Because, because going help for leather is, is a recipe for disaster, isn't it really? Just doing too much, you're going to going to end up hating it and yeah. stop doing yeah, it. Yeah, totally. And, and also, I think um, we, we want to try and enjoy what we do and do something in each day for ourselves. Because at the moment, a lot of people are obviously working from home. So they're, they're not really seeing other people. They're, they're probably working longer hours. Um, they're going from the sofa to the kitchen. Um, and so it is important to find something that you do for you. And for me, that might be a hit type workout. For you, it might be a Zumba class. You know, it doesn't, there's no judging. It's, it's doing what you enjoy. And then it becomes, it becomes easier to do rather than it feeling like it's just hard work. But even that for some people might sound daunting. So just, just a walk initially, just to get out and stretch the legs. The walk, yeah, we have, I mean, today we've got um, a seated uh, desk stretching class, you know, for people that are working from home. So to encourage them to actually take a break at 12.30 today. We've got yoga classes, we've got beginner, we've just run a four week beginner Pilates course. You know, there's, there is really something for everyone. Um, and it is about doing what's right for you. And, and what's beautiful about the program is you could try a class and after 10 minutes, if you think, oh, this really isn't for me or five minutes, it doesn't matter. You haven't paid to go to a class and driven an hour to get somewhere. And space, you can just switch it off and go on to something else. And space-wise, a lot of people probably think, you know, you need a huge gym or you know, a huge floor space, but it's amazing what you can do in just the size of an exercise mat. And you don't even need the kit. You know, you can use tins of beans. Um, we do quite a lot of workouts with no kit, purely because people haven't been able to get the kit. Because um, obviously... You mean gym, the, gym, uh, no, not, not gym kit, don't you there, Jim? Just to qualify that particular one <laughs> need you don't need all the stuff um you don't need to convert your house into a gym it's just about using your own body weight really yeah fantastic brilliant Emma, i don't know do if you've got any yeah do you think businesses can um by, by taking part in in one of your classes can actually get a lot to um get a lot from it by building teamwork etc i didn't quite hear that one. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. <laughs> do you think that businesses could get a lot from taking part in your classes uh, it could help build teamwork and actually bring teams together when they're so isolated right? I, um, I think I heard it. Um, I'm doing a, 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 a well-being talk with a company later today and they are um, providing, it's a, it's a surprise for the team, but um, they're providing for the whole team for two months to join our online program because they want to look after the, the team's well-being and the reality is that this is before lockdown, 14% of employees had suicidal thoughts and over 42% of employees felt that they couldn't talk to their bosses or their line managers about their own well-being. Now that's probably gone up even higher because people are worried about whether they're gonna keep their jobs or not um, and showing it as a weakness. So companies right now need to be very supportive and very proactive in in supporting the well-being and the well-being you know isn't just physical it is mental it's emotional and it's 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 being there and and letting your team know that it's okay to not be okay yeah and Jeanette if anybody interested that is watching wants to get hold of you your web address is yeah it's um www.jeanettecardifitness.co.uk Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, lovely of you to join us this morning. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Obviously, you're helping a lot of people. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Thank you, Thank Jeanette. You Jeanette. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, thanks to Cheryl and to uh, Jeanette for joining us. Dom, sorry, you, you were looking at the screen. You couldn't hear anything then, could you? So, <laughs> completely in the dark there. So, uh, but what we're going to do, we're going to come back to Dom in a second. Um, we've got a, a, a short video to show you just to, just to launch... Um, uh, the workplace wellbeing, and we'll be back with you shortly. Workplace wellbeing is a subject that's sometimes overlooked when running a business. How does your colleague's wellbeing help strengthen your organisation? 
Apart from being known as a world-class visitor attraction, Blenheim's strong reputation as a workplace well-being champion is what undoubtedly gives them the edge in staff satisfaction and performance. What does it feel like to work for a business that keeps well-being at the forefront of all they do? I've been working at Blenheim for 14 or 15 years and this is a family. Um, because it's, it's owned by a family, there is an amazing regard for its staff as being family and that's how I feel about the place. It's different because most companies will see you as an asset, not as a human, and, and they will push you and push you. And then once they think that asset is burnt out, get, get another person in. Here, you know, um, there were lots of people, and there still are lots of people who've been here for many, many, many years. And I think that's a good sign that, that it's a good place to work, really. Being a very community-oriented business, how has Blenheim Palace supported their local community during the COVID-19 pandemic? Dudley, uh, the general manager, uh, got in contact with these local charities um, and then came up with a plan um, and then put it forward, I believe, to the palace. Um, and obviously the palace said, well, great idea. You know, we, we got these kitchens just sat here doing nothing. Um, and we had some resource, some food stock. Obviously some items are less perishable than, than others. So, you know, for, well, as well put, put to use, we had freezers full of food. Um, so obviously we, we got, um, we'd make a, on a Wednesday, we'd go and pick up the food. They, they would um, deliver, make food drops to these local families. Um, but yeah, it, it, was, it was enjoyable to do. Because um, obviously when I'm at home not, uh, not cooking, um, you do get a bit of a twitch. And uh, it was my, my harshest critics, my family, so it was nice to cook for people who'd be a bit more appreciative of my food, if I'm honest. Um, so yeah, it was, yeah, it was nice. Because you know, it's, it's that um, you don't do it for yourself, you do it to make others feel good, but you do get a good feeling out of it. You know, it's like you don't do it selfishly, but you do get a good feeling. Um, and you know, the, the positive feedback we had is definitely saying I would like to continue. Um, you know, really get a community around Woodstock, let them, you know, you know like this. Um, I think it's important that we do, um, we do give something to the community, you know. Um, especially, you know, you don't actually realise um, how many unfortunate people there are and, and to, to, until you scratch do a lot of work with employees with issues, free counselling support, champions. Right, we back live. We're back live in the Orangery. So hope you, hope you enjoyed the video, which, uh, which Rob expertly put together uh, with the help of, of your colleagues uh, Alan and Lorna. You've not seen it yet, so we'll have to tell you what they said. <laughs> but they are great exemplars of the, of the best of Blenheim. Lorna has been non-stop supporting her team, and she's come back and done so many different jobs compared to what she's used to just to be part of it. And Alan's been part of an amazing effort to feed um, vulnerable uh, families in Barton um, right through the, the epidemic, um, in, in many cases taking food in from food banks, and then when we get it out and distribute it, and he cooks it all. Uh, so it, it's, it's been great to see them. So many people have engaged in that kind of thing just because they could. So he made the comment in the video that uh, he gets a lot more thanks for the food that he delivers to Barton than he does from his, from his own family at home. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and Lorna also made reference to some video messages that you put out because, and she referenced, you know, it's nice, it was great of you how you kept in contact with your 400 plus team. Well, I think this is one of the, the, the big things that won't change. That, that, I mean, we always try to communicate with our teams, but it's very easy to settle into a rut. And, you know, I used to go around roughly every four months to each team and we'd talk for an hour or so and they'd ask loads of questions and, and we'd send out a monthly email. And, and that was kind of it. Um, but people said they liked it, so that was fine. Of course, that all went out of the window and we had to try and think of every way to communicate like news and worries and solutions and, and try to give the uplifting messages, but also the one-on-one -on -one communication to find out um, you know, who is the person perched on the end of the bed, who is most vulnerable. And I, w I was fascinated actually by us uh, talking to a law firm we use in London, and like, like most city centre law firms in London, not cheap. Um, and uh, you know, law firms. Hmm? Local. Oh, well, that. Um, law firms, you know, typically bill by the the six minutes or something. So they they know the value of their time. And 
uh, quite early on in the crisis, talking to one of their partners, they had set up systems. They have an awful lot of young staff who've come out of university and law school and are in the smallest room you could imagine when they're at home. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a studio flat or it's a one room in a shared house. And they are young and they're probably now away from the supportive environment of the family and university in a, in a new environment. And they, you know, this law firm was seriously worried about these staff. And so every partner, it was set up as a kind of systemized thing. They had to spend an hour and a half of every single day in Zoom calls to their staff below them, checking in on them, making sure that it was nothing more than daily contact. They had proper human contact because they were really worried about what these young isolated staff, you know, the perfect profile for you know, a horrible ending, really, if they get too isolated. They were really, really worried about it and they set it up so every single day, every partner had to do that. And you know, it's, the, the, their charge out rate is you know, 500 quid an hour and they're doing an hour and a half of this a day, so that's 750 quid a day or just under 4,000 a week or around 200,000 pounds a year. Uh, and there's something, I mean, it's not just the accountant in me, you know, we don't cost or budget or, or plan the value of these communications and that time investment in particular. And when you don't build it into the plan that way, often it, it falls away, it doesn't really happen. You delegate it to marketing or HR or something. And yeah, I'm there. They already were a good, a great firm, um, but I was hearing just last week what had happened to their employee engagement and employee happiness scores, which they do measure over the COVID period. It's actually gone up, uh, despite all the horror that was going on around them. They'd never had the, you know, the young staff at this vital, vulnerable, but with also precious early part of their career and life felt valued in a way they never had before. And when you value stuff like that, you put a pound or a time value on it, you can build it into your plans going forward. And, and yeah, for our, from our point of view, you know, we've done loads of stuff, you know, lots of video messages, lots of all staff online Q&As you know, over um, GoToMeeting and Zoom and things like that. Uh, an awful lot more manager to direct reports communication, whether that's going for distance walks, distance walks in the park which you know, is, a, is a lovely thing we can do here. It's not so easy for other people. Um, yeah, so much sustained effort has gone into that, and we constantly refine, um, including, and I don't, I don't want to give anyone heart attacks now, but um, we, we realised that some staff weren't able to get to the video Q&As because of childcare commitments. It was just, we do them at the end of the day and kids are coming from school now and are eating dinner. So of course we, we, we learnt to record them, except it turned out um, GoToMeeting didn't save the ruddy things anywhere that I could find. So we lost the entire first one uh, that way. But luckily, luckily um, yeah, 60 or so staff had managed to attend and see it. So we're learning all the time, but that comms is crucial and you know, we always beat ourselves up on this um, you always feel you don't do enough but but actually the number of staff who have positively commented to us about you know, whether it's the online quizzes and that kind of thing or the challenges and that they've, they, they see that we have you know, made an extraordinary effort to keep the community together and and then there's another facet yes yeah, so the commons is important but another facet we've learned is the breaking down of barriers that's come about through coronavirus and again this yeah, for, for ages staff have been saying in their feedback to us that they feel there are too many silos at Blenheim Blenheim's very prone to this with the best will in the world if you've got a team of gamekeepers and a team of digital marketers they don't have a lot in common. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, and they work in totally different places. They may be inside our 2,000 acres, but uh, they, yeah, it, it, they, they don't spend a lot of time together. And so it's often been flagged up that teams feel they're not understood by another team or they don't get the help they really should have from another team or, or they just don't know what they're doing. Uh, but as we had to lock down the site, and keep the staff number originally to a very small number, all those barriers had to drop. You know, people just had to turn their hands to whatever job was needed. And as we started to bring staff back, as we had furlough, we started rotating staff to give people a break. And then we had flexible furlough where people could come in part time. People came in to the jobs that needed doing, which often bore zero relation 
to what they were doing before. And the fascinating thing for me is not that our staff put their hands up for that. It's not that they did a good job. It's that they, in most cases, absolutely loved it. Um, and that change to pull them out of the office and have them on the gates talking to visitors and reassuring them about the safety precautions on site or handling customer service calls or doing HR to support other teams. They absolutely relish this. And I think there's a lesson in there we have to learn, not just about comms, but about changing the environment around people, letting people do different things. We, we all go down this path of specialisation that if you do payroll, then you spend your entire time doing payroll. It turned out that the people doing payroll had so much more to give and got so much from it. And everyone else has loved seeing you know, my assistant on the gates or, or Alan driving a van to deliver stuff into Barton for families. And, and that's been you know, our, our gamekeepers doing lambing um, and dry stone walling and going to help manage you know, the, the crowds at, at uh, Salon Privé. So that's been, that, you know, if it goes to well-being, we've done the comms bit and we've learned so much more about breaking out of the normal silos and routines and using new tech and just celebrating the precious time we can spend together. We've had the breakdown of silos that I hope will never feature in an employee survey again, but that will only be the case if we can find a way to build that into the new, the new normal. So I'm really excited about that. The final thing that goes to well-being that we've really learnt through this crisis is you know, we've often talked about the importance of purpose in our business. And that hasn't diminished at all. I think we've tried very hard to keep executing on our purpose to be the lifeblood of the local economy, to enhance the lives of local people, to share and protect this place. And I won't bore you with all the stuff that we've got doing on our 10 goals. But not everyone truly engages. I might want to kid you that everyone gets excited when I talk about purpose, but you know what? We've got 400 employees here at the moment. Some people are really, really engaged. Some people go, that's lovely to hear. I kind of like the fact Blenheim does this stuff, but I, I just want to do my, my job. Suddenly, this has been overtaken temporarily by a new shared purpose, a kind of survival purpose, a kind of both a feeling that Blenheim should open up and welcome people to keep the public sane, but, but also, you know, let, let's be honest, like any other business around here, we're in a fight for our lives. You know, we, 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 our revenues went to zero. Uh, you can't employ many people on re a revenue base of zero. And seeing how the whole community of Blenheim came together in a fight to protect each other, yeah, everybody taking pay cuts, everybody just doing whatever job was needed and to hell with what, they, what, you know, what their employment contract said, um, everybody doing whatever it took to attract visitors in to make events work, um, people supporting each other, um, people cutting cost imaginatively from, from every place they could, figuring out new, more efficient ways to do things for the future. And we were nowhere near the end of this, but this shared fight is one that collectively we feel we're going to make it. You know, we're on the cusp of, of, of winning, and while it's still, it's still a, a long, slow climb to go, we can see that we've got the strength together to make it. And I think people at Blenheim have become very proud of that, and we've, we've, we've united people in one sort of shared purpose about taking care of each other. And there's a real pride that we've not had to make mass compulsory redundancies. And it's not because our pockets were so deep we didn't need to. It's because we fought for every bit of, of relationship building, of revenue, of support of the public. We, we fought for each other. And, you know, I'm truly proud of that. And I think this will be a defining struggle for people. I think the peop you know, those of us who work through this period will always remember this period and how it brought people together. And people talk about, you know, will we be back to the old normal or is there a new normal? In terms of well-being for our employees, the way we communicate will be forever different. The way we broke down barriers and supported each other will never be forgotten. We can't unlearn that stuff. It's a better way of doing stuff, and it had a, a really positive impact on employee well-being. Then that final bit about 
you know, even if you didn't buy into our passion about truly affordable housing or boosting the local economy or training young people or, or whatever, people know they shared this moment together and they will know that we got through it and we protected each other. And I think that will, be, that will go into the corporate psyche, not just of Blenheim, but of all sorts of organisations. You know, the way your team came together for um, you know, the, the B4 conference uh, that, and reinvented it from scratch, the way you've created B4-1, uh, yeah, that, that changes your team forever and it changes the way they look at themselves and they look at each other and they know they fought their way through this. Uh, and I think it's amazing uh, what, what you guys have been doing too. And yeah, I talk about what other businesses have done for us. And I think that's the, 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 the next challenge is we manage to take care of each other. But there are some businesses out there who took care of their business partners too and found ways to do that. And you guys are a, a, a wonderful example of that. And there are, there are other examples we've come across. And yeah, there will be a second wave and, and, and there may be even some kind of third wave before vaccinations out there widespread. Uh, we want to make sure that we live up to the best of what we've seen outside, that, that we support you as much as you've supported us and that's true of other, employ uh, other relationships too. And our staff want us to do that. They, they've seen how they've been supported, whether it's by Joe Wicks or, or, or anybody else. And, um, yeah, they've got the confidence to know they can make a difference and contribute too. So these things, I think, you know, they're the lessons we've taken away about employee well-being as well as business strength. And we will not unlearn what we've learned, uh, and we mustn't do. I appreciate your kind words, and you know, it goes without saying that we're very grateful to you, everybody at Blenheim, for supporting us, giving us this opportunity. I mean, to, to have this platform to, to, to launch people once. It's incredible. When you talk about your staff, I mean, we've always talked about the people that you employ, and you've often told me that you, you don't have members of staff coming to you, choosing you over other potential job offers, which financially were more, more rewarding. But to actually work here, they knew that they would be, uh, they would have a more fulfilling experience. And obviously that stood you in good stead through this period, to have a, a, a team which is so bought into to what you're doing here. Uh. You see the benefit of that now in these moments of crisis more than even normal. It's no longer about, oh, we got we hired a better person than we might have done. It's it suddenly we stood by each other. Uh, and that's because they were people who believed in each other uh, and, and believed in Blenheim. So I am sure that goes to the heart of how we've been able to sort of continue without really you know, you know, missing a beat in, in some areas. And, and that's, that's been a huge comfort. And I'm sure... I mean, it's bound to be people who come through this crisis and, and they've had a life change moment. And then they, they, someone, some people out there would have decided, you know what, I'm not going to work anymore or I'm going to work in a completely different way. And that, that's great. But there's, I think there's an awful lot more who've said, yeah, it was all very well being at Blenheim when everything was rosy. But I've actually learned more about how much I, 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 how strongly I feel about Blenheim and what it's up to through this crisis. So we will stay longer. And I think... It's even showed in the way we, we, we have been able to hire, we've had to hire some people through the lockdown and they've, they've come into this very strange environment where you, you come in on your first day and you meet nobody. Yeah, it's, all, it's all video. Um, but the way they have been welcomed and brought in and we've, we've kind of got past that whole weird thing, is it's really difficult in theory to build all the network connections you need as a new employee who's going to work right across the estate. It's really difficult to do that when you can see so few of them sometimes. Uh, but, but everyone's made a huge effort um, to connect with them. Uh, and so while I'm sure we will lose one or two people who had a kind of like a life change moment and they've chosen to do something else, um, I think our staff base is, is, is strengthened by all that's gone on and people probably feel more engaged and more emotionally attached to Blenheim and what we do than, than they ever did. And when, when I hear things like Lorna and Alan talking, um, yeah, that, that's, that's truly humbling. And people here will tell you, in fact, they would tell you, they may have done, I've not seen the video. Um, yeah, we do wear our hearts on our sleeve here. We're passionate about what we do. And there's been a couple of recorded videos where I've kind of been quite you know, welled up at either my concern for everybody or my kind of, the fact I'm in awe of the support they're giving us. 
and, and that, yeah, the biggest emotion, most, biggest emotional response I've had to what's going on is moments when I've just looked a whole bunch of people in the face on Zoom and just can't believe I'm surrounded by these people. Do you think it helps that Lennon's got that family feel about it? Yes, but I, I think it's, it's, it's no accident. I'm not saying we deliberately created it, but maybe over time we attracted people who, who valued that kind of connection. We've got an awful lot of people who've been here for a long time, but they're, you know, they're not kind of old fogies who have seen it all before. You know, they're the people who are most excited about training apprentices and putting their arms around apprentices and then discovering... Yeah, one, remember um, one of our chefs discovering that a couple of our young apprentices living away from home for the first time didn't know how to cook. Like, I'd just never come across this. And then they were being taught how to cook properly. Um, and given lessons in budget, remember Megan and Megan giving them lessons in budget management because some of them had just never had to manage their own money before. And so that creates that kind of mother father thing that, that goes on. And I think you know, every step we take together reinforces that, that, that family ethos. And we talk about ourselves as families, not, not as yeah, employees. Um, that's the way we see each other. So do you think? next put a job out in the paper it will just say whatever comes along I you can be specific on a roll yeah that's a really interesting thought um, we have a bunch of projects that we've just signed off with our trustees we're going to invest right through the winter on a whole bunch of things that will divert employees who are kind of not critically needed in their current roles over the next eight months we believe because of business volumes being down because maybe their bit of the business we expect to be you know, almost closed down for a bit. And we are moving those people into a whole range of things, building new exhibitions, um, working out in the community, uh, helping with energy management. And so more and more we're going to really get people to do whatever comes along. And we, we've restructured both the, the visitor attraction teams and the, the estate looking after the landscape teams so that they will do within their extended groups, whatever comes along, rather than being a gamekeeper versus a shepherd versus a, um, a gardener versus a forester, um, they will do. So maybe we'll certainly be hiring for that. I think we'll be looking for people who are ready to turn their hands to anything far more because it isn't just an attitude thing anymore. We really will have a great place for people who, you know, in the morning, can turn their hands to whatever needs doing. Just ahead of job swap coordination, maybe. Oh, absolutely. We'll have to get Megan on to that role. <laughs> <laughs> we did look at that, actually, at one point where we could maybe help people swap roles. In the pre, this is all pre-lockdown, just to get an experience in a different role, whether it's you know, cleaning out the rhinos at Cotswold Wildlife Park or something. I must admit, one of, the, one of the LinkedIn posts that stood out most for me um, during lockdown was a lady that works at um, a local hotel, um, and she posted that she'd been on furlough for a good two or three months, and she was invited back in, but not as an events coordinator, but to clean the toilets and, and just be, be a maid, basically. I saw um, it. Isn't that inspiring? And it was incredible. And do you know what? The funny thing was, she got like 12,000 views. It was a ridiculous number of views. And the ironic thing was her husband is a communications expert, Rob Panting at Oxleps. I've completely outed you now, Rob. Um, <laughs> and he was completely envious of the whole, you know, the, 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 the impact that that, tweet, uh, that LinkedIn post had. But... That, that summed up um, quite a lot of people's own thoughts, I think, just getting back to work and doing whatever she could. And that will have transformed the way she is viewed in her organisation. It'll, it'll be one of those corporate legends that, that people will talk about in, in five or, or ten years' time. And isn't that great? Because you know, we have had these issues, particularly when people were on furlough and some people were here. The people here were working really, really hard. And, and for all their positivity and passion for the place. You know, when they were exhausted, sometimes they did think, you know, I wish I was being paid to stay at home. It sounds like a holiday, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really working, I'm exhausted. And yet, at the same time, you had the people at home on furlough saying, I would pay, I would seriously pay to get back to Blenheim and do just about anything to help. And so you have this sort of misunderstanding between them both. And it's when Rob's wife went back 
to clean bedrooms. So those are those breakthrough moments. And, and it happened here. We had similar things here, people doing all sorts of other jobs. I'm not saying they loved those jobs, but they loved the fact they were contributing. And they will always feel part. And, and those, you know, where when Joe went to work on the gates, my, my assistant, for example, you know, the teams on the gates will always remember that. Um, and they'll always greet her differently because she worked alongside them. You, you mentioned earlier on about how the London law firm sort of uh, have given up this time to look after their team. You know, to adjust the balance, I mean, we did a lot of work with um, our, our friends at Priests locally, um, speaking to a lot of their staff and how they're coping with lockdown. And, and they're certainly saying, you know, the communication between um, the, the various departments and teams is is increased significantly, and those, you know, those water cooler moments where you just grab somebody for two minutes before you went into a meeting, which might not have been convenient for them, but was convenient for you because you needed that information. They're gone now, but they're all replaced by structured meetings. So everybody's day is a lot more structured. They're, they're getting a lot more out of each other. And I'm talking to Leon Arnold, the head of corporate, he's saying you know, he would normally, I think it's, he was saying he'd do like a two week tour of the Northwest, um, or sort of Midlands North and going north and, and he said he can now do that by Monday lunchtime and he's so all this time you're saying is now being given up we've all unlocked a lot of time that we never had before through saving um, travel time so but we've got to re reinvest it in the right things exactly. um, I, I, I think it would be a, a terrible loss if actually we didn't have some of that down relaxed time with each other and, and that's the bit that we, we've struggled to replicate in quite the same way um, online um, because you do occasionally feel a bit guilty about suddenly making a Teams call to someone just to say, hey, how's it going? And so, yeah, I, I, I don't know what the new normal looks like, um, but I, I, I do worry that uh, particularly younger people coming into the workforce in their early years will not have the benefit of all the water cooler moments, which may be time consuming, and sometimes we couldn't place a true value on them, but we know they were valuable. So I'm not one of those who thinks, oh, we'll all work from home. Having said that, I think there'll be an awful lot more home working, but I think you will end up with businesses organising very deliberate all-in sessions or all-in social sessions and trying to get groups in, you know, almost scheduling, let's all be at work for this thing or for this day, uh, just so that we do, and, and maybe have a session that absolutely is focused on creating water cooler moments, um, brainstorming, that kind of thing. And I, I look forward to that because I think I, 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 I'm, I'm a people person, even though I'm an accountant, but in the sense of I get a lot of my energy from people. I, I, I struggle at home not having people uh, around me. So I'm anxious to see some return to normal, even though I know I am more efficient at home. And, and as you say, so many of these meetings, the, the, the equivalent of uh, the free tour of the Northern offices, yeah, we can now do trustees meetings that take two hours, including travel time. We, we don't exist anymore. Um, that, that's a great, great boon to the future, but I'm anxious to rekindle water cooler moments too. And I, I'm, I'm interested in listening to some of the rest of today to, to hear what others have to say about that and how you, how you do that. I love the idea of the shared exercise sessions, which I know one or two of our teams did. And I think I can see us doing that for the long run as well. Fantastic. Do you think that it's possible to get collaboration and innovation through Teams calls, which you think you have to come together in order to get that? It's, uh, no, I, you can absolutely do it for Teams calls. We, we, as we locked down, we set up a series of, we called them Phoenix teams, who were multidisciplinary teams of people who were staying on, who had to spend a, a chunk of their day each day looking at well, a whole wave of projects, rationalising the way teams work, finding new efficiencies, finding new spaces to move into, etc., new office strategies. And that kind of brainstorming worked brilliantly. But of course, you can't have... I, I, think, I think brainstorming online needs smaller numbers. Um, when you're in a room of 20 people, you, you can sort of brainstorm as 20 because you can see each other, you can take in the looks on people's faces, the tone of their voice, everything very easily when it's physical. Um, we found brainstorming with fours and fives was about as much as you could do on Teams. But that worked for us. Uh, and so yeah, there's a number of things that have to change when you go digital. But we found it to be a truly exciting period. And again, new relationships were built up because people could come from all over the organisation as a five or six to brainstorm. But there was no downtime in it. You know, if we're going to do it at 10 o'clock, everyone clicked in at 10 o'clock. 
and shared notes on Teams and um, recorded videos so people could go back and look at the sessions. And it was, it was fascinating and liberating. Don, really appreciate your time. I know you, you've got a busy day ahead. But hopefully you're going to be watching us. Um, like you did for Bio, I think you are ever-present. I, I loved Bio. I have to say, yeah, anyone who says things can't be the same online, it's not quite the same, should have been a Bio. Um, bio, in some ways, was better. Uh, I certainly was able to attend a lot more. I think the way people supported from the sidelines was brilliant. Um, I, I relished every moment. I got so much more from digital Bio. It's not to say next year I wouldn't be there physically well, for that's a day. It now. That's the end of it now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, would, I, I, would, I would still want to come physically for a day, but what I could then do, given the time commitments we all have, is attend most of the other days if the ticketing allows it. And, you know, there were a bunch of people from Blenheim who would love to have attended certain sessions, but we needed to find a way to get them to be able to experience just those sessions. Well... Uh they can all attend these, they're all open to everybody, so that's... Uh, We've been circulating the links. Available. And Don, uh, Lorna mentioned in, in the video um, how it's important, you know, you've got a big job to do. You reference the gamekeepers and the digital marketers, they haven't got anything in common. What they do have in common is, is a great leader. So, <laughs> Don, really appreciate your support for us, you coming in this morning, and uh, we're very lucky to have you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. So, thank you. I shall be watching a lot later. Thank you, and thank you for bringing this to Blenheim. Pleasure. Well, thanks, thanks for being you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Joined now by Emma Wyatt from Social Conversations with Emma. Um, now, Emma's a LinkedIn strategist who runs Social Conversations by Emma. She specializes in providing guidance and advice through bespoke coaching plans that help to grow your brand presence, brand reputation, and community engagement. Hi, Emma. Hi. So you're going to be talking to us today about how we can spend less time on LinkedIn, more productive time on LinkedIn. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I wanted to share some top tips so that often people sit down and say to me they spent like three hours on social media and actually what they really were only sat down for was to look at something for 30 minutes. So I thought I'd come along and um, share some of my top tips with you all. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to hearing them. Brilliant. Okay, so um, my first tip then is um, decide on the time that you're going to be on LinkedIn, um, particularly when you first start out often, it helps you be consistent. And then um, have a plan. So think about what you want to do on LinkedIn before you even open the app or open the website and set your timer. Um, I find setting the timer is the best thing. And then I work through a specific list of actions. And so those actions can range from wanting to connect with people, um, making sure you comment on specific posts, send messages to five or 10 people, or look at a hashtag that you're wanting to join the conversations on and just be really specific and focused in your actions. Or the best action I find is actually to write your own post and then there is less time to get distracted as you're wanting to share your content and reply to those comments. And the other tip is when your timer goes off, um, move away from your laptop or turn your mobile phone off, actually go and do something else. When I first started out being on social media more, I actually booked my social media time adjacent to an appointment so that I actually had to go. I had to go to my meeting or my appointment and they'll be my best tips. How much um, time do you spend on LinkedIn every day? Um, it varies for me, but I would recommend if you can spend 30 minutes a day or an hour um, really posting and chatting to other people. But if you haven't got that much time, um, 15 minutes a day, just having a look, seeing what's happening in your area or with the people that you want to talk to um, is a great use of time. During this difficult period, have you found that you've been able to keep connections going? Has it, has it helped your well-being by being on LinkedIn? Um, it has, yeah, it's been great. There's been some really good articles to, to read up on. People have been sharing um, tips about what, what's helped them, um, about exercise ideas. Um, but also there, are, there have been times where life's been a bit busy. Um, 
and I've, I've turned it off for a day um, and then come back to it refreshed. So that is always an option is to, um, to turn it off and walk away from it and have a break. What's your best tip for people that are maybe new to LinkedIn? Um, how can they get started with it? Um, I would say to um, create your profile, be really clear about what you do um, so that when someone looks at it, they can tell within 10 seconds um, quite clearly if they want to find out more about you and what you do. Fantastic. And um, what are you, are you going to be with us for the rest of B41 today? Um, yeah, I'm going to pop in and check out some of the sessions later. So I'll be, um, I'll be watching live on YouTube. I'm really looking forward to um, some of the talks, definitely. We're talking about it on LinkedIn. Um, I have talked about it on LinkedIn this morning already. Um, and I'm sure I'll be doing a little summary of the sessions that um, I pop in on later on today. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, great, great to see you, Emma. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. And um, we'll see you soon. Oh, she's gone. So we've now got Gary Bloom. So over to you, Emma. So we're joined by Gary Bloom now. Gary is a qualified clinical psychotherapist working with elite athlete, athletes. He works for an EFL club and treats athletes from all sports. Gary is also a broadcaster, author and conference speaker. Good morning, Hi, Gary. Gary. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, how are you? Yeah, really well, thank you. Great to see you both. Good to Good see, see you too. too. Emma? So can you tell us a bit more about um, what, what you do with workplace wellbeing? What do I do with my job as a sports psychotherapist? Is, is that the question? Yes. Well, I mean, it's a big one. <clears throat> How long have we got? Um, I work minutes. with Oxford United Football Club, um, trying to work out uh, with players, uh, management, staff, young players, academy players, what they need to be better versions of themselves as footballers. Um, I also work privately with individuals, other sports, men and women, who likewise are chasing that elusive goal that we're all trying to chase, basically, of how do we improve what we've got, how do we improve our enjoyment of what we're doing, and in a very simplistic way, happier players are better players. And my understanding of their personal lives, performance issues, injury issues, uh, difficult relationships I have either in the club or outside the club, um, will hopefully push them forward to something that they want to achieve. Have you found? You obviously, will, I don't know if you were with the team during the uh, the, the playoff uh, at Wembley. Just getting them into a, a, a new mental space to, to deal with playing without a crowd. How, how difficult was that? Did you play a role in adjusting them to that? Yeah, good question. It was a rather traumatic experience, as you can probably. Expect. Remember, Richard, when we lost to lost to Wickham, um, look, playing without a crowd is really difficult. And we, we did quite a lot of psychological research about how people motivate themselves um, in these difficult situations. How do we get up to do our jobs, uh, especially when there is nobody there to watch us do that? And, and most of us, that's every day. But you, if we were just move the, the argument slightly to one side or the example, how would an actor feel in, uh, on a stage when there's no audience there? And that is a really interesting psychological problem. There are two sorts of sports people, essentially. One, there are sports people who just love playing the sport they play and would play it for fun on a Sunday or, um, or just recreationally. And there are those people who are entertainers who really are motivated by doing what they're doing in front of a crowd. And my job was to help motivate the pe people who were especially entertainers, because those people can make a massive difference to how a sports fixture plays out. How we do that is by actually using other members of the team um, to motivate each other in a way that perhaps they weren't used to doing uh, on a match by match basis when there was a crowd there. So it's about more vo vocalization, more encouragement and it's interesting though that we, we we look back at Wickham's success Wickham had obviously primed the coaching staff the substitutes the directors in the director's box to become cheerleaders and you know what they were louder than Oxford yeah, I was talking to a Wickham fan the other day. saying exactly that that they were all given the direction to um, to, to sort of unnerve and rattle Oxford and, and, and put undoubtedly the better team 
out of their stride, which, which they succeeded in doing. Mind you, I did find it quite ironic that I was reading about Gareth Hensworth Hensworth at the weekend. Shouts for counting out loud um, b between uh, moves uh, to alert the refs that the other team were time wasting, which uh, he was a past master at Wembley. But I won't have too many sour grapes about that game. Gary, you, um, we wanted to talk about leadership and mentorship at, during COVID and, and how a leader can lead from home without being in front of the workforce. You know, what advice would you give in, in, in that particular area? This is a huge one. This is a really interesting um, topic. And I really feel today, and as I've, I've looked at some of the biogs of people you've got on and it's fantastic conversations to be had around COVID and what we can do around COVID. But there's, I think there is a real issue that is a silent issue that nobody has quite realized about the difference between working away from home and working at home. And this especially applies to young people because young people learn about leadership by rubbing shoulders with people who lead by example, how we inspire young people. And today's generation sometimes dubbed the net gen generation, find this really difficult. They have been brought up from year zero with mobile phones. Communication is an issue for them. Uh, the most common way of ending a teenage relationship these days is by ghosting somebody. Just stop any communication with the other party. Because young people find this going into conflict, conversations, listening, really, really difficult. Now you now split up the workforce and have people working from home. Those skills which they pick up in the workplace, normally in offices, uh, and rubbing shoulders with people like yourself, people who are experienced and have had years and years of experience doing this, that's going to go. And I think there's a massive challenge for our generation to help these people through a very tricky period and get these skills that they just don't have. You have to learn these skills. You and I learn them by getting a telling off in the, in, in the workplace or by watching somebody communicate with other people. Communication is very different today than it was 20 or 30 years ago, hugely different. We have to support those people. We have to teach them the skills. And this is a problem in our schools today. This is a problem in the military today. It's a problem in our sports cl clubs today, and especially relevant for today's um, seminar, really, really relevant in, in corporate organizations. We are letting our young people down if we do not address this. Gary, has your approach to well-being changed over the past six months? Well, hugely, because I, like everybody else, just like I am now, doing my work online. So I've got to think about how I look after myself and a mixture of online work as a, as a psychotherapist, but also what socialization I need to add in, because even an old so-and-so like me needs socialization for, to make me mentally well. So I deliberately have changed my working practice to make sure I have at least one or two days out of this study where I feel locked in at times and I'm at home um, to make sure that my working week has some variety. Without that, I think I become less effective and there'll be much, I've already seen some of the, the lectures that you'll be hearing today and some of the conversations they'll be having about Zoom tiredness. It is a phenomenal that people are just beginning to wake up to, excuse the pun, but people are becoming very, very fatigued doing hour upon hour Zoom sessions or virtual sessions going on because the information sometimes when you're wearing these things, these little earbuds, are coming directly into your, into your head. Imagine that eight hours a day. You don't get a break from that. So we have to think about working smart. We have to think about smart. But the thing I really want to concentrate on today, I'm just going to jump sideways and back to Richard's question. This concept of leadership has to change. Otherwise, we're not training people to be effective leaders in our organisations in 10 years' time. And then what are our organisations going to look like? Yeah, you, um, you, you referenced the next generation, but generally, I mean, teams that we have been used to spending time with and seeing the whites of their eyes. And you know, I, I have regular conversations with my team and they've all been fantastic um, working from home, but I don't see if there's any, any sort of any worry in their eyes, I suppose, by looking at them on a 
on a, on a Zoom screen. I can't detect if they're in a particularly bad mood. They join me at nine o'clock and we go off at 9.30. There's, I do, we do have one-to-ones, but even that isn't necessarily the ideal place in which to reveal that they might be having particular challenges. So how do we get to see, what, what replaces seeing the whites of the eyes of someone face-to-face if we're having to do it all remotely? I think you put your finger on a, a, a great issue. And the, quest, the, the word that comes up for me here is vulnerability. How do we be vulnerable? And young people find it incredibly tough to be vulnerable with anybody, especially people who might be in a position of seniority in an organisation where they work. Um, and people, young people, and we find this in the football clubs especially, see vulnerability as a weakness. I'm not going to go to my boss and say, you know what, I've not a clue what I'm doing here. Because what are the repercussions of that? What are the, what are the repercussions of turning around to your boss or somebody in your office say, I'm struggling. I've got real huge personal problems going on in my life with my parents or my loved ones or my partner or my grandparents. What, what you know, they, they might come and say to you, Richard, everything's fine. And maybe you have an outstanding team. I'm not suggesting you don't. <clears throat> but we're looking at a wider level here. And I would say that vulnerability is a real challenge for young people. People who can come into a workplace and say, I'm sorry, I'm having a struggle. I don't know what I'm doing. My, sale, my sales figures are down. My KPIs are down. What do I do? And they're not rubbing shoulders with you every day. This is where the communication skills become really, really important. And I've run, I've run uh, programs inside corporate organizations which are specifically designed to address some of these issues. When people can look up to you and say, you know what, I'm having a terrible day. Um, I don't know what I'm doing in your organization. I haven't got the skills to do my job effectively. Um, I don't think I'm getting on as well as I should. Maybe that's a perceptual thing for them. Maybe they're doing just fine. Somebody said to me the other day in a counseling session, I just want my boss to say, it's okay, but I'm not seeing him every day. And trying to find some time on his Zoom calendar is really, really difficult. So that little bit of mentorship, that little bit of putting your arm around somebody's shoulder saying, well done, keep on. This is, in the virtual workplace, this is disappearing. And that can create mental health issues for people who are desperate to get on, but need that little bit of encouragement sometimes that they're not getting. And look the other way around, and we just had Dom in talking about how he's managing to keep his team um, going at 400. And one of the ladies uh, in, in the video that we ran earlier was saying how, you know, it's said it's not easy for him you know, looking at the leaders and how a leader can continue to lead without that team around them in, in a live space what are the what are the danger signs for them um I, when it's such a huge team you have to break it down it's called chunking it's a psychological term for this thing when you break things down into smaller teams so i'm sure he has team leaders who are looking after a fairly hefty number of of people but I'll pass on to you you two what what happens inside a football club I'm responsible ultimately for the mental well-being of if you think about the academy staff the kids all the way through to the first team maybe 60 70 80 90 people it's impossible when you get to 400 it's certainly impossible you have to train everybody in the workplace to be on the lookout for the telltale signs the changes of behavior, the changes in work scheduling. Is the person doing something differently in their, in their working lives that they've not done previously? And it just te- teach your workforce to check in with people, maybe not during the day, but if every person in the organization just rang up two of their work colleagues and said, look, I'm just checking in, seeing everything's okay. You didn't look right on the Zoom call. You know, you looked unshaven or you, your hair wasn't right or... You know, you weren't in the same position that you're normally in when you do these Zoom calls. We had to do this at Oxford United. We had to pick up telltale signs that certain players were engaged during lockdown when they were doing Zoom training. So they were training in front of a Zoom camera, et cetera, et cetera. We had to pick up those telltale signs and then pick up those people at a later date and say, look, you didn't look right. Something's not right. And usually because you know your workforce pretty well, or the team leaders will know the people underneath them pretty well, you'll be able to pick that up. 
but they need training. You need training to know what, what you're looking for. About the, the leader, him or herself, and, and their well-being as well, when they've had a lot of the, the sort of face-to-face -face contact taken away from them. Well, it's interesting. I've had an increasing number of um, referrals and inquiries from my work from CEOs who are now look, thinking about how they best look after themselves. And the, the telltale signs that something isn't right uh, is that if you are head of an organisation and your addictive behaviours, and we all have addictive behaviours, are getting worse, maybe you're drinking more, the, you know, the use of recreational drugs or gambling, these are all little signs, or just doing things or not eating well, putting on weight, uh, not exercising enough, not looking after yourself, is a good telltale sign that you should check in with uh, a counsellor or therapist or somebody like, like me, uh, and there's a great network of people like myself out there in Oxfordshire, check in with those people and say, look, I just want a regular MOT. But all of a sudden, any, the first time we slap the title of mental health across this, people run away scared. Oh, well, I'm not mentally ill. No, we're, you're not mentally ill. <clears throat> but just as you would you take your car in for a regular checkup or service, we need a regular service ourselves. As we go to our doctors to have our blood pressure and heart rate checked, we need our mental health checked as well or our well-being checked. And if people are finding it tough being at home for long periods of time, working from home, rubbing alongside kids in tricky relationships, or there's, there's some stress or ambivalence in the relationship with your, your partner, you need to have that checked out and have a safe space to talk about it. Do you think that, we, uh, that there's not one solution for everybody, that we need kind of a blended approach um, when we're tackling well-being? Yeah, I agree. There isn't one approach. We're all different. And the best metaphor I can use is we all have a relationship with our physical health. How often you go see your doctor might be different to how often I would go see my doctor. I don't have the aches and strains that you might have and vice versa. But at the same time, we have to recognise we all have a relationship with our mental health. It's not binary. We're not either well or ill. We're always somewhere on the grey scale in between. And any numbers or kids causing problems because they're teenagers and that's just what they do, or parental issues or stress in the workplace. And let's, let's face it, there are huge issues around redundancies coming up in the next few months that is going to hit us. All those things will impact on our mental health. And what I say to those, any individual who is thinking about, am I well, am I fit enough? to be able to do what I want to do? Am I drinking more? Am I putting on weight? Am I looking after myself? Am I more fractious? Am I getting involved in arguments that I wasn't getting involved with? If you're a partner of that person or you're the work colleague of that person, notice the subtle changes and ask and offer help and reach out to people who, who are there to provide help. There's a massive number of organizations. But going back to your original question, Everybody's different and everybody, need, everybody needs something different. We catch, when we called it last week, Gary, you were saying when we had this sort of six month hammer um, blow dealt to us all last week, that your phone didn't stop ringing with, with people that thought, well, right, I, I could tolerate what we, we've gone, all gone through to now, but this now is a game changer for me. I've got to make a lot of changes in my life that I've been putting on hold. Maybe you'd like to elaborate a bit more on that conversation. Yeah, um, interestingly, I was on a clinical call with my colleagues from my clinic in London yesterday, and we're all experiencing exactly the same. You know, the human condition is such that we can cope with most things except uncertainty. And um, one of the greatest inventions of the London Underground was nothing to do with rolling stock or electrification. It was the overhanging information boards that we now know how long our next train's going to be. Because once we know how long our next train's going to be, we can stop worrying if we're going to be late. So the idea of taking uncertainty away from us as human, as human beings is really, really important. Now, all of a sudden we're thinking, okay, we've had lockdown, we've come out of lockdown, we've had a nice summer, the infection rates have gone right down, uh, it's all over. Well, then all of a sudden the government say, well, it's not all over, we've got another six months of this. And then people are now locked into relationships or jobs or difficult situations for another six months. And a lot of people have, have got to the end of their tether and say, this is a relationship, this is a job, this is a situation that I was 
just about able to tolerate in the old way of doing things, in the government's original plan. But now it's not going to change till March of next year. A lot of people have said enough is enough. I can't cope with this anymore. And I was talking to a colleague yesterday and they said it's really, really unhelpful to think of the COVID situation as something that will be over by March. I'm not a big fan of the government saying, oh, by March, we, we get back to some sort of normality, because that's the implicit message they're giving. We get to March and we'll go back to normal. I think we have to look at COVID as a three year cycle. And that is a much more realistic way of dealing with what we're dealing with. And when I say a three year cycle, I mean, in terms of medicine, I'm talking about vaccinations. Maybe it'll come a bit sooner, who knows. But in terms of businesses, we have to look this as a three year plan. And anybody who's looking at their careers, how they're going to work, planning for investment, planning for growth, pl planning for recruitment, has to look at this as a longer, a longer thing than March. Otherwise, we are continually getting to that point and being disappointed again. And what's it like? Oh, sorry, Emma, did you? No, no, you go. What's it like for somebody like you know, the manager at Oxford United when, when he's got to um, lead his team publicly? Um, does, does he, I mean, obviously you have a lot of one-to-ones with, with, with the manager, I, I would imagine. How, how does he feel being more exposed, I suppose, without that cushion of sound from the crowd? Does he temper his instructions um, to the players or does he, is he as, as, as vocal as he, as he would normally be? I think that's a great question. It's a bit of a curate egg. It's a mixture of a lot of things, Richard. Um, first of all, Carl Robinson, the coach of Oxford United, is able to coach a lot more because he can, um, he can make his instructions very clear to the players in, in a quiet stadium. Uh, and if you've been into a stadium since lockdown, it's an extraordinary feeling. You can hear everything, but the players can also hear the manager as well. So the quality of coaching, I think, is really important. But at the same time, it, football fundamentally is change so what would normally happen we had a situation a couple of games ago when we played Sunderland we went a goal down early in the second half normally if that were to happen in a football stadium the home fans get behind the team for roughly a 10 minute period and the team often feed off the excitement and noise and that human emotion to attack the other team that is really bog standard in any sporting scenario one team scores the home team get behind the team have just conceded and off you go again and we really try to get back in the, the, the game. It's called the challenger state, the challenger mind state in sports psychology. When we went a goal behind, absolutely nothing, flat as a pancake. And actually it emboldened the away team. Let's say well, there's no atmosphere here. Nobody's screaming and shouting, urging Oxford to get forward. And it really changed the whole nature of the game. So... There's good bits, there's bad bits. The away, type, the away teams obviously enjoyed it. Uh, the home teams, I think, are finding it harder. I think it's improving creativity on a sports field because people are less frightened of making mistakes. So you have a shot and you shoot wide, you're not going to get that groan by 15, 20,000 people going, oh, the blood you're doing, that sort of stuff. That goes. So we are. I think that's why we're seeing a lot of goals now in, in matches behind closed doors. Um, I think that's why you're making, you're seeing lots more mistakes. And that's why goals are being scored uh, because people are prepared to take, uh, be a bit more adventurous because there's not a crowd to boo or whistle or shout rude things. Gary, if there's businesses out there today that want to, um, that they're very excited about what you're saying and they want to get in touch with you, what's the best way of them doing that? Uh, Richard Rosser would be a very good way. He's got all my contact details. So um, I am online. I'm your agent, Gary. I didn't realise that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, your agent, so I don't think you'd be very happy. <laughs> um, my details are online if you look at the counselling directory. I would say very, very quickly that that's my, my, the way I work in co corporate organisations is quite simple. I teach people to listen, not hear. Hearing is a biological thing unless you're hearing impaired. I teach people to listen. Great example of somebody unable to listen was the presidential debate last night. US president unable to listen. Then I teach people once they've learned listening skills how to communicate with people, 
how to let other people know that you've heard them. This is a skill. This is not something we're born with. And the third thing I teach them is conflict resolution, because we're all, all of us have to learn how to go into conflict. If you're knocking on your boss's door and asking for a rise, that's a conflict situation. If you're trying to get on with your partner at home, that's a conflict situation. And those three things, once you have mastered those three things, things flow a lot better. And I would say that any organisation where you have discord, especially at uh, boardroom level, or there is cultural differences, intercultural differences, think about those that three-step plan. Are people listening to each other? Are they able to effectively communicate with each other? And is there conflict, re conflict resolution? Is that easy inside your company? Brilliant, Gary. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you joining us this morning. And hopefully we'll see, we'll see you in the place soon. Take care. Thank you. Cheers, Gary. I think we're going over to a couple of videos. Hi, my name's Cheryl Britton and I'm the founder of YOLO Wellbeing. I think the good thing about YOLO Wellbeing is that you've got a lot of instant benefits from it, um, both emotional and physical. We, we do um, like a five minute head massage to start with and, and the massage that we use um, has been proven in clinical trials to reduce the levels of uh, cortisone, but also to boost uh, feel good neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine, um, which can actually have really kind of big Quite, quite a physical impact, you feel a lot calmer, a lot more relaxed after, uh, after the head massage. But then we also work on the neck and shoulders and we do physical massaging so that with a bit more pressure. Uh, we can target areas where um, people hold tension, um, either from repetitive um, kind of actions that you do on a daily basis or from tension and stress headaches. So you know, after you've had that 15 minute session, you should be physically feeling a lot calmer, a lot more relaxed, but also quite energised. Your movements will be freer um, and, and you just feel absolutely wonderful. I think with YOLO Wellbeing, it's, it's great. It almost feels like um, you can take a 15 minute break and come back feeling like you've been on a vacation. You know, you, you can sit in front of the TV and you can watch the sun go down over the ocean as the waves are lapping the shore. And then we're going to uh, work on the neck and the shoulders where we'll release any tension and any stress. So it really is a very intense um, experience, but it, it's one of the reasons why we get great benefits from it. I think the best thing about YOLO Wellbeing is that it's a real hands-on approach to wellness. You get instantaneous results when, when people come out of uh, out of the experience. They feel amazing, and it's it's something that doesn't take a lot to implement. You know, we, we come to you. We make it as easy as possible. We give you the tools to to fill the appointments, and you know, we we get the results for you. I think probably the best way to, to get in contact with us is through the website. We've got um, contact details on there. Um, we're a very personable company, or we're also available through um, through social media channels. So our website address is yolowellbeing.co.uk, and we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram as Yolo Wellbeing. Come and find us. Welcome back everybody. Apologies, I understand we're having some sound issues, so we are working through these um, as quickly as possible uh, and hopefully it's not uh, upsetting your experience. We are doing, the team's doing their very best to ensure you can see and hear us properly. A good opportunity now to thank our sponsors, uh, for, for Blenheim for hosting us obviously, uh, to Studio 8 and Static Airwaves for all of the AV uh, support they're giving us today, which is fantastic. To Aston and James, uh, to UHR Consultancy, Coel and to Oxford Brooks. So next up we have uh, Deborah Humphrey. So Deborah has extensive experience working in mental health settings, supporting patients and employees, firstly as a nurse and secondly as a senior leader. In April 2019, she set up her own coaching and wellbeing business, The Wellbeing Story. 
Deborah supports organisations and individuals to help them explore culture, well-being and development. So Deborah, good morning, how are you? Hello, I'm really well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, yeah good, 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 good to see you. Yeah, great start so far, really interesting. Can you hear, can you hear us, us well? I can, can you hear me? Yeah, Loud and clear. Yeah. Good, thank you. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi Emma. Yeah. So, so you've got a presentation you want to deliver, so we'll leave it to it, Deborah. We'll come back to you with some questions at the end. Yes, I'm going to share my screen, hopefully. There you go, can you see that? We certainly can, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go? Good. Perfect. Yeah, brilliant. So thank you very much. Um, I wanted to talk today about virtual well-being. I think we've had some hints of this from Dom and from Gary um, and just the challenge of how we do support um, colleagues who are nearly always online. I think some companies are trying to bring people together once a week but not all are achieving this. So I think um, well-being was something we perhaps didn't consider at the end of last year or if we did, we didn't consider it in such a focused way. Um, a lot has changed from how we checked on employees. So I want to just touch on that and talk about what we can do and how we as leaders can be role models and a few little exercises. So I wanted to start with a little exercise actually that you as leaders can do for yourself when you're feeling stressed, tense, another Zoom meeting. So as you're sat down, I'd just like you to ask yourself the question, what could you do less of now? So as you're sat, think about your posture. What would you do less in your chair at the minute? Whether it's your breathing, get yourself a bit comfortable. And just enjoy the thought of doing less. And this is a really simple simple exercise that you can do anytime. Um, you can share it with your teams, your employees, you could do it in a one-to-one. -one. Um, and I think it's a go-to exercise, especially, you know, when you're thinking, oh my God, another Zoom meeting. So moving on about what we did about wellbeing um, in our old world, in 2019, um, we've perhaps had a strategy um, some companies don't. I know health services often have wellbeing strategies, but basically we saw people, we could check in with them. We had that visual communication. Um, Richard talked about looking in the whites of people's eyes. I still believe we can do that on Zoom, um, but I think it just takes a bit more effort. And then for leaders that becomes more tiring in itself. So we know um, that the workforce has changed. Last year, we had people advising us not to spend so much time online, but now we're spending all our life online. Um, and the challenges for us our, and our teams are increased anxiety, mood changes. You know, we know what it's like. We're working from home. We've got kids or we've had kids around us all the time. Um, got people ringing the doorbell. I'm saying that, expecting mine to go at any second now. Um, we're just generally distracted as we're performing. Um, there's fewer barriers and some of the evidence is showing that employees overshare. That social barrier of being at work where we've got the sort of social norms has disappeared. So we might have people becoming more emotional um, online and that's certainly been my experience so I'm going to talk about some things we could do about that. I think the other thing which is really important is the physical boundaries of work has changed. We're not coming into work, we're not making the same effort to go and get the bus, to drive um, and we don't leave work, it's all within our house. And I think we've heard Gary talk about Zoom fatigue um, and obviously that applies to other online platforms. So, you know, you, yourself, you know that feeling of exhaustion um, 
that comes at the end of the day. I find working on Zoom all day in my room much more exhausting than going into work. So I'd just like yourself to check at the moment with yourselves, do a check in around these points. The Mental Health Foundation has really started to think about how we support people to work online. So as you're working during the day, think about how do you move? How often are you spending sat, probably with not very good ergonomics, at your desk um, without getting up? We've talked about the water cooler meetings. Um, you know, we're not doing that now. How often do you plan the day with starting and finishing times? Or is it just, you know, I know a colleague who has the computer in their bedroom. It's the only space they have. So they kind of roll out of bed straight into work. Um, there is no boundary about when you start, when you finish. Work is always there now. It's part of your domestic environment. How often do you take a break and eat properly? We know that people don't take time out to go get some fresh air, perhaps walk to the sandwich shop. We know in London the impact of this on the economy. Um, it's easy just to get sucked into your work environment, you and the computer as your main relationship. And how often do you reflect on your day when we don't have people beside us all the time? It's really difficult not to sort of that slump in the desk and say, I've had a really rubbish day at the end of the day. Or conversely, I've had a really great day. So some of the things um, that you can do about this um, in meetings. So you, I've put meetings here, but this could be either a one-to-one -one or a group meeting. Think about how you check in. How do you start your meetings? We've heard about efficiency of this new way of working but have we become too smart, too efficient, um, that we're not spending time um, checking in with each other? There's um, a woman called Nancy Klein who has done some work on thinking organisations. And this is maybe something you would want to ask yourself, are you a thinking organisation? And their, their practice advocates spending two minutes with a colleague, just listening to them, letting them say whatever's on their mind and then swapping over. So you can do this in breakout rooms and then giving somebody an appreciation, saying you've appreciated what they've said. What's important about these type of conversations is you don't interrupt. Um, what would you know? How would you tell if somebody is feeling wound up? We can tell, we can look at people's postures. If you see people sitting slumped on the desk their eyes closed. It's okay to check in. Um, do you have meeting ground rules? You know, do we see what we saw on the TV last night with Trump and Biden, just a complete talking over each other? What are the ground rules? What are the parameters that your employees are working with? And linked to that, does everybody have a voice? Do you have a rule about video on and video off? And actually, if somebody who works for you has always got the video off, but listening to the meeting, how do you know they're there, engaged? Is this something you would check up with them? And I don't mean in a kind of punitive way, but what is it that's stopping them engaging fully in the meetings with, your, with you and your colleagues? And is there a social element to the meeting? The idea that this meeting is very efficient um, perhaps stops that social chit chat. You know, what we used to have is people would wander into meetings, people were there early, they'd have a little chat. There is a way you can deal with this by um, adding on 10 minutes at the end of your meeting and asking people to stay, having a cup of tea, um, bringing their coffee in at the end. 10 minutes with your colleagues at the end of a meeting isn't a long time. Um, and it's just a way of saying, I'm still here, I'm still around, let's have a chat. And I think you can then ask some more informal questions that you may be feeling quite anxious about talking about. So what can you do? And I think what's really key for us as leaders is to be bold. 
do check out and use our intuition. You know, if we think somebody's behaving slightly different, we can check out. We can do that in a very open way. We can, you know, suggest, you know, how are you doing? I'm noticing you're not quite the same or you're looking a bit tired today. Show you're interested. Um, be bold in the way you hold meetings. Maybe think of a well-being strategy that's based around people working online. That's a way to show your team that you've thought of them. You've thought of what you can do together. You've got some goals there. Be a role model. If you're working 24 not going out for a walk, um, your employees won't. Somebody said to me the other day, um, well, you know, I can't leave my room. Nine till five is my work time. I can't go out for a walk during the day. It's working time. Well, actually, it's okay. Um, Sorry, we've, we've lost you for a sec, uh, Deborah. If you can hang on just a sec while we get you back. Sure. You can sing a song or shall I? <laughs> I can't sing. I can see you guys. I think we've lost the uh, the YouTube feed. I think that's what's gone. Really enjoying your presentation. Thank you. Some very good tips there. How's your well-being, Deborah? Are you looking after yourself? Pardon? How's your well-being? It's variable <laughs> sometimes it's remem remembering to practice what you preach yeah exactly it's uh, I was just asking the previous presenter you know, it's all very well talking about leading and making sure your teams are okay but but you know who looks after the leader so um, yeah I think it's really important that we're role models um, for people because people follow our behavior hmm. definitely we're going to have to take a quick break, I'm afraid. So, um, yeah, I think we've lost the, uh, lost the feed, unfortunately. Okay. Shall I just stay on then? To yeah, just stay on, yeah, because I, I basically don't think, I don't think we're, oh, he's not being seen by anybody, are we now? Oh, we're back. We're back on. We're back on. Pardon? Give me a tash. And we're back, live TV. Hey, um, apologies everybody for, for losing you. Hopefully we've not lost you forever. Uh, Deborah, you still there? I'm still here. Excellent. Um, I think that's a really good example of how your well-being can be affected actually um, when you're on We staged it basically, is that what you're trying to say, Deborah? I'm trying to say that you staged that, so it's a perfect example. Um, and I think we just have to accept these things are happening. So what I was talking about was as leaders about being bold, um, checking in with people and also saying, you know, maybe I'm finding this difficult. You know, I'm missing you guys. I'm missing being around my team. Be the role model that people want to see. People will follow your practices whether they are practices that you are working every hour, whether you're not taking breaks, that will be the setting, the, the saying how people should work, 
um, even if you don't think it is. I think you can adopt some wellbeing practices. I worked with um, NHS England in the Southwest and they adopted a wellbeing Wednesday um, and every Wednesday lunchtime, just 45 minutes, anybody was invited to come in and listen to a talk, listen to a speaker. Some of those were activities, some of those were just, you know, talks about good practice. We've talked about socialisation and I think it's really important to think how we socialise. I think it was you, Richard, who mentioned it's really hard just to ring somebody up on Teams and say, how are you doing? Um, but my question back is why? Why is that hard? We wouldn't be afraid of knocking on somebody's door in the workplace and saying, oh, have you got two minutes? Um, so I think we have to make that the norm. And again, using some of that, becoming a thinking organisation. It's OK to listen to what people have to say for the person who's listening to be quiet. Just let somebody let off steam and then move on. That's absolutely fine. Um, that's all I wanted to say from the presentation, Richard. I'm really happy to answer questions. Yeah, thank you very much. I found that really useful and insightful. I was wondering if you had any examples that you've seen from other businesses where you think they've been really innovative um, during, during your, your time. Apologies. Um, I was wondering if you've heard of any innovative ways during this time that people have stayed connected to each other or um, anything that people have been doing that you think that's really good best practice. Organisations like NHS England who have brought people together for um, these Wellbeing Wednesdays. It's really clear that people are not online. They make it fun as well. They use a lot of avatars that people in communicate through avatars and I was a speaker there and it was a bit bizarre I must say as a speaker because I kept having these funny pictures zooming into the um zooming into my talk but it had a sense of camaraderie about it there was time at the beginning for people to come in and just chat before the speaker um I think there's organizations who are absolutely building in to their weekly timetable social activities um, and whether that is a check-in whether that is just a virtual tea break virtual lunch um, and using you know the features on whatever online platform you have for people to be able to break up um, into breakout rooms one of the things that i do when i run groups and i co-facilitate um, a regular group with a colleague is we acknowledge at the beginning that sometimes people are finding it very difficult to work online so one of us becomes the well-being person and I think businesses can do this so if people are feeling distressed or irritated they contact an, um, an individual so if there was two of you I might be then sending a message privately to Richard who I could then um, ring up and have a chat with and that's been really really effective um, that you have an identified person within the meeting. And you were talking about Zoom fatigue and I'm sure it's going to be something we're going to hear a lot of today. Do you think it's a difference if you're an introvert and an extrovert to suffering from this? Um, I'm not sure to be honest. I think that people of the whole range find it very tiring. We know that spending too much on, you know, time online isn't very good for us. Um, but if you think of the visuals or actually staring at the screen, that's ex exhausting. Um, the different colors, um, we're trapped in rooms. So I think it affects everybody. I think in terms of whether some people prefer working from home on their own, I think that might appeal to a more introverted nature rather than that being the issue of the Zoom. And who looks after the wellbeing coach, Deborah? Pardon? Who looks after the wellbeing coach? <laughs> well, I think there is something about practicing what you preach. I have a really good network of colleagues who I um, 
regularly chat with. I have a virtual coffee morning with some colleagues every Friday where we just, you know, are irreverent. And, and they can support you. Sorry. Yeah, they are. It's well, it's not work. It's that letting off steam. Um, perhaps what you used to do, you know, as you walked to the sandwich shop, as um, you went outside and got a bit of a breath of fresh air. Um, so that really something I look forward to. Fantastic. So in terms of, sorry, I, I popped out for a few minutes, so apologies if you've covered this off already, but in terms of contacting you about your services, Deborah, what's the best way yes. to do that? Um, well, I've got a website, um, The Wellbeing Story, um, which I think is on the bio. Um, either through that, or I'm happy to share my telephone number if people want to contact me. And what's the normal process? Um, in terms of engaging with you and size of, I mean, I presume it's anybody, any firm size or an individual that can engage with you? I do, um, I do um, packages with organisations around wellbeing, where I help them think about the, a wellbeing appraisal, help them develop a wellbeing strategy, or I'll do one-to-one -one with um, individuals if they feel that the individual's struggling. It's not counselling, it's not therapy, it is more about thinking, okay, we're here and now, what can we do to support you move forward? How would you like to be? Um, and using the natural strengths. I tend to use quite creative techniques, such as writing, sometimes photography, and using sort of metaphor to help people express themselves. Um, so I'm happy to do either groups, strategy, or individual work. And if you could give our, our viewers a couple of tips to sort of take away with them from today that they could maybe test out just to see whether um, maybe engaging you with you beyond today would be of use to them. What, what would you advise? Sorry, some tips that they can do for themselves and for their own well-being. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the first one was um, asking that question, what can you do less today in the moment um, while you're sitting down? which is based on just helping you relax and breathe, noticing your body. So if you're sat with your legs crossed and your shoulders a bit hunched, sorry, I'm looking at you, Richard. Um, can you just do a bit less? Most comfortable for me. <laughs> but what happens is... Oh, I as well. A little. <laughs> there you go, is that better? Well, if you can relax in your chair, you know, just do a bit less with those muscles and um, see how it feels. Um, you could try, and this is a interesting technique, which does work, doing something called five minutes free writing. So when you're feeling really pent up, really worked up, just get a um, pen and paper, not the computer, and just time yourself right for five minutes, whatever is in your head, it can, not worry about grammar, spelling, and then you can scrunch the paper up and throw it away. Um, and move, I think move and hydrate are really key things, really simple takeaway um, tasks that you can do and remind yourself to do. Water bottles, so I'm, I'm one out of three so far. Your posture's yeah, getting I must admit, I find this more uncomfortable than set with my legs crossed. <laughs> Pardon? I must have it sat, sat with my legs down as well uncomfortable with the legs crossed. But uh... I think it's just thinking about your muscles and breathing, yeah. um, you know, and not sat in a position that's not very ergonomic. Okay. I'll try it. Sorry. <laughs> no, you have to relax, Richard. No, nah, bless you. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Deborah, did you have any final questions for Deborah at all? No, no, I just found your presentation really useful. Thank you. I no, really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for the advice. No, pleasure. And uh, hopefully you can stay with us and, and catch up with some of the other presenters later. Um, Thanks, Deborah. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay, so next up, we have uh, Kate Stinchcombe-Gillis, the birthday girl. Kate, are you with us? No, she's not with us. So you've got some time to practice. My so sitting straight. Bed. Yeah, I'm sure I could get used to it. Is she with us? I can see her on screen. Happy birthday, Kate. Birthday.
Can we hear Kate? Hello. Did you hear the happy birthdays? No, we didn't. Well, happy birthday, Kate. <laughs> the third time. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Seven, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Introduce you to Emma, who's co-hosting with me today. Hi. Nice to see Hello. you. Hi. Going very well so far. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you. Have you how's my sound? Fine, perfect. Perfect. Like your next door. So what what are the plans for today's big birthday then, Kate? Um well I've had a few celebrations already and then um I'm off into Oxford shortly for a spot of lunch and Fantastic. a bit of a wonder. Sons of children. <laughs> ah. Excellent. Are they at school? Are they, then? they are. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Brilliant. So you're going to be talking to us about, obviously, your PR expert, Kate. So you're, you're going to be talking to us today about PR for businesses during uh, this, uh, these uncertain times. Yeah, I think when I saw the headline for today's event and also Deborah's talk just now, what it struck me is, what struck me is that what I've learned through lockdown is that uh, professional well-being and personal well-being kind of crossed paths. They, they were no longer mutually, uh, mutually exclusive and, and tied into that also was business success. Um, I saw uh, the power of communication really come to the fore uh, and um, that's something I talk about a lot. We were, many businesses found themselves in a crisis situation and the best thing to do in a crisis is to communicate because it's too easy to, um, you know, curl up inside a snail shell and hope it will all go away and this clearly wasn't and the businesses that came out better from this are those that kept communicating they have maintained their relationships with their customers and they've most likely picked up new ones along the way whether those were through maintaining regular communications uh, with customers or through staying connected with their staff virtually or for those on furlough it maintains the faith. Communication is key to transparency and tra transparency takes everybody along on the journey with you. From talking to people in my own network and from my own personal experience through this, um, trying to keep a business afloat and save my sanity through homeschooling and keep everybody else cheery, um, the virtual world really did work for me. Um, the virtual world kept me connected to my, my own business network, events like those run by B4, Bio, by Oxford Independent Consultants, and by those in my industry that kept me connected to the media, um, kept me connected to goings on in the industry. They were lifesavers. And what the virtual world also enabled for the first time probably was a faith that we could all be productive, work and communicate despite working outside of a classic nine to five regime. But I think what I've also seen um, personally uh, through my own work eff efforts and also through clients and others in the industry is where people have learned to focus their communication efforts more digitally and they've started to build more powerful online communities as a result. I've seen people be put themselves at the front and the face of their business in ways that they have perhaps felt nervous to do in the past because they recognised there was a need for connectivity with their clients, with their customer base. And I've also seen businesses do that very successfully with their staff, where a town hall might previously have been an annual event or even a quarterly event. They've become weekly events and perhaps not even in a town hall sense. We've seen pub quizzes taking place on a Thursday afternoon uh, to uh, great humour and success. And then on the less bit digital side of things, I've heard lots of stories of larger businesses going down the direct mail route, keeping the Royal Mail alive and our couriers busy, making sure that staff receive goodies in the post to support their well-being too. So communication is more powerful than perhaps we ever realised. It doesn't virtual doesn't work for everybody. I still have a friend who refuses to put her uh, video on and I'm still yet to convince my eight-year-old that 
uh, virtual interaction is a thing rather than feeling like he's performing for a screen. So that pulls me back to the point about recognizing your audience and knowing how they want to interact and what they want to hear from you and when they want to hear it. And I think many, many businesses have recognized the need to not only be transparent and communicate what they're doing and keep people informed, but also to turn to humor to keep people cheery. Um, you know, if it wasn't the Ross on the stairs, pivot sofa meme at the beginning, um, it will have been some classic um, graphic from Insta Innocent Drinks keeping you cheery about their latest product release. Being human, bringing humour into the occasion and keeping communication open and transparent is what has saved many people's sanity, whether they were clients or customers or staff. And um, I really do hope that the learnings that businesses have had from making those changes during lockdown will be carried forward to the future success and growth of their businesses. Um, I was From one PR to another. <laughs> have you seen anything, obviously being a, a travel expert like yourself, have you seen anything in the travel industry that you thought that was um, a really good example? The, the one example I've seen um, in travel that I think is really powerful has been a more B2B and there's um, an Oxfordshire business called Last Frontiers who specialise in um, South America. So you can imagine that a South American tour operator has come up against it pretty hard during lockdown. And yet what they have done is um, muster a community of themselves, the media who specialize in that sector and um, tourism experts and organizations across the countries in the continent gathering for um, fortnightly Zooms where there is a sharing of information on how the virus is being managed or is spreading in all of their destinations and what um, governments are doing to protect or foster tourism as the mood changes. And that's been a very powerful um, community for people who, you know, desperately want this virus gone as we all do, but also want to um, continue to, to support tourism and the tourism economy for their destinations so that's that's one thing i would um really like to highlight there is the power of that community okay it's been a pleasure to have you with us today especially on this special day of yours so um thank you very much and have a lovely lunch without the children sorry and, uh, i'm gonna miss the rest of the day no 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 you can catch up at a later date but great to see you and hopefully see you soon thanks kate bye, -bye. brilliant well thank you kate um next up we have Dan Brown and Ollie Lewis from Coel. So uh, Dan is one of the original team members of Coel. Um, Ollie joined the Coel sales and marketing team early in 2019. So B4 members Coel provide a first-hand insight into the modern workplace, looking at the latest agile work practices that have helped to transform office culture, how these ideologies helped companies adapt quicker in the midst of a pandemic, and what does the workplace of the future look like? Dan, Ollie, or should I, should I say Stanley, maybe would be uh, more, more appropriate. Ollie. Completely lost on this lot, they've got no idea who Stan and Ollie are. <laughs> Ollie probably doesn't know who Stan and Ollie are, but uh, good, good to see How you. How are you? Very well, Richard, thank you, and you? Yeah, not too bad. Good to meet you, Ollie. Good to see you. How are you doing? You're going to be learning from a pro today. That's it, Hardly. yeah, take notes. <laughs> so how's lockdown been for you guys? It's been interesting. Yeah, um, we've still been quite busy though. We've still had projects going throughout the duration. Um, so we had a NHS project at the start of lockdown, um, doing some work on one of the hospitals. And then it's just been a lot of small changes as people are going back. Um, but I think we've seen, starting to see a lot more larger yeah. projects as well coming through. Sort of green shoots, we're, we're picking up jobs during the uh, COVID period. So I think, you know, some some industries out there are still getting on with business as usual, which is great. Uh, it's a shame that there's been a bit of a, um, a reversal in, in sort of lockdown, et cetera. But uh, yeah, I think we knew this was gonna happen at some point, but uh, we've got to crack on, you know. We've got to so you're seeing this coming through as well, but 
talking to some of our business park clients, they're saying that uh, they're seeing a lot of businesses obviously appreciating they don't need as much space now, but maybe for that budget that they had, they can look for smaller space, but better quality space, or maybe sprucing up that space that they have got. Are you, are you seeing that coming through? Uh, it's, I've, I mean, some people are just, just waiting to see what happens. Uh, but even if people, you know, it, even if people are keeping the same numbers of people, once you go agile, you know, you, you do need sort of more of the collaborative. You need to, do need a little bit more space as well, especially if you're doing the social distancing. So it's not always an instant smaller space. It just might be having sort of more creative, um, sort of nicer environment to work in. I think we'll cover it later on, but it's being smart as well about the space that you've got. So where previously you used to be able to fit, you know, 20 people side by side on banks of desks, now with the social distancing measures, to get that same amount of people in that space, you obviously need more space. But with people working from home, it's, it's, it's working out, finding that interim middle ground where you have got the desk space, but also maybe more meeting space or other areas that people can go and have these team calls as, you know, the, the workplace is changing now, so we have to account for all of those those other measures as well. You guys have got a presentation. Um, the topic, Thank you. topic being well-being today, and Daniel, looking very well. Have you been away? Or is it just the, the, the sit-on mower garden tan? <laughs> He's been That's away. Been, yeah, I've been, <laughs> I did sneak out of the country for a short time. Yeah, Daniel. Anyway, over to you guys. So you've got some sh uh, slides to share, right? I think. We have. Yeah, yeah. we'll just... Going. I'll, I'll leave you to it. I'll back in and ask some questions at the end. Okay, thank Cheers, you, Richard. Thank you. Okay. You ready? Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to B4's webinar on the workplace well being. I'm here with my colleague, as we've said uh, before, Ollie. Uh, we're going to talk through the past, the present, the future uh, of our working space. Um, I'm going to run through a case study of a job we did at Bidwell House for Bidwells uh, a couple of years ago, which actually lends itself really well to the situation we're now in. Uh, so the starting point, this is how their part of their office used to look. Uh, as you can see, a very traditional, um, busy looking office where departments worked in their own space. Uh, there was very little. Uh, can I interrupt you just a sec? Yeah. Can you um, fit the screen? We're just seeing a small part of your screen at the moment. Uh, which part's that? Sorry. Uh, I don't know whether you can show the full screen. Because we're only seeing part of your screen at the moment. Have you got a. Uh... No, it's. Um... Are you on PowerPoint, are you? Yeah, we're on PowerPoint. So you should go slideshow and then from beginning, maybe. So at the top, that's from, that's from beginning there. The middle one, apparently. Uh, display settings. Yep. Swap. There we go. Perfect. Is that Thank it? you. Is that yeah. yeah, we're on. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so I'm going to run through a case study, uh, so Bidwell House. Um, now, what you can see here is the you know, a fairly traditional looking workspace. Uh, I'd like to think it's quite old fashioned looking now, uh, where departments worked very much uh, uh, in their own little groups, where there was very little uh, working between different groups of uh, people and departments people coming into the office every day, doing the nine to five and, and, and you know, not having necessarily a very uh, pleasurable environment to work in. So the objective of um, the, the, the project that we carried out, um, it was very much improving uh, the staff experience in the office, the well-being of its staff. And, you know, what is key today as well is getting uh, is is getting good staff joining you, but also staff retention as well. That is so important, um, and uh, to 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 enable us to uh, 
to do this, uh, we did a, an analysis, um, a workplace analysis of, of the office, um, just see, mapping out, you know, people's activity, their travel activity coming into the office, what they did when they got to the office, when they were going to meetings, if they were then going out on site, uh, where they're going to see other clients. Um, and an office of five, approximately 500 people, uh, we found that um, there were only about 60% of the people in the office at any one time. Now, everybody had their own desk. So, you know, you had a pretty full office, but it wasn't always utilized. So we needed to come up with a, a, a way of working, an agile way of working that improved the space, but allowed people to uh, have a better environment without trying to increase the size of the space, but give it a better environment to work in. Uh, from the work uh, space analysis, um, we used a, a time utilization. We, we mapped out um, a traffic light system over a, a space plan. Um, now, in an office, you have people who do different tasks, have different jobs. Uh, so you've got people in there who are in accounts or uh, HR. Uh, you know, they're very much office based. So uh, they, they were given the red light treatment. Uh, so if you look at the plans, there's the areas where you've got the, the, the red seating. Uh, that's where you have permanent staff. Um, then we go to the amber. So this is people who you know, work in departments, but they might be on site uh, on some days or um, for half a day. Uh, they might be in a lot of meetings, whether it's at, at clients or they've got client meetings in their own office. Um, so we need the amber, which is slightly more permanent seating, but it's fairly funky. It could be a library style benching, it could be high level tables. Uh, so when people come in, you know, they're not sat there all day, but they've got somewhere interesting to work from. Uh, we also then uh, have the green uh, seating, so the green light. Uh, this is more soft seating and cubicles uh, where people are coming in and they might just be doing a couple of hours um, sort of during the day before they're heading out again or before they're going into a, a meeting on site. Um, there are three areas that we broke this down into. Um, so agile working is the way, you know, it, it is what we were trying to achieve. Now to achieve this, you've got to look at the technology. Previously, you'd have workstations, uh, work, workstations where there are desk uh, mounted telephones, you've got PCs on your desk, and it's very much fixed and geared up for you to come to work or to your place of work to carry out your work. Now, giving people mobile phones, which, you know, is pretty easy and straightforward, allowing people to have uh, laptops, uh, tablets, uh, Surface Pros, um, and coming in to, for docking stations just gives people that flexibility for where they work. Now, if what we needed to do as well is increase the, um, increase people on different groups and departments working together. So more of a social working envir environment was required uh, to allow us to have collaborative working. And what we've seen in the past, if you look at the various styles of working over the number of years, you know, we've seen cellular working with cubicles where everybody's squirreled away and they're either at their office or in their cubicle, where you've got zero uh, communication between departments and collaboration. Then we moved to open plan. And again, you know, this was great, big open plan areas, MD in their office with everybody else, fantastic groups, departments working together, but again, no privacy to do any work. So it was, it was key in part of this to, to put all these styles together, having private space when required for that report writing uh, or private calls, also having a, an open plan feel to allow collaboration and, and socializing between departments and colleagues and having technology that allows us to do the agile working. Now, one of the brief uh, was to make sure that we didn't, uh, we didn't go corporate. So we don't want people thinking they're with a big corporate organization, they're, having, they're being block watched or whatever. So it was important to have a high end hospitality and residential look and feel to the space. 
Now, in providing this, our, our design team provided uh, visuals. So these are actually 3D rendered visuals to show our clients you know, how the space would look, how, the, how it would look, work and feel. Now, these are some uh, images of the finished product. And as you can see, it's quite uh, radical to how the original uh, uh, pictures looked. So people have got either more of the softer seating for meetings or they can, you know, make calls from. There's the more interesting working areas, uh, whether it's high tables or the library style benches. Um, and then there are, like I said, the areas where the permanent staff work from. Now, there was a survey carried out before and after the work was done, and there was quite a big jump in the uh, employee satisfaction compared to before the work was done. So that's great for productivity. Also, we saw a massive drop in the employment sick days as well. If you've got a nicer place to work, you know, people are happier coming in. Uh, also, there was a benefit uh, because of the technology we used with the lighting and heating, etc. There was a uh, cut in the electricity costs. Uh, and again, with the technology, we saw a reduction in water costs as well. And some fairly basic and uh, standard way of working as well. There was actually a, a decrease in paper shredding costs as well. So to summarize, um, you know, the work that we did, uh, the design, the brief from the client, uh, we produced something for the client that saw a greater employee autonomy, um, happiness in their work, which gave improved productivity. Uh, the management bought in, so the management from the top uh, bought into it, albeit I can say that one or two of the uh, senior partners were a little bit uh, dubious about how it might work, not having an office to work from. I must say, having spoken to them since, they feel it really is the way forward. Um, and this, this is really, we've seen, you know, th this, this, we've seen this is a great way of working, but it's also been so instrumental in the uh, COVID situation. I mean, these guys were already set up uh, with mobile phones. They could work from home. They could work in an agile manner. Uh, they had more space to effectively to work in. So, you know, moving forward with what's happened uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, they're, they're in a far better place to, to manage the business. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to pass on to Ollie, who will be able to run through uh, the next phase of the presentation. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yeah, I thought it was really important to have a look back at that Bidwell House case study because it shows the way that the workplace was moving more to an agile way of working and uh, some of the strategies that they've put in place have really enabled them to easily work from home. And I think we've seen the agile market just in a few months, just due to COVID and the changes that these have been implemented. Um, now in March, we were, we were given the, the government guidance to, to stay at home, which saw a huge shift across to home working those that could do so and um, then back in July we were encouraged back into the office so here at Coel I think like many businesses we put strategies in place to encourage workers back in and we were operating you know with a, a large proportion of our workforce back in the office whether that's on staggered rotated days um, or putting in different different strategies to get us back in and then we had another announcement last week which obviously means that we're going to have to adapt again um, so I just want to run through a few of the, the points and strategies that we've been implementing to some of our clients and also in our office to help us return to the office. Uh, we've been very lucky over the past few months to work alongside Cambridge Consultants. Um, so for those of you who are not aware, Cambridge Consultants are a, a huge company here in Cambridge. They do a lot of R&D development, uh, huge in the scientific sector as well. They work with some of the largest global companies on product development, um, simulation work, and they've actually come up with a, a simulation model for a theoretical virus, um, which works very well showing the scientific side alongside the work that we're doing. So if we have a look at the graph here, you'll see that the red line shows an office. This is again a theoretical office of a, a hundred staff within it. 
And this shows that with no control measures in place, on the left-hand side, we've got a very high average infection rate within that office space. But as we go down and have a look at the different variables on the right-hand side there, just implementing small changes, such as reducing numbers within meeting rooms, can actually bring that infection rate right down. From our side, um, actually on the front line going into these places and implementing these solutions, we've looked at four key areas um, to help create the workspaces and make sure that they are safe for staff to return to. So a big one of these is space planning. So this is looking at the space that you've already got within the office, which banks of desks can still be utilized how can you create safe circulation routes throughout the office so you haven't got people crossing on narrow door, uh, corridors or in lift spaces um, and how can desks be set up so you don't have people sat opposite each other and you can still maintain that social distance uh, two metre rule where possible. Graphics, these are things that we've seen across, you know, if you go into any supermarket, restaurants now, there's graphics everywhere reminding you to, you know, sanitise your hands maintain a safe two meter rule. Again, it's almost a new normal now. We see these everywhere. So how can these be incorporated to, you know, remind people as they return to the office what they should be doing, but also try and maintain a, a certain look and feel within the office rather than just putting signs up everywhere. On the product front, there's a lot of suppliers that we work with who have been very active over the, the COVID-19 um, scenario and there's products that have been produced such as uh, screens, uh, custom carpet tiles, and again, the graphics that can be implemented in the office to make it a safe place to return to. Mechanical updates. Uh, we have a team in-house that does all of our mechanical work. And if you are returning to an office after it being you know, dormant for a few months, there's certain tests and checks that should be carried out on your AC systems, also your water and plumbing systems. If you've got a lab or, or you know stagnant water in your offices, you want to make sure that these haven't um, been stagnant too long and they are safe to use once your staff do return. So here's a quick example of a, a space, space planning option that we've done. This is a typical office where you've got your, your banks of desks laid out. You've got communal touchdown areas as well as um, ad hoc meeting spaces. So where you've got a four bank of desks, in order to maintain that two metre rule, um, there's certain things that we put in place where you haven't got people sat opposite each other and um, staggering the desks as well. So you haven't got all the desks used all the time throughout the week. So putting in place a rotor, so you've got different staffing on different days. On the graphic side, there's so many options out there, but these are some that we felt have been really effective. So reminding staff to only use your own equipment. These graphics can be stuck on the desks. You've also got a do not use sign that can be stuck on desks that um, maintain that two meter distance between desks. Wait here signs. So these are in reception areas where you've got clients coming from outside the office, just reminding them where is a safe place to stand and sanitization points. Um, we've got one in our office that as soon as you come in, you go there, you clean your hands and then you're, you're safe to walk into the the office. On the product front as well, so screens are a, a solution that is it's very easy to implement, very quick and it's, it's not destructive. Um, we're seeing these rolled out a lot across offices where large workforces are coming back. It's not always possible to maintain that two metre rule on the desks if you have to fit a certain amount of people in. So these screens do create more of a modular environment where people can have their safe space um, at their own desk. A lot of these screens as well, they're very easy to clip onto existing desks and also onto your central divider screens that run through the spine of the, the desks there as well. Acoustic booths, we're seeing a, a, a lot of uptake in these over the past few years where you do have these large open space collaborative offices. So you can have you know freestanding uh, meeting rooms or phone booths where people can go to have a private call a small meeting away from that open plan space. I think we're going to see a huge uptake in these moving forward as well with the addition of a lot more video calls. So team calls or video calls, it's not always realistic to have these in an open plan office. So it's giving your staff these different areas where they can go to and still get that, that space and quiet that they need for these type of calls. 
on the fabric side, um, we deal a lot with furniture manufacturers as well. Um, so we don't want to take away all of these nice colours or nice looking feels that we've been implementing into modern offices over the years. So they've been working very hard to get easy to clean fabrics that still maintains that, that, that nice looking finish, but is easy to wipe down at the end of the day, can be implemented as part of your cleaning strategy and just you know make sure that we are managing that spread of the virus. Hand sanitization stations, it's not easy to say, <laughs> but these are everywhere. If you go into uh, any supermarket, again, any public spaces, you're gonna have these hand sanitization pumps. These aren't gonna disappear anywhere soon. So how can we incorporate these into the design, actually make them more of a feature? Um, you've got hands-free options as well, which is just a, a bit more of a, a clean version rather than using the hand pump itself. Millikan's a, a carpet supplier that we, we deal with quite a lot. Um, they've been, again, very good at reacting to the, to the COVID scenario. So rather than having the graphics just stuck onto desks, these are a bit more of a, a permanent fixture where it's looks very good you can just pop out your, your carpet tiles that are in the office at the moment swap them out for any of these options and it still has that that that, that guidance and, and and some of the uh, the instructions on there for the staff to follow once we do go back to normality these can just be popped out and the original carpet tiles returned so it's as long as you need them for really and it offers you that flexibility Here's a few office mock-ups that we've, we've put together. So as you can see here, you've got the circulation route throughout the breakout space. So you haven't got people passing in the narrower areas. Also highlighting where you can go to clean your hands. And you've got the two meter safe distancing transfers on the floor. And here's a traditional desk area. So we've actually extended the screens in the middle there with the Perspex screens that have been attached to uh, your standard screens down at the bank of desks. And again, it's just reminding people only use your own equipment. So just to summarize quickly then, uh, the return to workplace, even with the, the latest guidelines, I still think that we're gonna see people that have to be in the office. And um, there's certain industries as well that can't always work from home. Um, so it's just making sure that staff feel safe, highlighting it so people do remember the guidelines when they do return to the office. Uh, so I'm gonna have to just look back house which Dan you're on in the presentation here are some of the, the, the strategies that they've implemented so where they've got staircases that run right the way through the floors of the building it's allocating certain staircases to an up staircase others to down so you don't have people crossing in those tight areas also T points and print stations reminding people to wait two meters back before they go into those confined spaces this is their reception and concierge area They've also got a, a nice social cafe on the ground floor there as part of the, the office. So again, it's just reminding people, these are your safe places to stand and wait when you have clients coming into the office. So I'm afraid we're running out of time. Just, just a quick check on where we're up to on the slides. Have you got many more to go through? Because we've got our I've next- I've got about six slides to go through, maybe two minutes. Yeah, no, we're, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to call it a day there, I'm afraid, Ollie, because we've got the next okay. uh, next guest lined up. If you could just sort of give us a very sort of 30 second summary of those next six slides, that'd be great. And, then, yes. and if anybody wants this presentation, we can we can get it out to them afterwards. If they wanna get in contact, if that's okay. We'll send these through. Maybe, maybe you shout, shout out your email address, Ollie, then we, then, People can contact so you direct. My, my email address is ollie.lewis at coel.uk.com. Any questions, we've got our contact details there. Feel free to send them through to hello at coel.uk.com and we'll pick it up. We can send through these slides as well. Uh, but post COVID, we're, we're really looking at there's certain industries that aren't able to work from home. So even with the new guidance, work from home when you can. Companies uh, that, you know, in retail or hospitality where they're public facing. They don't have that flexibility to work from home. We still need to put uh, certain measures in place so that they can work safely from home, uh, from the office or their workplace. But also COVID is just one element of you know, our own health. So we also need to have a look at our staff well-being and mental health. I know for me personally, being in the office and being surrounded by uh, my peers and being able to have those ad hoc conversations is, is very good for me. It also sparks different conversations, you know, for the, the business side as well. So although I've, I've, we've been proven that working from home does work for certain industries, I think there's always going to be a need for the workplace. 
but it's perhaps not going to look as it is now. People okay. aren't going to have fixed desks. It's going to be more of a collaboration space where people can come into and use it as more of a, a touchdown area. So and any questions, do go onto our website. So that's coel.uk.com and Ollie and I are on there or anybody else uh, in our department. So do get in contact if you need any more info. Thank mm -hmm. you. Really appreciate it. No, thanks for your time, both of you. And uh, we'll hopefully see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, guys. Take care. So next up, we've got Nicola Wallbank. So Nicola's from Julian Taylor Solicitors. Uh, Julian Taylor are human resources and employment solicitors acting for local, national and international clients. Nicola, are you with us? You're there. Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me OK? I can, yeah. Hi, Richard. Nice, nice to see you. See you. Yeah, good to see you. The microwave's not about to ping, is it? Sorry? The microwave's not about to ping behind no, you. No, it's not. We're OK. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so how have things been for you and, and uh, everybody else at the firm? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. It's been a, a really interesting time to be an employment lawyer over the last few months. Um, you know, there's been a, a huge amount going on um, in the world of employment law. Um, you know, lots of our clients have been placed in quite tricky situations and under pressure by the pandemic. So it's thrown up lots of novel situations, as we've just been hearing, an explosion in home working, furlough, just yeah, lot, lot, lots to deal with, which has been, you know, really interesting, but 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 has had its challenges. Sure. And you wanted to talk about employment rights as a foundation for, for well-being. I think, you know, for well-being, employment law and legal rights really do form a, an absolute essential sort of foundation, the bedrock of well-being. Um, the employment relationship is fundamentally a, an unequal one where you have an individual on the one hand and then you have um, you know contracting with a, a business or a corporate entity on the other hand and employment law really evolved and came about and um, ha has grown uh, through its evolution to, to address that ba that balance and, and to counteract that imbalance um, and adherence to those standards and those legal rights really is at the heart of a sort of respectful and fair relationship, which of course is just essential to, to well-being. I think employment law is a pretty broad topic and there are lots of areas where businesses need to ensure that they're staying on the right side of the rules. But I can give a few I examples, I think. Um, I can imagine helpful. for you to, to keep on top of all of this has been a job in itself. Yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It is. But that's, you know, it's our job to do that. And then we can sort of help communicate of that out to the people that need it on the ground. An um, task. Sorry, Richard. An unenviable task. Yeah, <laughs> no, you, you crack yeah. on anyway. Give us your pointers. Um, yeah, I think it's a pretty broad topic and there are lots of areas where we can help people to sort of stay on the right side of things. But 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 one one area is, is is in relation to clarity i think for for individuals feeling secure and valued from the outset and having sort of clarity over their position can really help employees to feel wanted so having sort of clear and very professional documentation a good contract and you know a staff handbook that really suits the needs and and, and the size of your business is, is a very good start and sends the message to recruits right from the get-go that you're an employer that will do the right thing um, and, and so, you know, that, that, that's kind of building block one is getting the basics in place of your documentation, legally compliant. So drafting contracts, bonus schemes, policies, you know, covering and policies have been really important in, in recent times, you know, covering the procedures to follow if there are issues, homeworking policies, policies that deal with family rights and, and you know, taking time off to, de to care for dependents in emergencies. A another area is, is equality. Um, I think you know, working in an environment where individuals are respected um, and not subjected to discrimination is absolutely fu a, a, a fundamental of, of well-being. Uh, the Equality Act provides protection against discrimination on a number of protected characteristics. So um, age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage and civil partnership status, uh, race, religion or belief and sex and sexual orientation and, and so training on equal opportunities but also you know, employers are ensuring that their decisions are taken and policies implemented in a way that really respects those rights and observes and respects individuals is, is key. 
And then finally, respectful processes. We are seeing, unfortunately, a fair number of redundancies at the moment. And, and you know, we do acknowledge that in certain circumstances that's unav unavoidable. Uh, and so ensuring that those processes and difficult conversations are handled fairly and respectfully with acknowledgement of legal rights um, can really help to support the well-being of individuals who are going through those processes, but also the well-being of, of the business owners who are having to take those tricky decisions and, and being able to do that with the knowledge that, that they're doing it within the confines of the law. Very difficult time. And as you reference, you know, redundancies that we've we've seen, and I'm sure they're going to increase significantly over the next few months. Um, so a difficult time, and I'm sure you're going to be kept very busy at Julian Taylor. If, and if there's anybody watching, um, how do you best get in contact with you? Um, so the best thing to do, well, we've, we have our website, which is www.juliantaylorhr.com. Um, and also just pick up the phone to us. Um, uh, as you know, Richard, we're just we're based in Weston on the Green, just a few doors down from you oh, at, yes, at, at B4, although office. we're you know, <laughs> predominantly from home at the moment. But yeah, we can be, we can be reached um, at, through our website and also by, by phone at any point in time. Thank you very much for joining us. Give our regards to Julian and uh, we hopefully will see you soon and do pop in. Do. Thank say, you very much. Take care and, and good event. Thank you Thank very you. much. Take care. Bye bye. Right, so now um, we have our next guest in the palace. We, we thought we were joining by Zoom, but it's great to have Megan Carter with us. So Megan is the head of HR at Blenheim Palace and she's just making her way through the orangery now. Good morning, Megan. How are you? Oh. No, fantastic. You coming, you back, coming back in, Emma? Oh, Clark's going to join us as well. Let's all sit in, shall we? <laughs> How are you, um, uh, Megan? I'm good, yeah. It's been busy, crazy. I'm sure. But, um, yeah, it's, it's not too bad, so thank you for inviting me. No, good to have you here. I don't know whether you, you probably didn't hear. We had uh, Nicola Warbank from Julian Taylor's sisters talking about employment law, so yeah. an area that you're very familiar with and talking about all the, the changes that you've got to keep on top of, and that must have been a, a job in itself for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, the government weren't entirely clear about all the furlough rules, and, and we just wanted to do the best for our staff and get as much you know, money to them as possible in the, in the best possible way. So, um, yeah, it's been complicated, um, but we've, we've got through it. So, what have been your, um, what have been people's main concerns during this time? I think concerns are around, I mean, worrying about their job, worrying about homeschooling, um, health for themselves and their family, um, kind of feeling um, separated from their employer. So that especially those on, on furlough, which we'll go into a bit later. Um, so yeah, lots of concerns. I think when lockdown was announced, it was obvious that there was going to be a massive impact on people's mental health. I think most people would have, have realised that. Um, so yeah, just lo lots of concerns and worries, really, um, not knowing what the future is going to bring and the, just the complete change in landscape, really, for everybody. Yeah, Gary earlier talking about uh, this biggest threat to all of us is uncertainty and not having any sort of idea about when all this is going to come to an end is, is mentally, mental torture almost for, for lots of us, so yes. I'm sure you've seen that first hand. Exactly, yes, absolutely. I mean, we go through ups and downs and, and try and keep in touch with our, our staff as much as possible, um, but you go from working at home thinking, actually, this is not so bad, you know, um, to oh, you know, what's the point in getting up and going, sitting in my kitchen again and having a million Zoom calls and just feeling out of touch to, you know, getting used to it again. Um, so it's just, just ups and downs, really. Have you seen people, without naming names, it might, might be an unfair question, but people that have thrived in a pre-lockdown environment that have really struggled and vice versa, those that maybe weren't as... I don't know, gregarious and extrovert, maybe pre-lockdown, but have really come into their own during lockdown? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially sociable people. Um, they've struggled with not being in our, our, our offices. Um, it's a good environment. You've been there um, mm -hmm. to the estate office. And we have a real family feel about Blenheim. So whether you're in the estate office or you're working at the palace or on the farm, um, people who haven't had that contact anymore have, have struggled. But gradually through keeping contact with them, you know, we've been able to um, definitely kind of 
boost their confidence and then it, it just becomes the norm again and you, you kind of don't feel so insecure anymore. Um, I don't know if I've seen anything the other way around, um, but, but yeah, it's, it's just about keeping in contact with people. Um, we have various ways of doing that. So the marketing team, which is, is brilliant, sends out something called the Flagstaff Echo, which is our newsletter, and we do video. So, pick, so diff, like pick a different people, maybe Don, maybe Heather, or maybe myself, or someone, an employee, um, doing a video, um, reaching out to people, saying how, how Blenheim's going, or talking about their life. Um, so that's been quite fun doing that and we also have so Dom does a Q&A so ask Dom anything you can imagine he loves that so every other Thursday um, we have a video video call where anybody can join um, and it's just it's just really sweet you see everyone's faces on the screen saying oh hi you know and then they're too shy to ask anything but sometimes they do we, we let them ask questions beforehand as well if they don't want to speak yeah. Um, so lots of ways of communicating. We make sure that teams have um, online meetings as much as possible, even if you've got nothing to say, just to get the, the groups grouped together. Um, and yeah, various... We have things we call e-shots, which are just emails to everybody. So we might have some mental health advice or, um, I don't know, just some activities that are going on. Um, we have quizzes, like pub quizzes online. Um, so yeah, we've really gone for it in terms of making sure that people feel connected with and still feel a part of us because we very much feel like, like they are. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, been, it's been a challenge, but it's also been a new, a new way of connecting um, with one another. How have you found the quizzes have gone down? Have you had many people joining? Yeah, a few, I think, yeah, and some people have then done their own quizzes. So yeah, they've, they've gone down really well. Yeah, definitely. We used to do just quizzes here and raise money for charity and bits and pieces, but yeah, no, they've, they've gone down well. Did you have themes for your quizzes? Um, probably, yes. Yeah, we have a quiz master and they choose, they choose the questions. So. so yeah, that's been quite fun. But also we have mental health champions. So what we've done is as soon as... Um, lockdown was announced and, f and we started furlough we had somebody who was a mental health champion that was reaching out to those people that were more vulnerable perhaps living alone um, or that we knew was, was struggling so we have we maintain that telephone contact as well um, as, as just the group activities and Don was talking to us earlier today about job rotation that you've been doing around yes. Lennon and is it right that you had a gamekeeper that gave um, that what that helps with lambing. Yes. So um, yeah. So we have job rotations. So two kind of forms. So one is we we immediately had um, a core group of staff <coughs> that we kept on, and then we realised quite quickly that the people on furlough were really missing us, really wanted to get back to work. So we started rotating roles. So, so that would be maybe a palace host a swap with another palace host for a couple of weeks and then go on furlough. The other, the other thing which you're describing is, is the sharing of roles. So we had gamekeepers delivering lambs, um, which was quite an interesting theme. And yeah, just other people sharing and rotating roles. So the core group that stayed at, at Blenheim um, were yeah, swapping roles. So you, you might be on doing maintenance one day or you might be on the front desk the other. And that created a real sense of um, community and, and a sense of sharing, which, which we like here. We suggest that Tom should appoint a head of job swaps in future, so keep yeah. that going. Do you yeah. think that's saying that you will continue? Absolutely. Um, we've had two um, successful restructures actually, which um, contain roles that are more flexible across the estate. Um, so it allows for more jobs um, and it allows people to develop their skills. So yes, absolutely something we'll continue with. Excellent. What sort of support have you given to managers? Obviously there's a lot of change at the moment and uncertainty. Yeah. Have you had to step up the support that you've given to your managers? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing with management support is, you know, your employees are happy when they've got good management support. So a part of Blenheim has always been to give good training and development to our managers. So just before lockdown, we had a management development program delivered by the Oxford Group, um, which was focusing on how to engage with employees, how to support staff, but also HR do a range of um, how to manage people, how to motivate people, you know, how to do 
grievances, investigations, you know, so that they have that knowledge because um, people who feel more confident in their management role generally have more, more confident staff. So we do do quite a bit of support for managers. And in terms of roles that you'll need to kind of going forward, do you think job descriptions will change slightly and you'll be looking for people that can multitask more? Um, yeah, they already have. In some areas, they're always going to be quite specialists. But yeah, we've already changed quite a variety of, of roles um, to be more multi multifunctional, yes. And, and what's your biggest sort of challenge at the moment now, sort of managing the 400 plus that you, staff that you've got? Just, I guess, managing remotely, um, you feel a tiny bit out of it sometimes. And, and of course, we've just done a recent employee survey um, where we've asked people how they're feeling and and perhaps they would like a bit more presence and if, but during this time it's difficult because you know you have to remain distant so I think people are understanding of that but for me that's the challenge we're such a family we're used to you know doing everything together having a good community um, being very close and so it's just managing that and reassuring people that we're still we're still there and we're still the Blenheim family. So do you, do you get lots of staff that aren't working coming in as visiting public? Yes, yeah. yes, all the time, yeah. yeah. More fact, so than ever before, I should imagine. Probably, yeah. yes, yeah. This is weird having a place that you want to come to socially as well. Um, but yeah, we're very lucky for that. So you've been doing a lot of video during this time, um, and Don's been doing some as well. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Has that helped people to stay connected? Yes, I think so. So um, lots of video calls... Um, like daily in my case with you know our management group um, the SMT and my and my staff and my team as well as taking them out for lunch occasionally social distance lunches um, and then the video messages have been really useful and I think we'll continue with those because um, if nothing else even if they don't read the rest of the newsletter they like to see the video um, of maybe you know the foresters doing something or the gardeners or um, Dom giving a, a business update or something like that. So I think we'll continue with that. Did you do one yourself? I did one. Um, I decided it'd be a really good idea to do one while the lambs were being born in the lambing shed and it was really noisy and it was a real disaster, but it gave it pretty Is good that available on YouTube? Or That's is it, can I, I'll it? send it to you. Yeah. Yeah. You must have. <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. So um, in terms of um, moving forward now and and, and sort of the next six months of Blenheim, what, what do you see happening with you know, the continued lo loss of events and corporate functions? Is it, I mean, do you as a head of HR, obviously you've got your team around you, but yeah. do you work with other HRs in local businesses, getting support from them and understanding how to, to face these challenges as well? Yeah, exactly, absolutely. So um, I'm part of the HR Treasure House Forum and um, partly that's us calling each other for moral support because HR um, needs somebody to go to too and other, you know and and also it's for you know getting updates on on their businesses and, and how they're doing and and so yeah it's it's useful to get that feedback um, going forward we just hope for the best we we're optimistic we did Salon Privé just recently we've done the triathlon um, and, and we just hope things will get back to normal as soon as possible. I think we've been less affected than other other places, um, so we're very lucky in that way. But we are we are optimistic. So getting back to normal, does that mean that you're going to be working from home? Is working from home going to be a normal part of culture at Blenheim, or have you looked at it? What yeah, else you might do? It ch I think it's changed a lot of companies actually, and I think for for the better so I think working from home will become the norm where we can but we do want to open the offices also when we can because people are missing that from our recent staff survey it's very 50 50 some people are quite happy from working from home but other people would like you know to be in at least a couple of days um, so yeah I think it and it's great for flexible working it's good for work-life balance it's good for working parents so I think we will continue with that we do have um, for people coming back into work a special kind of induction, so making sure that they've done their, um, you know, checking that they've got all the right equipment, um, if they're coming back on site, that they've got their safety induction and that they know what they're doing in terms of those rules. Um, so inducting people back in and working with the new 
like blending world has been quite um, a task for myself and, and the health and safety um, lady Lucy as well, just to make sure that you know we're, we're not just throwing people back in at the deep end. How have you found um, with people being furloughed? How have you found that's been from a keeping in touch point of view? Um, we've tr- yeah, furlough has been hard for people on furlough, and I think. The people on furlough want to be working and the people working think they want to be on furlough. Um, but it's undoubtedly, um, it's made, I think, you realise how much people are committed to Blenheim and, and to their jobs and to this place because they just have missed it so much. So we've just made sure that everything we do, we've, we've kept in touch with, with those furloughed people, making sure that we're either they're being called personally if they're, they're vulnerable um, or they're getting the newsletters, they're getting invited to the Don's Q&As, or they're getting regular, like, just being in touch with their managers as well. To begin with, a lot of people, you know, they, they're like, oh, can we still do something? Can we do? And, of course, with the rules, you, you are not allowed to work. So it's very hard to tell people, you know, you can't, you can't work, you're not allowed to. But soon, kind of, people, people got, get used to that. And then with the rotations, that helped, because it gave people hope with coming back. And how have you managed your own well-being during this time? It must have been a very busy time for you. Um, really, really busy, but I've got a, I've got a great team. Um, Dom and the SMT are very candid about their own well-being and their own mental health issues, and I think it has to absolutely come from the top. So if you're struggling, I could, I could easily talk to any, any one of them. And um, actually, even our employees and the managers and the staff, you know, when we have announcements or we're going through something, there will always be one, two or three people that will phone me and say, and how are you? Um, So that's just the the, the family feel again that we have here. What's the culture like? It feels like a really lovely place, Blenheim. It's always nice coming here. What's the culture like to work here? Yeah, I mean, it is. I do feel lucky. So I grew up, I came here when I was little. And I take my children here, so it's, it's amazing to work here, and it is a good culture. But we have something called the Blenheim Behaviours, um, and I think that helps with um, people's mental health as well. So how, how you deal with people, how we are as a business. If you want to come and work here, this is what you should expect to be treated like. So we have five behaviours, um, one of which is keeping our promises, one of which is saying um, being honest with kindness, um, and so we, we do have certain rules by which we, you know, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it and the way you carry out your task and how you behave and interact with one another. So, yeah, the culture is good. It's, it's very, very close and very family-like. Yeah, and anybody watching today that wants to get a bit of that blend and magic into their business, <laughs> oh, it's, it, it's clear that there is something here which is, is very special. And it's come through on the videos that we've shown speaking to you guys and getting to know you well over the past few years. What would, what would your advice be to them over what you've learned during lockdown um, and how that they can... What, you know, if, you were, if you were put somewhere else in another business, Megan, let me ask from mm. that point of view, what would you take from here into that business as sort of bankers that would help you engage with, with, a, with a new team? Probably just you know, the simple things that everyone talks about that they want and that's, you know, good good management support, good communication and just being candid and honest with people and treating people like like human beings. It's you know, it's easier in a place like this because you, you recognise so many people and there's a lot of um, you know, love and support from, you know, families and generations work here. Um, but yeah, I would just say just communication, listening, doing employee surveys um, yeah, just, just, just listening really and, and it's really like working hard. So you want to work hard for a company that works hard for you. And take Dom with you, maybe that'd be a good start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, Megan. Well, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate you joining us because we thought we were going to see you on the little screen over there. So. You're but welcome. it seems like, like winter has come upon us since, the, since you sat in that chair. So oh, if you look yeah, around, really it's depressing. actually... Checking it down. Normally so. I bring sunshine, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Never mind. Are you walking back to... Is it, so the estate office now, which is fantastic gonna... new office that you had. Yeah, had, I what, know. Just over a year's use. Literally and the most gorgeous office you could ever work yeah. in with the views and the scenery, um, you know, like ceiling to floor, glass windows. But um, some people are still in there um, when, you, when they have to, but 
Uh, yeah, I'm not there at the moment. So, so how often are you actually in? Are you, you know? Only on a need by, like if I have to meet with somebody, okay. um, then I go in. But other than that, I, I sometimes go for a pizza at the Pleasure Garden, which is what I'm going to do now actually. <laughs> Go for a pizza at the pleasure oh, garden. This lot might go with you, I think, if you uh, <laughs> well, <thank laughs> might be a trailer. Well, lovely to see you, Megan. And thank you. you very much for joining us. And uh, thank you. And enjoy your pizza. What are you going to have? I will. Um, well, we pizza. Mushroom. Every mushroom. Time. Fantastic. Brilliant. <laughs> thank you. Great to see you, Megan. Thank you for thank your time. You too. Really appreciate it. Right. So next we have. We're up, where are we up to? We're up to. Um, so we've got Mark Spillander now. From we've, got a, we've got a video, I think, actually, just quickly first. We on PT? Welcome back to B41, and it's the first of our um, all day long webinars, and they're going to be bi monthly. And we're joined now by Mark Spillander from Modus. Mark, are you there? Earth calling Mark. There he is. I'm here. I, thought, I thought you muted me, so uh, I wasn't sure if you had to unmute me. I can't, I can't do anything here. I'm, I'm, mm. well, we're both powerless. How are you, Mark? Yeah, all good. All good. How are you guys? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Not too bad. Although I was just saying to Megan that winter seems to have come into the full force as we've been sat here. So, you you basically winter at the moment? Yes, nice and warm. I have the heaters on. Oh, so, good. Lucky you. <laughs> so, do you want to talk to us about well-being and, and modus? Yeah, so uh, what we've been doing, so obviously it's been a challenging time for a lot of uh, businesses during this time, and we own quite a few businesses, construction, accounting, so it's affected us in lots of different ways. Um, but it is it has been a challenge keeping team morale up. So obviously when the business is doing really well and the business is normal, it's, it's been a lot easier. But the businesses where, like a construction firm, where they had to kind of all go home for a period of time, then come back in, and now it looks like they might need to go back. Um, it is about kind of keeping that morale up and um, just trying to keep the team together in the best possible way, arranging Zoom calls together, that kind of thing. So that's been a, a challenge that not only we face, but also um, we've seen quite a, a few of our clients facing. Um, so it's just about keeping that kind of motivation up because it can get a bit down when you can't go out and see people. And you know, many, many Zoom calls cannot replace good old fashioned networking. So uh, uh, you're talking about clients, obviously your, your accounting clients. From... Yeah. A point of view have you found that you're you're having to wear a few different hats now not just advice on finances and strategy and budgets yeah, etc absolutely it's it is a, i was having a great call with this uh, client yesterday was their, their monthly uh, catch-up and um yeah they had a good month but they were just feeling a bit down because they all had to go work from home again they'd just come back in the office they're just all sort of feeling that bond of hanging out with the colleagues cracking the jokes on monday morning talking about the weekend you know that interaction um, and now most of them because they're single as well they all have to go back to kind of their, their their apartments and flats where it's not great so we just came up with ways of well how can we kind of keep the team together during this time um you, you know every day you can have your skype calls friday afternoons i mean during lockdown we used to do cocktails on friday afternoons make your best cocktail and show us what you're doing um so just that kind of human interaction as best as you can I say nothing can replace taking the team out for lunch and, you know, having that, that, that lovely interaction. But, you know, whilst we're going through this this time, just trying to think of some fun ways to keep that human interaction so that you kind of feel connected with people. You feel like your, your work colleague still has your back. But, um, yeah, you, you're not kind of having that time in the office together. So uh, that's been a challenge for us. But it, it's great to see some of our clients and sort of my team as well and um, just come with new new ways of making sure that everyone stays connected and motivated. Because that, that is a challenge when, you, when you're not around everybody. Yes. We're in the world, Mark. So, what's the been the number one cocktail today? Oh, it's not Friday yet. <laughs> it's just just lemon tea today. <laughs> no, I'm not suggesting you were drinking one, Mark. I'm just asking. Out of interest, what has been the, the favourite cocktail? Well, it's got to be my one. I, I, during lockdown, I mastered the mojito, like absolutely nailed it. I had various mint leaves growing. It was a bit of a connoisseur, so um, I'd go with my mojitos. Every time, are they effective? What was that? Sorry. Are they effective? 
very effective. Well, you know, the, the saying is during lockdown, we've all been pouring our own drinks and now we've gone back to the bars a little bit and um, you're like, well, what's in here? Um, so, <laughs> yeah, to get you. probably water that now it's lockdown, I should say that. <laughs> in branded mugs i can see your oh no no this is lemon lemon tea not 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 cocktails i promise it's definitely not a cocktail it's only wednesday we're not not there yet so how do you see sort of the next six months panning out then mark obviously more of the same for you managing staff yeah. and clients it's a mega question that so um um, talking through our clients but also our businesses is just stay agile um, you know a lot of businesses experience a bit of a boom between June and now and, and now it might be fizzling out but um, stay agile keep the cash keep capital in back as much as you can um, because we're not quite sure what sits in this fog uh, there's going to be so many pressures upward downward sideways government interactions you know housing market unemployment or potentially not so we're just not quite sure what's how it's going to go in the next six months so our advice to all our clients and the advice that we're taking for our businesses is stay agile and try and conserve as much capital as possible and get ready to pivot if there's a big change that happens that we need to adapt to. So stay agile and get as much capital into your business as possible. Emma? No, <laughs> sorry, I'm unfairly put that over to you. Mark, I appreciate you joining us, Mark. And uh, well, yeah, it's a, it's a very brief five minutes, but good to see you. And uh, hopefully we'll catch up again soon and, and keep up the good work. You take Thanks for having me, guys. Cheers. Right, so now we're... excited about this next... This next well, week. over to you, Anna. Um, and um, we've got Professor Simonetta Manfredi joining us. Simone Simonetta Manfredi is the Professor of Equality and Diversity Management and the Associate Dean for Research and Knowledge Exchange at Oxford Brookes University. Her research interests and expertise focus on gender and leadership, age discrimination and retirement policies, and work-life balances. She's the co-author of Managing Equality and Diversity, published by Oxford Brooks Press, which received the Chartered Management Institute Management Book of the Year Award in 2013, under the Management and Leadership category. I like so, what you did there, Emma, called it Oxford Brooks Press. We shouldn't take that under, it's Oxford University Press, but <laughs> you nicely try to give, it, give the credit to Oxford Brooks. Uh, but I can see, I can see Simonetta now. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear us? Perfect, mm -hmm. definitely. Emma's with me. Hi. Hello. I don't know if you heard our introduction. Yes. Um, I'm not, I heard the last bit, something to do with Brooks, I, I, I didn't catch yes. that. <laughs> um, well, I know that you're gonna to talk to us now about work and life, it's all in the balance. So I'll um, hand over to you. Okay, thank you. So I'll try to see where I can get the slides up the screen. I hope the last talk that I did, it was a little bit challenging probably my fault, let's see. We'll, we'll let you know as soon as we can see anything. Yep. Yeah, it looks like it's coming on now. Yeah, it's fine, um, just a slide show. Yeah, you can just go to... Right, okay. Perfect. Can you see it okay? Yeah, Great, okay. Time? Right. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to join this uh, um, seminar discussions, which are, looks really interesting indeed. <clears throat> so I understand that your the theme running through this is about uh, well-being and the work-life balance clearly is a very a key element of that, because if the different elements, uh, different things are happening in our life are not in a sort of balance, and especially if we are overworked, that, as we all know, can be a, a, a source of anxieties and stress. Now, it's interesting to talk about this subject in the present times, very challenging times, because we've been forced into one of the most extraordinary experiments, and that has been, we've been forced to do remote working on, on a scale that would have been unimaginable. So what I want to explore with you are three key questions. First of all, has this experiment and of course I have to say not everyone has been working from home as we know so this talk in a sense focuses very much on the office type of jobs which have been uh, um, which has been possible to to do from home well there are lots of workers who still have to um, operate in the front line in different ways so but let's focus on this particular uh, situation which is quite extraordinary and um, so well, I'd like to talk a little bit about that and thinking, offer, offer some reflections of how that might have uh, 
either help people to perhaps rediscover their work-life balance or achieve quite the, op the opposite, make it really more, even more difficult and challenging. I think, of course, inevitably, we, we need to talk about the technology as well, because the technology has been, again, key to this big experiment, enabling this very big experiment, and some reflections of the how much the technology is empowering house us, but how there is also the other side of the coin could be that is making work all pervasive. And finally, a few reflections about thinking about what might happen in the future. First of all, I also would like to make a, a premise here saying that I use the expression work-life balance because it's commonly understood, it's easy, um, but I'm not entirely happy with the concept that it conveys. It almost feels as if it, it introduces a false dichotomy between paid work and life. Paid work is very much part of our life, of our identity. Um, so it's not one thing against the other. Um, it's a question of, as I said before, trying to achieve some kind of balance or, or perhaps even harmony uh, um, about, along, you know, uh, among all the different aspects of our life. And of course, this balance will be different depending on the life stage we are in. So that said, I will continue to use that expression because it's an easy one to do and it's, as I say, commonly understood. Now, as a, an academic, you know, we always like to talk about theories uh, and I don't want to bore anyone, but there is one which I will mention here, which is actually quite helpful in terms of helping us to make sense of exploring the first questions about how this um, working remotely, the fact that the office has come to, the, to our home, how we made sense of that, whether to what extent has been helping or, or not. Um, and it's, it's called the, the border crossing theory, but let, let's think about it as a helpful framework for both individuals and also employers who will have to reflect on how their, their staff, their, their colleagues are actually leaving through this, this extraordinary experiment. And what this, this framework suggests is that we are border crossing, uh, crossers and we make the daily transitions between the two worlds of family uh, of our own work, and I would say private life or family, but private life is much more inclusive. The identify the borders can be physical, temporal, and psychological. Now, reflecting a little bit about what this means, you know, the physical border, of course, with the, the office has come to the uh, houses, to our home, we have no physical borders anymore, unless people, maybe people, some people have reconstructed those borders within their home by having a study, by doing the work in the garden shed. And how important it is to have that physical border. I'm, I'm trying to pose here some, some questions that people might want to reflect on. And of course, the temporal one as well. So the, the, the structured working day, nine to five, where you go to an office. Well, at home, um, we can restructure things depending, you know, there will be some times when we all need to be online but then we might have that as help individuals to gain some flexibility in terms of working more at their own pace um, when they don't they want to do things or working in a different way. Uh, or on the other hand, it might have again have made you know, disrupted that structure that some people actually like to have that structure. And then the most complex, I think, is a psychological border. And that is always the case, whether we work, also we work in an office, we, we, even if we have those two other borders, a psychological border is, is what could undermine our well-being if the work is always with us, is always on, on our mind. Likewise, you can argue if some of the uh, is, other issues that are happening in your life are always you know, on your mind, then they, they can undermine that. Um, your well-being as well. So these borders are also can be permeable, flexible, as you can see from the figures that are put there on the slides, depending on what's happening. And, and we go back to this com concept of crossing. So depending how you cross those borders, how you organize those borders, they, they may vary. Um, permeable sometimes might be difficult to draw the line between what is work or if people who quite enjoy their work or uh, uh, is it work, for example, in academia, I mean, if I use my own example, uh,
enjoyable. So it could be and from other people, some of the things they do, they're really very enjoyable. So you could see some permeability there and the flexibility, they have to move constantly. So what is important, I, what I, I hope that this um, framework help us to think is how do we do that border crossing? And how do we mold those borders? Because a lot of it is within our control. And control and autonomy is something that can help people. If people feel in control, can help with their well-being. But also it could be helpful for um, employer to think about. Sorry? I'm very sorry. I'm just going to have to ask you to pause briefly. To what? To pause, um, just to stop briefly. We, we're just having, yeah. having some technical difficulties. We're just going to try and sort out the technical problem and then we'll come straight back okay, to Okay, that's fine. Apologies. Okay. Right. Sorry about that, everybody. It's a slight technical fault. We're um, back live with you again. No Sim problem. Simonetta, I... please, please do continue. Thank you. Okay. That's great. So final message on this slide. There is a lot. We, we, we are in control of, of crossing those borders. We are molding those borders, shaping the environment around us. It's really important that we keep ourselves in control. And I suppose there is also a role for employers and not being shaped by, by the events. There is also a role from the employers who are working there with their colleagues and staff in terms of uh, ensuring that people remain in control of that border crossing and that border crossing is done in a productive way. Techno let's talk a little bit about technology, empowering or enslaving. Well, now I'm here, I'm in actually sitting in my, in my home and I'm joining you. I would have much preferred to join you at Blenheim, uh, the beautiful surrounding of Blenheim. But because of the work, the way the, or other commitments today, it's, um, it would have been difficult for me to come all the way to Blenheim. Um, so there are lots of advantages about working remotely. Um, you can do, you know, you can work at your own pace anywhere, um, do uh, work on, even on the go. Um, and I think one of the key advantages of this is that it gives us a great sense of autonomy and control. And there is a lot of there are lots of studies that show that this sense of autonomy and control is really important in terms of, um, especially in relation to our well-being and avoiding fear, feeling stress. Is when you feel that you are not in control, that is what can determine um, can be a cause of stress. 
However, we need to be very mindful of the disadvantages as well. And to a certain extent, we have already talked about the different barriers. I mean, this can be completely blurred because it, you could, uh, we could end up very easily in a situation where work is always with us. The email is a very good example. So should we have a right to disconnect? Now, I think it's interesting I, here. Um, there are a couple of examples. Um, one from France, where they actually introduced a, even a law um, which requires company with more than 50 employees to um, draw up a code of conduct and setting the hours when staff can actually email one another or answer emails. Um, and the other examples is from a German company, and probably there are many more now They do that during the holidays, uh, people can completely disconnect so you don't go back to that ghastly. Um, a scenario where you end up with a lot of emails waiting for you in the um, in the inbox. Um, I'm sure there are lots of companies in the UK who probably so the technology is can enable us to do this disconnection if we want. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of companies in the UK that use uh, similar devices. I think the important point here is again that keeping that sense of control. We had an interesting conversation with some colleagues about this and some were saying, oh, but you know, for me, I've got children, childcare responsibilities, the evening is a time when I can you know, sit down, do emailing, et cetera. Um, but you know, we can still do that because all you have to do is put them into the um, time, the emails. I'm very sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. All oh, right, okay, another technical issue. Another glitch, I think, yeah. Yeah, okay, no problem.
Five minutes. Got, um, four minutes, but then no problem. Okay, fine. So I have made this point about you know the, the, the technology and the fact that again we can be in control and it's probably a good idea to think more how we um, we can use these devices that technology itself offers us. So let me go on to the fi very final slide. More flexible working, better work-life balance. Well, flexible working. There has been discussion about it for a long time. Uh, there is a lot of flexible working already, but just a few more points. I mean, the, I, I believe that the working from home probably even after the pandemic, which we all hope it will end not before too long, um, they, I guess that there will be more flexible, more home working. And there are loads and loads of studies that have been done, which that do show, as, as I said before, is this element of autonomy people feeling more in control, which is quite important. And that could lead, lead uh, to greater productivity, less sickness, absences. Um, but also we have need to be mindful that not everybody will want to work in that way because for some people we have heard, we've seen a lot of articles on the press. Some have felt it very positive. Others, you know, they, they really miss the, uh, we have social animals. We, we need to socialize. We need, need to miss the environment in the office and miss also that kind of informal, um, not just exchanging ideas, but also learning from one another, that informal le learning that goes on in the office as well. Um, the Office of National Statistics has found that the commuter, we have seen in the press a lot of people seems to be buying in the countryside now, leaving the cities and the commuters, according to a survey the, the Office of, for National Statistics did, uh, they seem to be more unhappy and anxious and, uh, than those who don't have to commute. So again, um, flexibility, there, there is already a lot of flexibility in the workplace. We also have legislation which allows people to, to uh, request to reduce their hours. It is important in a, way, in, in a lot of ways because it allows us, depending also, uh, meeting some of the demographic changes like an aging population, allowing people to work perhaps remain longer in the workplace, uh, meeting all those, those needs. Again, it helps with managing that balance throughout our life course, whether it is because we have caring responsibility, whether it is because we might want to slow down, or whether it is because we want to do something different. What I think it would be interesting to see if the four hours a week comes back as a, as a, on, on the agenda. I've already seen quite a, an interest in the press about it, and there are some employers who, have, who are using it. One thing is that there will be less work around, so the four hours a week could be a way for, um, no, sorry, four hours a week, four days a week, four hours a week. That's quite a change. Three. It could actually help in redistributing work, the work that around people. It, this has happened before. There has been companies who have done this in the past to avoid redundancies, for example. So it's not it's nothing new. And there are some that there seems to be a growing interest around that. But also we need to be mindful that the history of work, although sometimes it doesn't feel like that, because especially the technologies has intensified work, the history of work is about the reduction of working hours. Um, you know, the, the, the working day has been reduced significantly if we think what it was decades ago. Uh, but even the, the, the working week, you know, a lot of people used to work five days a week and that, uh, sorry, six days a week and that's now has reduced to, uh, is to five. So even if it doesn't feel that way, especially because of technology has intensified what we do, actually the history of work, if we look at it, tends to go uh, towards the reduction. So that will be interesting to see, watch this space with that agenda. 
The final point I want to leave you with is this idea of socially sustainable work. I mean, another thing that has been brought into focus by this pandemic, it has been how important the social infrastructure is, uh, especially when we went to lockdown, a lot of people who uh, had to shield and getting the social infrastructure mobilized in helping one another was so important. So the impact of the organization for work, of work is really important on individual lives, well-being, but also on the community and the well-being of the community and the wider society. And I, my final word is this, this pandemic is really terrible and we all we, you know, hoping that it will finish soon, but it's also a massive opportunity to really rethink how we do things and to engage with some real change, think outside of the box and be radical in the way we want to do, organize our life, our society and get something which is uh, which is different and possibly more more exciting. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that insightful talk and apologies for the technical problems. Not, not a problem. Thank you. Lovely to meet you, Simonetta, and hopefully we'll meet you in the flesh one day. Thank you. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Bye. So up next, we're going to hear from Anne Morrill from Olivia May. And Anne is the Managing Director of Olivia May. She, it was established in 2013. Olivia May has been the ultimate shopping destination for niche international and UK fashion designers. So I think we've got Anne there now. Hi, Anne. Anne, can you hear us? Yep, I can. Good morning, how are you? Fine, thank you, I'm good. Thank you very much, yes. And you? Yeah, good, thank you, Anne. And we've got Emma here as well, so. Hi. Hi, hi, Emma, hi. So, Anne, what do you think we can do to manage mental health working from home? Okay, well, I think what's really important in the industry in which we're working in, obviously, clothing is, is really important about how you feel and, and your confidence as well. And I think it's so much important now, obviously, as people are not in the workplace and often they're sitting as we are now um, on a Zoom um, and people have to feel that they are they're professional, they're, they're right, they, 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 their day is, is correct in terms of the workplace. Um, and, and clothing is really an important part of that. I think if you listen to many of the clients that we actually work with, it's as important, if not more important um, at the moment in terms of actually making them feel that it's a very structured day, that actually it represents the, the work that they're in fact doing. I mean, only a, a few days ago, I was just talking to um, a client and they were saying, actually, I, I have different outfits for different parts of the day. In the morning, I'm in a, in a presentation mode and I'm working at Teams and actually I'm in a very formal environment and therefore I need to look like that and be like that. And then as I actually go through the day, um, I would normally have a sort of like just a discussion with my team and therefore I wanna be that in a more relaxed environment. So actually I'm trying to portray that through my clothing and that in order to be able to send those messages out, in order to be able to build the confidence, make people feel at ease um, but also keep a, a very sort of professional um, look about it as well, which is really important um, for our organisation. And that, of course, and as people know, you know, clothing, it, it builds so much confidence. Um, and, and simple thing, again, you know, another antidote where, where actually someone is saying, oh, wow, that, that blouse looks wonderful, that dress looks wonderful, that piece looks, you make yourself feel good. And that those are really important parts of, of us being, um, I suppose, uh, just being appreciated in those ways and actually building our confidence with it. Um, so that's really important in terms of our well-being. And, and those areas as well of being able to understand, I mean, clothing is much more than just putting on some clothes. It really is about understanding the individual and, and what they actually want to do with that as well. Um, so that's, that's really important to build that confidence and to understand what they're actually doing as well. So it gets understanding what, how they want to portray themselves and what they actually want to do within it. So it's nice to actually get a jacket on for the first time in about four months. <laughs> so true. And I think exactly. And I think and you, you behave differently. You, you've got a different approach to it when you actually are in, in certain pieces of clothing um, and you feel you feel different. Um, and also you portray yourself differently as well. So I think that's that's really, really important. A place like Blenheim has made us have to grow up a little bit, hasn't it, Emma? So, uh, so tell us a bit more about the in Oxford that's um, that opened 
just just under a year ago. When did you open here? Been there since 2014. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, yes. mistake. My mistake. No, it's fine. Yes, yeah. So our boutique very much is obviously with ladies' fashion, um, and it's very much um, very creative pieces. They're unique pieces. We'll only actually buy one or two pieces per designer, per style. Um, so actually, they're very unique. And in terms of that, that's really working with our customers to actually understand again what works for them. Um, what looks right on them. I mean, obviously we can work, we can teach color and we can teach shape, but obviously it's also working with the customer and actually understanding what actually looks right and what looks right for where, the, what they want to, what they want to have that piece of clothing for. I mean, obviously we're slow fashion, they're investment pieces that we actually have. And therefore we want them to be in someone's wardrobe for a number of years for them to have memories of them and that you can actually use them in, in different ways. So, you know, along with it being a, you know, a fashion retail business, obviously with an online service as well, um, we offer a significant amount of, of support to customers in terms of the, uh, the way in which they actually maybe want to portray themselves, whether they're presenters or whether they are actually just in, in, in a social environment or in the workplace or wherever. Um, but we're also teaching them as well and also sort of educating them about, well, like, how do you choose color? How do you choose shape? So it's so important when you're making those investments into pieces that that's really important to do that because that's what we want to do is get the most out of it um, and enjoy it. And anybody um, just give us a bit of a plug for the, the boutique in Oxford, whereabouts are you? And in Little Clarendon Street, so 31 Little Clarendon Street, so we're out with Dan in Jericho. Um, they're in, in, in that really sort of creative and arts district, really, and it's fantastic. Obviously, being in Oxford as well, obviously, you can you meet so many different people, um, and obviously, you meet, therefore, you meet you know different approaches to fashion and different needs as well. From you know, people who may work at the university people who are actually maybe coming in and actually doing conferences, people who are just generally, you know, wanting to have, wanting to, wanting to go out for a social event or wanting to actually just, oh, I want something that's just a bit different. I've never tried that. Actually, I'd like to just try and, try and do that. And that's, that's what we're about in Oxford. Anybody interested in popping in? Are you taking appointments or what, how does it work? We are, yes. I mean, people can call in, but obviously if you want our um, undivided attention with um, our stylist, then yes, please. It's really important to book an appointment. And obviously you can do those online as well, just as we're doing. And sometimes that's quite, that's quite useful for people to actually just explore our collections virtually and then actually they can actually come into store um, in the present circumstances and obviously it's all closed off it's it's your space and that gives you the opportunity to sort of dress and play just like we did when we maybe when we were kids or something it's just an opportunity to do that where um, and you can really then explore and understand what the stylists are actually talking about in terms of shape and color and, and how things work and again understanding you know building that confidence when you feel good about yourself you're confident and you and you feel good. You feel you can tackle everything. I think it's important. It really is important, and it's so nice. I mean, again, as I say last week, you know, um, a colleague of mine was like, oh, "I just got a compliment on my blouse. I haven't had a compliment for anything." It was and it, and it does. It you know brightened her day. It was great. Thank you very much for joining us. So and just quickly, and so you're, you're just give us a bit of background on your your, your home. You're, you're based. Is it Hale? That's where the original boutique is. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you there. Where's the, where's your original boutique? You're based okay, in. Okay, well we have we have our Oxford boutique, which is obviously in the yeah, city of yeah. America. We also have Cheshire as well, which Cheshire. is our Cheshire showroom, and also our our web team also are in Cheshire as well. So obviously we support a lot online, and obviously at the moment, obviously. A lot of people are looking online, of course, as they're making their selection. So, yeah, we have, offer all of those services. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us, Anne, and uh, have a good rest of the day. And um, maybe we'll continue wearing, well, not dresses, but jackets and dresses. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a leaf out of your book. Great to see you. Okay. Take care. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Cheers, Anne. Okay, so we've we've got our next guest. Unfortunately, isn't able to join us. So I think we're going to go to a break for twenty odd minutes. Yeah. So we're just going to we'll rejoin you at. Huh, let's see. Twelve o'clock. Twelve twenty-five. I think that's our next. So if you want to go and grab grab a bite to eat or uh, stretch your legs, or maybe go and put a jacket or a dress on.
and please do. So would you join you soon? soon.
And welcome back, everybody. Uh, apologies for the unforeseen brief intermission, but hopefully uh, you managed to make the most of it. Um, so we're back here at Blenheim Palace in the Orangery. Hopefully you've enjoyed this morning's sessions. Um, we've got uh, a lot more coming up for you. Next, we have Nick Hughes uh, with over 25 years of senior sales experience across sectors as diverse as manufacturing, retail, industrial and commercial. Nick has experienced it all from transactional to strategic account relationship management, managing teams across both the UK and internationally with a record of delivering business growth. His own career started in sales, then progressed to directing high-performing sales teams for blue chip companies. Dynamic Coach was born out of the desire to help develop businesses achieve greater potential through their people being more effective in front of the client. Good afternoon, Nicholas. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thanks, Nick. So how's things been for you during lockdown? Obviously, you're a very happy Everton fan at the moment, I should imagine, at the moment, but that moving on swiftly... So, so revenue streams, they're, they're key to every business, oh. but what, oh, we need to hold. We've lost the feed already, sorry. Apologies, Nick. Oh, we didn't have your audio, apparently. Yeah, no, you are, I can hear you. I'm, just I'm not sure what, uh, what the outside world heard of what you were saying then, but if I just maybe jump in straight to the questions for you, Nick. So revenue streams are key to every business, but what well-being challenges exist in a revenue or sales team? Yeah, there's a couple of challenges, Richard, and that I'm seeing certainly over the last three to four months in particular. Um, Businesses set out in January with a business plan or a, or a sales plan, commercial plan. And if that hasn't changed by this stage in the year, it should not because of what's happened. But what I'm seeing on a regular basis is people want to continue that plan um, permanently. But actually, um, salespeople and clients are really, really struggling with the short term um, challenges around um, what's required for the business. And that's actually back flowing through, I see, into salespeople's mentality. Um, into their motivations and generally their well-being. And in reality, what we should be doing is focusing on short-term tasks, <coughs> excuse me, short-term sales opportunities and short-term KPIs. The longer-term gain is always there, but actually um, to help the salespeople engage more with the clients, we're looking for short-term wins. And actually that will support the sales team in their role, what their job is, um, and actually help their own well-being as well. So, how do you think men the sales team's mental health is affected in, in, in tough times like this? 
Well, salespeople are generally social and um, social animals. And what they need is clear and regular communication. But actually, the salespeople um, or generally salespeople build their their own um, finances around usually a basic salary and some sort of commission or bonus um, uh, offering. But actually, that then leads to fears. If they're not going to hit their budgets, uh, they've come under pressure from the business for hitting the budgets, but also put themselves into financial pressures as well because they're not earning uh, as well as, as often as they would like to. And I know that's relevant to uh, business as well, not making as much money, but actually their fears are about loss of earnings, loss of position or stature, uh, both internally and externally. And that, that really puts them under pressure at home, at work, and in other parts of their life as well. So actually, how can businesses help that? For me, it's about creating those small weekly fortnightly wins, um, really sort of um, uh, enjoying and celebrating those short successes and the longer term business opportunities of the next six to 12 months, who knows where we're going to be and what we're doing. So really to help your salespeople and those commercial people's um, state of mind at the moment, it's really about what is, what is coming up this week, next week, and maybe this month. And really as things are changing, I wouldn't see that evolving any, any further than that for the next probably six months or so. A lot of salespeople, I mean, I have to do it myself, you know, you have, having to find the right time to talk about selling um, with other people and all the challenges that they're facing in their business, it can be, it can be, it can be difficult in itself. Yeah, and they're, they're pre-programmed to, to, to go after business in that particular way if they're good at what they do. But actually, that then puts them under more pressure because the clients are not ready for some of these conversations yet. So I think maybe reshaping the conversation as a business and um, how you manage your sales team and their, your expectations of them, that needs to be communicated to them in such a way that, that your business is being supportive, you're supporting the clients, but also the wider business understands why maybe we're not, as, we're not hitting 100% of budget, we're only at 50, 60, 70%, but the sales guys are going out there and girls are doing as much as they possibly can. So it, it is a challenge, but actually that can play on um, insecurities within the sales team and insecurities then lead to challenges around um, mental health and their own well-being, not just in the business, but also at home as well. Plus everyone's having to deal with the other added pressures of uh, aging parents, uh, people having to shield, or maybe not so shield, but certainly um, isolated moments as well. So it does feed into this con constant pressure pot that salespeople find themselves in, and it can be quite draining for them as well. So break those KPIs down, break those targets down into a weekly opportunity, fortnightly or even monthly. But beyond that, my clients, we're not talking any, any longer than maybe six or eight weeks at the moment. Fantastic. Brilliant. Nick, do, do you have any questions for Nick at all on, the, on his topic of sales, Emma? Or is it... Um, no, um, I, I don't think we have a question. No, no we're, we're, we're good, I think, now. Nick, thanks, thanks very much for joining us, Nick. Really appreciate it. Good to see you looking so well. Good, guys. Thank you very much. Great day. Looking forward to the rest of the afternoon and every success. So you take care. See you later. Bye Cheers, bye. Nick. So up next, we've got Frank Negriello from Unipart Group. And if you don't know Frank already, I'm sure many of you already do, um, but Frank Negriello is a long-standing B4 member. He is Director of Corporate Affairs at Unipart Group and Chairman of Oxfordshire Business First. Frank is a strong advocate of responsible business and as such has been named His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales Ambassador for Responsible. I can hear you, Frank. Hi. I was just doing a spiel about you. I can't really hear you. You can't hear me? I can't hear you. Oh, I, you're very faint, but yeah, just about. Okay. Um, well, Frank, I was just introducing you, but I'm sure you'll be able to... Um, go, go straight into it now because um, you'll have a lot to cover no doubt in these 20 minutes um, you're talking about mindful change managing your mental health in the covid crisis is that right you're struggling to hear me aren't you i can't hear you at all so I, are you mic'd i've got to I've, I've, yeah I, i'm sorry that you can't hear me I'll, um can you hear me now okay uh, well i i was gonna have a, a little chat about mm -hmm the impact of COVID on people's mental health. And I thought I'd just talk through some slides and maybe um, do a little brief presentation about some of the things that we're doing in Unipart and some of the things that maybe 
folks in businesses might think about doing for their businesses and for themselves. That sounds great. I will hand over to you, then, Frank. I'm just going to hand over to you. Okay, so I'm going to try and share my slides. If I can find the right way to do that. Mm. Uh, where is the uh, screen? Okay. Right, well, hopefully you'll be seeing some slides now. Um, first of all, great, great to see both you, Emma, and Richard. And it's been going really well this morning, so well done. A um, few technical hitches, but I think we're all getting used to using what is ostensibly um, personalized broadcast technology. So it's really, really good. Um, just let me say, for most people, I guess, um, who are watching this, the, the idea of COVID and the impact COVID has had has really raised the stakes on the things they're thinking about in terms of health and staying safe. If, if your company is anything like mine, you'll probably already have taken lots of steps to implement things like social distancing and hand sanitizing and a whole range of things. And while we're kind of hyper aware of our physical health, and, and rightly so, it's really critically important at this time, sometimes we don't think about our mental well-being or what that's going to mean um, to people as, as they shelter as they try and keep safe. So let's be clear about um, what mental well-being really means. If you have a positive mental well-being, you're able to feel pretty confident with yourself and you've got good self-esteem, you can express a range of emotions, you can build good relationships with people and you know carry them on very well. Um, you can cope with the stresses of daily life, especially when it comes to change and uncertainty. And that last point is really critical because we're in a time of amazing amounts of change. Now today, uh, quite a few people are gonna be talking about mental health one way or another. And that's because it's a, a quite a big issue and it has been for a long time, but people have not really been talking about it. There's been a bit of a taboo. If you look at some of the data, I'm gonna try and pull some data together. Um, you can see that mental health issues have been on the rise in, in the past few years. In fact, uh, the reported cases are growing faster than physical health problems. In any particular year, something like one in six people are likely to be suffering from a mental health condition. And the pandemic really made that worse. You know, the, the pandemic brought on a fear of contagion and, and fear of your loved ones getting sick as well as yourself. And it's created huge uncertainty around almost every aspect of life. On the lockdown, isolation is also making people feel lonely and they have anxiety and depression. Quarantines and social distancing, which are absolutely essential to slow the spread of the virus. We got to do that stuff. But it restricts the very habits that make us human. Our social networks, the way we express emotion physically to each other, and you know, coming together in groups, all that has been stifled. And this is particularly true when we're talking about extended families. You know, talking to your friends and families over video calls or stuff like this, no matter how good the software gets, it's still pretty clunky at times. And it's a poor substitute for being there in person. So there's been a lot of research that's been looking at the impact of some of this stuff. And I'll just quote a few, few figures here. There was a study in the UK that found mental distress rose from 19% to over 27% in one month during UK lockdown. A, a, an organization called Psychiatry Research did a very large scale survey, something like 15,000 British people. And they found that 29% of those people who were surveyed met the criteria for having mental health issues. Another poll, found that 62% of people were finding it hard to be positive about the future. And there've been lots of other studies that reported you know, half, the, half the respondents were saying they felt anxiety or panic during lockdown. And one of the things that 
play to that was financial stress, which was a really big factor. It's not just the UK, you know, the US is, and other places are facing similar sort of issues. People are reacting the same way. This chart shows how the pandemic increased anxiety and depression with people in the US. In these cases, the numbers jumped by about three times, if not more. And that's quite significant in it. What has been a very short space of time. You know, just let me make a point to everybody here listening and all our business leaders. I think you know this, but these are all people who are getting affected emotionally and psychologically by the situation around them. And that's impacting how they feel. It's also impacting how they work, how they relate to others. And it's hardly unexpected when you see information like this that's shared in the media. It's kind of bad news every day. So, a bit quick. How are we prepared to deal with the mental health issues that our people have? How are we prepared to deal with the mental health issues that we have? You know, none of us are immune to the virus. And none of us are immune to those diseases that affect our mental health. And there's no vaccine for them either, by the way. It's all about recognizing the symptoms and trying to do some things to deal with that. Some simple things. This might be an ideal time for businesses to reset the way that they think about well being and to think not just about physical health and safety, but really about how they create that mental well being, that emotional safety belt for people so that people can perform at their best and be highly engaged. It's not surprising that people in the workplace are feeling uncomfortable. I mean, think about it. You turn up the place you've been working for years and you need to stay six feet apart from everybody else. You need to use different corridors with a one-way system. You're constantly cleaning your hands. You know, people are being asked to change the habits of a lifetime in just a few weeks or a few months. And they're being threatened by something that they can't see, they can't hear, they can't feel. In fact, this infection could just be coming from your best friend. And while all those habits have to be adapted in the workplace, we're also asking employees to take that thinking home and encourage their families to change the way they behave as well. And that's not the only set of behaviors that have crept into our home life. While it's been difficult for employees to feel safe if they're going to a site or going to a shop or working in, in a place of work, the pandemic may have had more of an impact on those people who are actually staying in their own homes. In fact, working from home, what my colleague calls it living from work, it, it's caused more significant problems, particularly mental health problems. The change from being socialized communities of colleagues to being isolated individuals all working alone has affected a lot of people emotionally. The chancellor last week put it really eloquently with this sort of statement. And he told us that while he was telling us he wasn't going to extend the furlough as well. But it shows he does care about how people feel. In a new survey, something like 80% of British people who've been working from home said they had a, it's had a negative impact on their mental health. And over a third of those felt anxious or stressed because they felt they couldn't walk away from their workstations. A quarter of them were finding it difficult to deal with loneliness and isolation. And in fact, there was some, something like a, a fifth of the people who said that working using video conferencing and tools like this became very stressful, not least of which because they were concerned about what they looked like when they're on camera. So Anne's points about having the right wardrobe, you know, do build confidence. Companies like Unipart recognize the importance of dealing with mental health issues long before the pandemic. In Unipart, my colleague and friend, Deborah Astles, had the vision several years ago to set up a well being program that we called Unipart Work Well. I'm really pleased to say that when she presented it to us at the board, my fellow directors and I were hugely enthusiastic to get behind this program. 
because we recognized that it was strategically important to the company. And that was a long time before we even knew the word COVID. Unipart WorkWell has provided a range of programs from training team leaders in recognizing mental health issues to promoting healthy eating, fitness, and healthy behaviors. In 2019, we ran a program that looked at the importance of sleep. And we gave employees a digital tool to use to evaluate their sleep and address any issues that, they might occur, that might occur by using online CBT. Each of our sites has got a well-being champion to support the accessibility of the well-being program, make sure people can find the things they need. And we've invested in, we've invested in some dedicated equipment to provide employees with uh, the numbers, if you like, on their sort of physical and mental health, how well they, their lifestyles impacted on how, how their bodies were changing. So they could measure their mental health and their physical health age. We also provide free, regular, confidential advice to employees that they can use to talk to someone about any topic related to well being. These are, they're not talking to people in Unipart, they're talking to some external experts. And that includes mental well being. And in fact, that includes financial well being, because as I said earlier, it can be a major cause of stress. We've now been in the last sort of three or four months providing a weekly online newsletter about well being. That gives people updates and timely articles and keeps people informed about how they can keep safe and also some of the things that they might be able to do during lockdown that might keep them in better shape, both mentally and physically. The COVID changes accelerated Unipot's commitment to well being, uh, particularly for people working from home. We recently surveyed all those people who are working from home. We have quite a few. And we wanted to know, were there any barriers, were there physical or emotional barriers that were getting in their way of doing their job or that were impacting the way they felt? As you can see some of the things on, on the slide, I'm really pleased Unipot people booked the trend and they kind of found working from home to be something that they could do. Although there were reservations and we put some things in place to be able to help them to be even more effective. So we published some extensive guidelines for managers and employees, which would give them a guide to making working from home more successful. We even have a little form on there where people can get the right equipment if they need it, if they don't have it today. That includes chairs, by the way. But you know, as chairman of Oxfordshire Business First, I know a lot of our members are not in large organizations like Unipart, and they don't have access to employee assistance programs. But there are a few things that business leaders can do, regardless of the size of the organization. There's no one size fits all when it comes to mental well being. But there are a few things you might be able to try in your company with your colleagues just to see if you can have an impact. For instance, good visible leadership brings people together. If leaders are focused on the mental well being of their people and themselves, and they're willing to talk about it with their colleagues, it's going to be helpful. Leading organizations are creating well-being policies to consider the impact of their business decisions, not just on what people will do, but on how people will feel. And they're finding that those policies are giving people a framework for understanding how to take personal responsibility for their mental health as well. Measurement and evaluation is really important. But you know, it's really hard to do when you're talking about mental health. In larger organizations like my own, we measure employee engagement formally, and we take pulse checks on how people are feeling on a regular basis. Now, if you're in a smaller organization, sometimes just getting people together for an honest, open discussion can be really, really valuable. And it might be helpful to bring in an outside facilitator who can help teams to open up and talk about issues. A priority should be bringing people together, regardless of whether they can be in a room or whether you can use tools like internet uh, products, like 
WhatsApp, for instance, which can get people just chatting and supporting each other and sharing ideas. Of course, you can get professional help, which would be a huge benefit and very cost effective at time. There are lots of talk therapy practitioners. They use tools like CBT and they can teach people to spot where real world situations are causing negative thoughts or fears or anxieties and they can give them the steps and the tools for dealing with them. Oxford NHS Foundation Trust has an adult mental health team that you can contact seven days a week from seven to nine. You can get help and advice and the numbers are on screen. You know, a great organization, very easy to talk to, and sometimes they can just point you in the right direction. Finally, companies, whether large or small, can join in networking activities with other organizations to share good practice, find out what other people are doing. B4 and lots of other networks can be instrumental in bringing companies together to talk about how to manage well-being. What we're doing today is really positive, and I hope people will take away some good ideas that they can use in their own organizations. So that's what we might do as companies, but it's really down to each one of us to take responsibility for our personal well-being. So how do you keep your own mental health in check, particularly if you're working from home? Well, at Business in Oxford this year, my colleague Plassey shared some of her personal steps to getting balance in her own mental health. She gave a brilliant presentation and it's online. I advise you to have a look at it. They were really good ideas and, and they really worked for her. Of course, if you have significant problems, there's no substitute for professional help and the use of tools like CBT. But before you have a problem, there are a few things you could do to just keep in shape. Now, you know, I'm no Joe Wicks, but here's a little mental workout you could do. I'm going to call it the uh, fast five fundamentals of well being. These could seem a little superficial at first, but you know, there's actually an evidence base behind these that suggests they really work and they're very simple. So you could use them every day. Let's look at a couple of them. First of all, do something you're good at. We all know that we get a little self esteem boost from small successes. If you're a good guitarist, if you paint, if you're a cyclist, if you're good at sports, whatever you do, practice it as much as you possibly can and do so in a way that makes you feel good about yourself and about what you're doing. Getting those little positive feel good moments are really, really important. Eat and drink well. That doesn't mean binge on McDonald's followed by a few pints, no matter how attractive that seems. That's not really eating and drinking well. How about regularly getting plenty of water, thinking about the nutrients you really need instead of just carbs and coffee? Keep in touch, call your friends, even those you haven't spoken to in a while, just touch base with them, reach out, meet work colleagues online, even if it's for a social chat. You know, some of my colleagues are developing a virtual coffee shop where you could just drop in to a video call without booking and see who's around for a chat. Sometimes you meet people you, you don't even know in your own organization. Take a break, take a walk. There's an old adage that a change is as good as a rest. Sometimes just stepping away from the screen and doing something else for 30 minutes can have a really significant effect on how you feel. And when you're away from work, don't take it with you, really try and switch off. You know, I know that's really hard and it's really hard for me, but being able to do that, even if it's just to walk into the other room and have a cup of coffee and sit down and have a chat with my wife, it just helps to break up the focus of the day and kind of reset the way you're thinking. And finally, ask for help. If you're feeling pressured, or even if you're just a bit down and there are a number of that there are things that are getting in your way, there are a number of organizations you can call or websites you could visit to get some guidance. Here's a few. Talkspace has more than 3,000 licensed therapists, many of whom specialize in treating depression. And that doesn't mean extreme depression. That can mean just feeling down. There's an organization called This Way Up, 
that'll offer you courses and free online tools to help you get through challenging times. I mentioned the NHS earlier. The NHS offers a 24 hour advice and support phone line. You can speak to a professional in your local NHS mental health service who could provide further support if you need it. There's a phone line on the screen. And finally, Oxfordshire Business First, my own organization, is working with a range of mental health agencies and charities in a new initiative. We're calling it Healthy Minds for Thriving Businesses. And it's gonna be focused on entrepreneurs. We'll be starting a web directory with resources in the next month or so, so watch this space. The pandemic took well-being out of the sphere of something that was nice to have or extra and made it a real strategic priority for business. In fact, for a lot of businesses, it made well-being a survival issue. And it changed mental health from a topic that was taboo, we never spoke about it, to a business risk that companies need to manage and that business leaders need to treat as a personal responsibility, both for their people and for themselves. Most business leaders today are making sure their people are safe, their workplaces are safe, and their businesses are safe from the virus. Well, in the same way, we need to take steps to make sure our mental well being and the mental well being of our people is safe. We talk about the terms reset and building back better. Well, a lot of that reset starts in our own minds. This is a really good time to stop and reconsider how we're protecting the mental health of those around us and our own. Hey, thanks so much for listening and please stay safe. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, we have run out of time for questions, unfortunately, but we really enjoyed your presentation. I hope you can hear us now. Frank, can you hear us? I, I can barely hear you. If you shout, maybe I can. Can you hear me now? I can, Richard, yeah. Excellent. Well, you'll always be my Joe Wicks, Frank, that's for sure. <laughs> and mine. <laughs> oh, you're too kind, guys. See you well, soon. Well, I've, I've got to make it up to you, Frank. <laughs> nice to see you. See you soon. No, thanks for your support, Frank. You take care. See you soon. Take care. Up next, we've got Helen Money from Helen Money Nutrition. Hi, Helen. Helen, can you hear us? I can now. Excellent. You've got uh, myself, Richard, and uh, we've got Emma with us as well. Hi. Hi. Are you having a good day? Yes, yes, it's excellent. Yeah, well, we're not quite well being out. We probably will be by about five o'clock. But uh, you're going to talk to us about the importance of, of good nutrition during uh, working days and, and, and non-working days, obviously. I, I am, yes. Um, oh, oh, are we, how would you like to do that? The question format or should I just go ahead? Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean yeah, we're just, we're just freewheel it, Helen. I mean, obviously, uh, we've known you for a long time as part of the B4 network and... You've been great in providing advice in normal times for uh, a healthy diet and, and, and good nutrition. And especially now, more than ever, people are needing to focus on, on a healthy diet and, and good nutrition. And lots of distractions. I mean, we got, we're surrounded by chocolates today, but uh, to keep the team going. But what's your, sort of your, your top advice, really, for people to stay uh, you know, in, in these really strange times to sort of stay at the top of their game? I think exactly as you, you said at the moment, um, uh, nutrition is very having a lot of focus because as, as we all know, what we eat affects absolutely everything, our, our general well-being, both long term and short term. And at the moment, um, with uh, obviously a virus, um, COVID, what we eat is really important. And what we've discovered in the last, what's been discovered in the last six months, while there was information out there before on what particular nutrients and foods are important for um, preventing viruses progressing in the body, what we didn't have six months ago was any um, hard research and evidence because COVID didn't exist, what was effective in COVID. And what's um, been pu being published over the last few months is we now know that nutritional status 
both um, the nutrients in our body and our weight does have um, a, a, an influence on um, viruses such as COVID, how they progress. Not whether we catch them or not, but how, how, how much they progress. And the nutrients particularly important um, that there's been a lot of research on are areas such as um, vitamin E, selenium, zinc and vitamin C, for example, those nutrients um, are essential from stopping a host, preventing a, a, a cell from hosting a virus. So it's important we get foods that um, are rich in those um, uh, nutrients in our diet. But where most people have probably seen a lot of the research being published on is actually vitamin D. And we have quite a lot of evidence now that vitamin D is very influential influential in the progression of COVID. So, um, and that's because of its, um, how it works with um, controlling inflammation in the body. So making sure we get these nutrients is important. I think generally, as you know, I like to practice very much through um, food first is um, getting everything that we need um, through our food, unless there's some um, medical reason or phobia that we, we can't do that. But with vitamin D, it does actually come down to supplementation. And certainly now we're in the winter months that we can't make vitamin D from the sun, it is essential that we're taking a supplement. Do you think people are being better working from home um, with their diet? Or do you think actually we might have got worse? I think it varies. And this is actually an area that I have been running some workshops on for companies. It's suddenly everyone's at home. And whereas many people were very much used to either having their lunch provided for them at work or there was a cafe nearby they could come and get it they suddenly had to start and breakfast as well for some people um they suddenly had to start being a bit more organized um i think the first few um weeks maybe the first month or so what we saw was um people eating like they were on holiday um and i think that was um twinned by stress levels that makes us crave more carbohydrate but also just like not being in routine, not going to work. Um, but what I've seen recently from my experience of people are starting to realize, you know what, this is the long term and we do need to start um, thinking about what we're eating at home and how we structure our food at home for the long term. And as I say, that a lot of that comes very much down to organization, knowing what you're going to have for lunch. So you've got some quick go-tos or having prepared your lunch the evening before, so you don't have to take a big break in the middle of the day. So if people want to work with you, what's the best way of, of finding out more about, about your nutrition courses and everything that you do? Probably through my website, helenmoneynutrition.com, um, or um, my phone number's on there, then give me a ring to talk to me about it, drop me an email, but you can, can contact me through my website. Um, I think I'll be doing that later. <laughs> well, she's well, well worth it. Helen's great, and uh, we worked with Helen for a long time. So, uh, thank you very much for joining us, Helen. Uh, looking, looking well, well and, and um, thank, you thank you for joining us again. again. Thank you. Take Have care. a good day. Cheers. Cheers. Thank, thank you, you, Helen. Okay, so next up we have uh, Sridhar Iyengar, who is the head of Europe at Zoho Corporation. Uh, Zoho is a cloud-based company which offers forty-five plus business apps to run every aspect of an organization. We use it as a business at B4 actually. It's been crucial to, um, to our sort of pivoting in this new era. Zoho's 9,000 plus employees globally have been working from home since early March. So Shridhar is talking to us today about how to achieve workplace well-being with a disparate workforce. So we thought Dom Hare had it hard with 400. So Shadar, 9,000 plus, that's, uh, I know that's global, but um, I think you certainly beat, beat Dominic on the numbers side. Hi, Hi Shadar, can you hear us? Hi. Hi. Um, yes, I can hear you. Thanks for having me over here. Great to see you. Well, we've got Emma with me as well, so say hello. Hi, hello. nice to meet you. Hello. Hi there, nice to meet you as well. So Emma's got the first question for you. Yeah, so I was wondering um, why is it, uh, why is it an employer's job to help help safe, safeguard the well-being of their of their workers? Okay, um, that's a great question. I think uh, very relevant in these times, and I think uh, it also comes back to what we think work is. Right, the work, the entire definition of work has changed over the last, I would say, centuries. In the, if we look at post-industrial age, so work has 
now become you know a significant part of everyone's lives right so most of our waking hours a lot of it is spent on work and the second thing is most businesses today are in people's business so people are very centric to any business so be it interacting with your customers supporting your customers being reaching out to customers being able to product put out the face of business right so two these two things work occupy a significant significant part of our lives people are centric to business and when i say people it's employees it's your own teams and that makes it critical for any employer to uh, value what the team is doing because that's the only way their uh, business can grow and in that sense they have to take some responsibility and ensure that their teams their employees are happy productive and in in a, in a way we have a saying in zoho that if you take care of your employees they will take care of your customers right so that's the way we look at it as well and that's true for any businesses and uh, if you want to do well take care of your employees and well being and take a holistic view of things right so when i say well being it's not just you take care of them when you, they're at the office it's basically holistic uh, well being so that means even out of the office try to make life easy for them so to give you an example you know some of the things that we do at soho is you know if they are coming to office we provide last mile you know transportation to the office from from the train station things like that or a cafeteria which makes it easy for them you know they don't have pack, have to pack lunch and things like that or go anywhere uh, daycare services if you are if you have small children so these things make life easy for your employees and that reflects on to their work their passion their loyalty so that's good for business so looking at employee well being is difficult enough job for you as an employer in normal circumstances let alone during the pandemic so so what additional challenges we're all aware of what the additional challenges are how have you coped at zoho during the pandemic right 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 well i would say that uh, yeah these are very strange times so it's all the more important in these stressful times so it basically comes down to three things that uh, we see uh, one is the tools uh, when i say tools it's tools that enable you to really work from anywhere the second is the culture that supports the tool the culture and the dna of your company and third is the leadership not in a specific order so let me take this one by one so if you look at it now in these times uh, tools have become very important to let anyone continue the work from from really anywhere right so these are this is essential medium that enables you to work from home work from office or wherever you may be and that's something that we've seen in all these lockdowns that that's basically happening across the world the continuity that enables the continuity of work and when it comes to tools this is something that's very close to our hearts because this is something that we build and offer to customers so these are you know we offer tools for working remotely to do your work remotely we offer our own tool sets to run all parts of your business sales marketing different parts and that enabled us to work from home fairly early on because for any company if you have to leave office you don't have to work from office the first challenge is how do you continue doing your work so tools are basically one crucial part of it that enables working from anywhere the second part is the tools by itself cannot exist in isolation without a supportive culture and when i say culture means it's the the work environment that you have in the company so culture based on trust uh, which empowers your employees so when you have people working from from home for example nobody is you shouldn't be timing them and clocking them saying you know when are they starting work it, so that's that culture of trust and also be sensitive to individuals need so you know we have seen so many people work from home and not everyone is is in the same position not everyone is equal not everyone is comfortable or has the means from working from home and uh, this is also because uh, you know we are all social beings so when you work from home for extended duration it can be very stressful for sometimes because you don't have that physical interaction that you have in the office so and that could result in some kind of a you know mental stress for some people so this is where the employer has to be sensitive to individuals need and uh, you know try to help your employees 
you know uh, cope up with it so it could be you know coping up in terms of uh, the helplines or forums where they can reach out to if they have a problem being able to provide some guidelines so that's basically the culture aspect of it the third important very important part is the leadership and i would say culture and leadership are interconnected without the right leadership you can't have the culture, right culture and that basically means that apart from that the direction that you set for the company and your teams and employees the constant communication is very important on what is it that you are going to do uh, how to deal with these times how do you operate because we've seen for example lockdowns are announced pretty suddenly and then you have to shift the way you work so that kind of communication is important as it is uh, listening to your employee so giving an example now digital tools enable you to have an open house a digital virtual open house that's something that we use a lot at soho so that gives you an opportunity to listen and then find in your direction and uh, adjust your new way of working an example of how using the right tools have improved employee well-being if you look at it why do you need to use the right kind of tools if you look at it so it basically it helps the employee be more productive get the job done without being you know unnecessarily stressed out they are more connected to their colleagues they are able to work flexibly they are able to continue work and it, and that itself getting getting your work done on time getting it done in a very in a, in a nice way it's, it gives them a sense of satisfaction which is what everyone wants from work right so and that's what these tools that are connected together that uh, zoho offers is able to is able to provide and it also gives your employees a, a kind of level playing ground to participate in your virtual workplace when i say virtual it's because people are logging in from anywhere and you know different people have different personalities in a physical room you may have a person who has a very dominant personality but virtually speaking if you are part of a virtual workplace everyone gets an opportunity to participate so that basically is you know the tools help you build this cohesive workforce and work productively Can these, these tools, tools be, be expensive or disruptive? And I'll answer the first part of that question. Is when we looked into Zoho, for example, and we were given a presentation, we 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 were amazed at how cost-effective a solution it was. But in in terms of disruptive, obviously that's potentially an issue as well. If you can overcome the expense uh, challenge. So uh, are they expensive or uh, disruptive? Well, it doesn't have to be. Uh, why i would say you know a lot of these also depends on the the situation of the organization the needs of a smaller organizations are different from the needs of a, a larger organization but i would say the the common idea to to get these to be successful is to take one part at a time do it incrementally and then uh, you know try out small experiments get your people trained your employees trained and then uh, if that works move on to the next area so do it one by one so zoho offers a lot of these tools which are also well integrated and that takes a lot of pain away from your day to day work because it's not like you're dealing with 10 tools for this i have to go here and for the second one i have to go here it's all integrated so it gives you ability to seamlessly go from one application to another but in general the way to do it is when you introduce tools you have to make sure your people understand how to use it that's very crucial and that's that's universal can you give some examples of any best practice that you have seen or experienced yourself during this time sure sure so um, i would say that when it comes to remote working uh, we basically we we basically enhance some of our own remote working tools such as remote meeting remote digital workplace we've seen we've done some recent uh, announcement with you know which is supporting this virtual workplace as well so this is basically what we have seen is people can really work from anywhere using these tools and the key is it has to be seamlessly working so if you're working if you are a sales person working with a customer you still need to collaborate with your internal stakeholders employees so unless your tools are connected because you have different tools for talking to customers different for internal collaboration unless they work together uh it's not effective you can't do your job effectively so these are that's the nature of the tools 
Uh, I'll also say there's some of the best practices when it comes to remote working. What we've seen is, um, you know, from I'll give you an example from Soho's perspective. Uh, we know that everyone is in a very difficult situation with the, with the pandemic. It's not just a health crisis, but there's also an underlying economic crisis, right? So, so what, what we decided is, you know, what's important at this point is to help the community and the customers around us, and in addition to the employees. So that's why we launched some, uh, let's call it the, we launched some programs to help our customers. So one of them was subscription relief where customers can continue to use our product during these difficult times. They don't have to pay us till they get back to some sense of normalcy uh, from an economic standpoint. Uh, we also released some apps uh, which helped our businesses get back to work. So we released a back to work uh, app that uh, that basically deals with employee well-being, safety. Uh, we also had a, a kitchen uh, that served our own employees for lunch and dinner and everything. We turned that into a community kitchen to serve some of the underprivileged people who were struggling during these times. Uh, the last thing that you know uh, we also tried out, which was like an experiment started a year back, is uh, what we've al always felt is to offer great products, build these products, and to engage customers, location doesn't matter. So around a year or so back, we started experimenting, setting up offices in rural areas, uh, especially in India. This is where we tried, but we're doing similar experiments in the US as well. Set up offices in rural areas where we could actually, you know, and you could do work from there because technologies such as cloud and you know broadband is able to help you do that. And what we realized is opportunity in that local area. It creates basically prosperity powered by these cloud technologies. And that could be a greater purpose behind uh, all these technology and you know, uh, that we work with. And uh, to enable that, you also have to have the culture, which is a very decentralized culture we have at Soho, to enable that. And that's good for you know, everything, employees. It's good for the society, the environment because you are not congesting large cities if you move to rural area. So these are some things that we tried out and we were surprisingly, we found it that it worked well. And what sort of, as in operations, uh, do you feel employees have to take into consideration, um, sorry, considerations to take into consideration, considerations to take mind of um, to ensure employee uh, well-being? Right. So. I already talked about some of the things that you have to take in you know, consideration. One is, of course, remote work could be very stressful. So always, always watch out for you know how your teams are doing, basically, and and do it in a not in a centralized way. You have to you know delegate that responsibility at a team level where you know any individual is very comfortable with the teams that they work with. It's not some central team sitting somewhere else. So. They have to be in touch with uh, employees at, at a team level to ensure that everyone is doing okay. Pay attention to uh, stress levels in the team. Sometimes even ask your team members to switch off if that's required, things like that. The second thing is not everyone is geared up to uh, work from home. So some form of financial assistance to help your employees set up a, uh, some kind of a home office. Uh, this is going to be very helpful for people. And third is always keep the channels open. And, and sorry, the last question. Oh, was, go, no, I was just going to ask. So, whereabouts are you today, Shredder? Where, where are we talking to you from? I'm based in the Holland. Oh, okay. Okay. But uh, we have large teams across the world. So, we have offices in 14 locations. Very recently, we opened up six rural uh, offices in, in remote villages in India. Yeah. And we are now, in fact, our CEO is based from there. And we are all able to connect, talk as though. Really, I mean, the location doesn't matter anymore. It's become like that. Yeah. So, and in terms of moving forward, I mean, what's your largest sort of office cluster and how many do you have, or did you have in that, in your largest office? Our largest office is in our um, global headquarters in Chennai, in the southern part of India. We had close to uh, 8,000 people there. And when the decision to uh, go remote as a result, so when we were, because since we have offices everywhere, we were closely watching the news on 
how coronavirus is uh, affecting different regions. And although we could see spread in different parts of the world, such as uh, China and Europe early on, and that's where we decided in, I think it was the first week of March, that it is safer to work from home. Mm -hmm. So it took us probably uh, three days for us to, from the point of making the decision to uh, really uh, implementing it. And that was possible because of the tools. Also the culture, because we've always been distributed. We have people from all over. So we had the setup, that is the tools and the culture part to help us work remotely. And uh, that was very interesting. Uh, we didn't think it was, I mean, you never know unless you try it, right? So but that was uh, very important. And the second thing was, uh, you know, going based on how things are going. In fact, in the Netherlands, the government just announced, uh, I would say, like a forcible work from home as far as you can do. So we are all back to, we, we were going to the office a couple of days a week, but now we are all back at home, working from home. And uh, you have to be prepared for this kind of uncertainty. That's, that's for sure. And, um, you know, that's something we understand that as far as we've got all the setup to help us do that. I think that's fine. So it's going to be, I think, a mix of home plus office. Uh, it's going to be hybrid. It's not, never going to be one or the other, even I would say when things come back to normal. But uh, these are new times. Uh, sometimes old habits are hard to break. But you know, any business, any company, any organization wants to work in the new way, they have to embrace change. And a lot of that is in our minds. It's, it's interesting you make the point about how, how quickly you pivoted as a business. Um, one of our next guests coming up um, in Husband, who's the uh, leader of the county council here, I said, you know, I asked Ian, how long, if you were told this, this pandemic was coming in five, ten years' time, how long would it have taken you as an organisation to, to shift your business to remote working? And he said, you know, it would have months, months. Yeah, maybe a year. And I, and I asked the same question to you. you, you it took you three days, but had you been given notice, how long would it have taken you? That's a tough, that's a tough question. Because... Uh, you say four days. <laughs> <laughs> four days today. I would say a lot of these technologies... So if you see what has enabled this, there's obviously the, the broadband and the cloud that allows you to work from anywhere. So that's the key part. So I would say the technology part of it wasn't there to let you work seamlessly from anywhere. And that's that's a big difference. It's also, I think, the, the mindset of everyone that to be flexible. I think the cloud has also changed the mindset that you can work from anywhere. Although people didn't work as prevalently from home before this, of course, there were certain people who worked a lot from home, but this has kind of moved the masses to home working. And that's the big shift. And, but a lot of it is also a mental reboot, right? So nobody would have done this left to themselves. And the pandemic has really forced the hand for a lot of people and companies. And it's trust that, issue as well, isn't it? Maybe that was an obstacle for lots of employers that they could actually trust their staff to work effectively. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they've probably been surprised at how productive their teams have been uh, in, in, in recent months. In fact, that's been, a, a, I would say, um, a refreshing change in attitude that, you know, earlier people were not sure if their, their teams, their employees would be productive, would be engaged. And now they see it, uh, you know, they see it that they are. And some of them think that working from home is more productive. And a lot of companies have announced that they will continue to do so for the rest of the year or partial next year. Some have even offered their employees to, if you wanted to work from home permanently, you have the flexibility to do that. But the pandemic has taught us two main things, the technology and the digital infrastructure to work from really anywhere exist. But at the end of the day, we're all social animals, social creatures. We are not meant to work in isolation. So you need some form of social interaction. And that's why this, even our rural, rural initiative of small offices, hubs where people can go get together in small groups just to get some interaction. Uh, that, that's basically part of the, you know, the, the social, building the social fabric. Uh, that's very important. So we're not meant to work in isolation, that's for sure, even though the technology can help you do that. So it has to be a mix of both. I think I might have stolen 
Emma's thunder on the last <laughs> question. But I was just going to say, and finally, um, if you could pick one thing that has most surprised you about your business, what would you what would you pick? About? I'm sorry. Can you please repeat that? Sorry. Um, if you had to pick one thing about your business that potentially surprised you during this time, what would you pick? Okay, what would be about uh, our business? Okay, I would say the um, one is actually the in in these difficult times, right? In pandemic, what we have seen is it's kind of brought out the humanness in not just us, but in a lot of people, in our customers, our competitors, in the world in general, right? So you can see that people are trying to. You know, it's not about businesses just maximizing their profit, which is what generally they tend to do, but it is also putting, you know, other people, it could be their customers ahead of, you know, business priorities, helping them out and helping them out in a variety of ways. And that's been a refreshing change to see, see it happen, uh, you know, yeah. Fantastic, Fantastic. Brilliant. brilliant. Should I really, Should I really appreciate, appreciate you joining, joining us today in your busy schedule, so. Hopefully one day we'll get to meet in the flesh, but for now, thank you very much uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. And, and thank you for Zoho. Take care. Brilliant. Well, um, next up we have Kelly Peters from Data Basics. Uh, data Basics are a people-focused data consultancy using their expertise in data collection and data protection to help organizations improve efficiency and decision-making. Kelly Peters, are you with us? Indeed. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you very much. How are you? Yeah, good yeah, stuff. Yeah, we're, we're good, good, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good, Kelly. And we got, got to Emma here with me today. today. Hi, nice to meet you. Hello. So, so how's, how's, how's lockdown been for the Uh It's been not too bad. We've been um, busy supporting clients with um, requests from staff on the types of data they're being uh, collected uh, breaches unfortunately because people are now working from home uh, and maybe not following their processes as best as they can be but yeah so we've been fortunate to be busy for our clients unfortunate situations so I can't complain. It's about data basics data protection rapid response or DDPRR yeah yeah <laughs> the variation of GDPR yeah. <laughs> so the, the rapid response is really to be able to provide companies with um, that quick access to an expert where they have a question about staff asking for data that they want to know what they're using. So, for an example, um, a member of staff has got mental health issues. A lot of information has been collected on them. They've now said, I want to know what else you hold on me. Typically, an employer will get really panicked at that moment in time and they'll want to speak to someone that they can get some practical advice. And that's what the rapid response is meant to be there for. Um, or, sadly, if they breach data protection and they lose that sensitive information, again, they want to be able to phone someone to say, what do we do? And that's what our rapid response service is there for. popular. It has been. So we uh, launched it two weeks ago, primarily because we had a lot of people wanting to phone a friend and just having that quick question. So they don't want a full service at the moment. They just want answers to quick questions um, that they can't find on the Internet. So you, you talk about businesses maybe getting a bit lazy in terms of um, data protection. Do you think there's a lot of good work that was done pre-lockdown that was lost and now need to get back in? Uh, in focus again yeah i mean i think for me the lockdown companies had to move really rapidly to get their staff up and running to work remotely they also had to introduce new systems and ways of working and i think because of those news of what new ways of working has just caused some additional data protection challenges like the rise of zoom for example or um video conference calls uh, people sharing information over a video call because they think that's okay without necessarily thinking well does my business allow me to share this pre-covid and the answer is probably not um, so I think that whilst businesses have been incredibly resilient in addressing working from home and new systems they might not have assessed 
their data protection risks and they may not have communicated them clearly with their staff, therefore their staff are then causing unfortunate problems. And unwittingly sometimes, you know, churches of family, um, letters in the background, all sorts of things that are, people are think are, are quite innocent to have there, but uh, people are feeding off that. Yeah, or the fact that if you and your spouse or your partner or your roommate are sharing the same space and both having video calls, you may inadvertently be overhearing or recording a conversation from your uh, partner or friend's conversation on your chat, and you've possibly never even considered that uh, before, or you get some really entertaining uh, people walking behind you uh, whilst you're on a, a video. So the joys of working from home. Sort of level of fraudsters and scammers that's just gone through the roof now i should imagine lots of i think that's really played on staff's kind of vulnerability because whereas they've been in the past around an office and said oh i've received a really dodgy email what do you think and um, they don't have that so there were a lot of covid um emails going around about click here for advice and support um, and they were typically a phishing scam which then opened up the individual and the company to quite a lot of um, distress. So people have definitely, people have definitely profited um, off this. And I think pe because people are working in isolation, they don't have that look over their shoulder and ask their work colleague, what do you think in this instance? They just unfortunately open that. So um, I don't think that's going away either. It's just a case of being more vigilant, I suppose. Kelly, I appreciate it. So if anybody's interested in your services, um, I presume you have the website that we can direct everybody to? So, absolutely. People can go to dbxuk.com um, slash rapid response. They'll get the full details of the new service offering. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kelly. Kelly. Really appreciate you joining, joining us and uh, take care of yourself. Thank you. So, next up. Next up, we've got Councillor Ian Hudspeth, who is the leader of Oxfordshire County Council, and he's going to be joining us in studio, I think. Yeah, I think we've got Ian here. Ian, there, we... there he is. Good to see you. All right, you want to take a seat there? Do you want to move mics or...? How are you? Good. Very good. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, no problem. Just a short walk or yeah, exactly. bike? <coughs> Joe. Joe. <coughs> I was going to do it, but no, it's, it's been a bit wet. So the seasons have changed. Yeah. We've been sat here today. Yeah, so, no, so. And this is Emma. Hi, Emma. Yeah, you can just see where the Bladen Church is just over there. Ah, that's, that's where you come from. Yeah, that's so, it. Yeah, it's, so bit, it's a bit more than a, a, a brisk walk. Yeah, it's, it's, it's about 25 minutes, 20, 20 minutes. So it's nice. It's, uh, it's good. And of course, this is one of my parishes. Yeah. With Blenheim, you know. We would think you're a leader of the county council, but actually, you're a councillor first and foremost. Mm -hmm. So how's it going today? Good. Yeah, we're we're getting lots of um, good information from from our speakers, and mm -hmm. we've had Dom in, we've had Megan in um, yeah. from HR, and yeah, learning all about you know office of the future, um, sporting aspects, nutrition, well-being strategies, well-being strategies, yeah. all sorts of things. So hopefully, we're helping get the word out there. So yeah. how, how's things been for you? You look well, obviously, but I just imagine you've had. More than your fair share of challenges over the last six Yes, yeah, it's, uh, well, the thing is, it's, you know, for us, it's sort of, we never stopped. Mm. I mean, that's the, the, the basic thing is we just continued and this was added to business as usual. So it's been really uh, a challenging time and, uh, you know, the staff have just been working flat out. And of course, that's one of the key things that we've got to look at from a health and wellbeing point of view. Yeah, and when you joined us for, um, for bio back in June, which seems like mm. about five years ago now, um, I'll just put the questions as should are there um, that I put to you about how you quickly pivoted and I think your response to that particular question is had you been given five, ten years notice on this, it'll probably take you best part of a year to, oh. with all the toing and froing and no we can't and yes we can and it, even, possibly even longer than that because I think that, you know, the amazing thing is that within ten days we'd switched from being an office based uh, organisation to working remotely and you know, all credit to the IT staff, all credit to people who are just embracing it and actually really taking hold of it and uh, moving that switch. Whether, how we'd have switched, given the um, vagrancies of local government and what needs to be done is always a challenge, but I just can't thank the staff enough for the way they've reacted, such a positive, and I'm sure it's a lot of other companies as well have been doing similar things in that sort of changeover. 
And, um, but of course the thing, as I say, is that we're still doing business as usual. So it wasn't a case of close down business and then restart it. It was a case of let's carry on. It's a bit like sort of uh, driving on the outside lane of the motorway while you're trying to change the engine. I mean, it really has been that sort of integral because we deliver uh, you know, basic provision to people who are on real personal care. And uh, you know, one thing that always, I don't know why, springs back to mind because it actually is quite socially isolated. But um, we were still gritting the roads at the start of the pandemic. You know, it's, and as I say, it's socially isolated because it's one person driving around. But you know, that's the sort of thing we were doing and still doing. Um, and of course the thing is, it's how long does this go on for? And that's the really important thing about health and wellbeing, that uh, we're used to sort of uh, working in emergency situations, whether it be flooding or snow or uh, a major incident, and everybody sort of gets down and really works hard, and uh, working directives are probably put to one side during that, that period of time. But then how long can that be sustained for? And I think the difficulty was at the beginning, no one's sure how long this is going to go on for and what, what it means when people take breaks. And it's so important that people take breaks, particularly now with the um, remote working and Teams and Zoom and all the other facilities. Um, because meetings tend to go, you switch from one screen to another. Mm. And you can't do that. You've got to say, five minutes, have a get, walk around, do something just to make sure you keep the health and well-being going because that's so, so important. Otherwise, you can be sitting in front of a screen from 7.30 till, I think the longest day I've had was, a, I started at 7.30 in the morning with my first meeting and it was uh, quarter to 11 in the evening when I finally yeah. got away and it was pretty much back-to-back -back meetings throughout because everybody sort of says, you're there. <laughs> you, you don't realise it. I mean, Frank, who was on earlier, Frank, you know Frank from yeah. the Uni Park, he was saying his wife tapped him on the shoulder and said, Frank, you've been sat for 14 hours. Yeah. He didn't, didn't appreciate it. No. So. And that's, that's the thing. And so it's really important for people to take that time out mm. to really sort of look after their own health and well-being. Um, because working with computer screens, you're very focused on it and uh, you, you're, you're intense. And you've got to make sure you just take a breather, get up. I, had a meeting uh, the other week with um, uh, Samuel Gray, who's very much into health and well-being. And you know, one of the th key things he said to me was, make sure that you're always having d these breaks just to take in and make sure that you're not st sat at the screen all day, which is so, so important. Are you proud of how communities have come together in the local area? And do you think we're gonna have to do more to keep some of those initiatives going? Phenomenally proud. I mean, uh, speaking as my division, as the local councillor, uh, every village has had a community hub where people have got in touch and they're organising sort of prescription deliveries, shielding deliveries, all those sort of basic things. And it really shows that on the ground, that's where people know the knowledge because a local council knows what's going on with Mrs. Smith or Hilda or Joe or whatever, and can contact them immediately. Whereas sometimes uh, any sort of council in a larger area is a bit too remote. So it's really important that those communities have come together. It's fantastic. And we've got to somehow embrace those communities. And how do we retain that value? Because it'd be such a shame if we lost the, the community spirit, the values. Um, it was helped by, of course, a lot of people were off work, furloughed, and the working from home, so they were able to commit time to it, but uh, it's been, the response has been phenomenal, and you know, it's everybody just pulling together, and I suspect as we move into the winter, we're going to have to see another version of that, unfortunately, coming forward as well, where we really do uh, come together, and, uh, but it's not just about supporting each other, it's about actually making sure we don't spread the virus as well. Mm. I've certainly found that, that aspect of the community has definitely helped my own well-being during this time. Yes, it's. Uh, I mean, otherwise people can feel very isolated, and I think the key thing about it is that sometimes in small villages it's easier because there's more sense of a community, whereas in sort of more densely packed urban areas, 
then it's very difficult to sort of go out and see who your neighbour is because somebody entering a block might be one of several residents and so you don't know who it is. And particularly people who are living by themselves in sort of one bedroom or bed set apartments, you know, that's where the health and wellbeing really comes in because you can work in uh, remotely if you have your own space but an awful lot of people have been having to share space with the kitchen table, with the dining room table, with the kids working from home. But if you're sitting sort of with your laptop in a bed sit, that must be really challenging and really difficult. So we, as employers, we should be supporting and asking people, are they able to be functioning correctly? Do they need to come into a building? And sometimes uh, people you know, may need to come into a building to actually sort of have that experience and not be sitting, uh, propping the laptop up on a, with a few books, which we all do, don't we? I mean, what sort of key, um, I mean, is it 7,000 staff that you have? It, it's 3,500 actual three and staff. Half. Okay. Um, if you include the teaching staff as well, then it sort of goes up, but it's 3,500. Um, and it's been fantastic. They've, you know, as I say, within 10 days, transformed it. Um, but there are some people who do have to work uh, with clients. Uh, there's other people who, for a variety of reasons, aren't able to work from home. We've taken that into consideration and uh, made sure that uh, they've got the right facilities. And that's the other key thing, going back to sort of sitting on with your laptop on the edge of a bed propped up with some books. That's not very good for you. You, know, you need the proper equipment. Mm -hmm and we have been working with all staff to make sure they have the appropriate commitment uh, co uh, equipment but uh, it's about three and a half thousand people have all moved out we were starting to sort of come back towards office working uh, for october and some people will uh, but we've got to be very careful who's going to come back to work where they're going to work and what's needed around them as well quite a task managing all that i should imagine it is, and again, you know, the big thing is we're still delivering that job. It's, uh, you know, like every other organisation, I'm not saying there's any, any different, but we're still having to do all that work that everybody uh, goes on. I mean, one thing is, for instance, our library staff, because our libraries were closed, and they're now reopening, um, but all our library staff, we relocated them to other areas of the council to help out on uh, people with blue badges, because still blue badges needed to be done all those sort of things, so we redeployed across the council, so we didn't furlough anybody. Uh, I think that's important uh, to make sure that as a local government organisation, we weren't sort of uh, furloughing people, we are actually looking after our staff and treating them. And as we move into this next phase of going back into offices, what does it mean? It's uh, a reduction, we can have about 10 to 20% of the staff that we previously had. Uh, what, what's the impact going to be on property? What's the impact going to be on the face-to-face -face values? But that's an, actually, that's an interesting thing saying face-to-face -face because uh, one of our key areas is children's social care. And actually we've got better engagement with young people now because that's the platform they use. They used to. WhatsApp, they're used to Facebook, and you know, it's perhaps uh, people like me that uh, struggle with that, but for young people, that's their most, so they don't find it strange. And I think that's, you know, the adapting, and I think that if we went back to the way we were, it would be a major, major mistake. And I think that all businesses evolve, and this is an opportunity for business to really, our business to evolve and see what's new, um, perhaps, move away from directorate-based areas and actually be looking at council, because I think for the vast majority of people, they just want the council. They're, they're not interested in the different departments mm. or the different councils. They just want a response from the council. So I think that's one of the areas we've got to be really clear with to make sure that we rebuild in the new way, not the old way. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and people do look at you for just clicking your fingers and solving problems left, right and centre. <laughs> and I'm sure that's increased tenfold in the last yeah, six yeah, months. Yeah. You say you're, you're business as usual, but got all these other challenges and everybody expects you to have the answers. So I'm yeah, sure you have it. your uh, sympathy with central government as well. Oh, absolutely, because it's, 
we have to provide the best for everybody, which obviously you can't please everybody all the time. So you've got to compromise on certain things and uh, in a sense people being at home furloughed has given them the opportunity to sit down and have that time and space to think about that project that um, we've been meaning to do for ages and this is the solution to it. And We can understand that we've got the solution but of course it boils down, is that the best for the area? Have we got the funding for it? Because I mean, the funding that um, has cost, we spent about an extra 51 million pounds so far on uh, COVID measures. Uh, the government has been very good and we've had 35 million pounds uh, returned to us uh, by government funding, but it still leaves a shortfall. Uh, the government have said they'll be continuing to look, and it's not just Oxford County Council, it's all councils across the country. So how that funding is going to be come back to us, because of course, at this stage, we're normally planning next year's budget, but if we haven't finalised this year's budget, it's really difficult. So there's a lot of challenges yeah. for us as we move into the winter, the planning, what does it mean uh, on the budget, and will there be what the second wave will look like in Oxfordshire, will it be isolated, will it happen at all? So there are a lot of pressures there and the planning just continues all the time. It's, it's like that sort of continuation yeah. snowball muck round and moaning. Yeah. With such a range of staff, have you what kind of things have you done to help with employee well being? Well I think the first thing is listen. I mean it's it's the number one thing you can do. Listen to your staff and try to understand what their issues are. Uh, for the more frontline staff, it's the fact that uh, they've got to work in this new system and they want to have, have what, everything around them. They need the, everything around them and the support. Because again, if you're going out to visit people and then you come back, normally you come back to an office situation and whilst client confidentiality is always there, you can sort of download sort of feelings talking to other people. Whereas, that, uh, whereas when you go back from your bedroom to your lounge, there's not that chance to sort of unload and just have a, have a chat. So that's one aspect of it. There is the collaboration. And I think my talking to staff, the collaboration is really becoming so, uh, not an issue, but it's, they want to be able to just sit down and throw a few ideas around. And working remotely, it's not as easy to throw those ideas around, so how can we facilitate that in a COVID friendly way, um, we encourage people to sort of, you know, staff team members, if, if they were normally going out on a Friday night or whatever for a, a, a quiz, yes, carry on that sort of thing, but again, it's always, so it's always, the key is listening to people, there's not, again, there's not one thing that fits everybody across the system, and if somebody does have an issue for whatever reason that they're finding it difficult to work at home then what can we do to facilitate them to be able to work better from home or as i say work in an office in a covid uh, friendly way safe way it must have been very difficult for you to adapt to all of the different covid covid um, secure changes that have happened well, i think i like, yeah, any organization or business uh, it is difficult for that to, for the adapting to understand exactly what it means, and sometimes, uh, you know, for instance, the PPA personal uh, protection equipment regulations changed quite rapidly at the start, and so uh, what you were saying in the morning sometimes well, this is a change in the afternoon. So how did you keep up with that? And keeping up is always important, but uh, we try where possible to you know keep up to date with the latest regulations always be looking at that, making sure that we are complying with the regulations, but all organisations are the same. I think one of the biggest challenges for us and all organisations is how do we have face-to-face -face meetings in a COVID secure way and what protection do we need to put in place, what, uh, how do we change everything because it's, it's going to change the way we all operate for the next six to twelve months and we need to make sure we do have that so we are able to operate uh, in a safe way. And moving forward, I'm talking about 
residents and the workforce and getting everybody back to work and giving people the confidence to get back to work. Obviously, we've heard about you know, the difference between working at home and working back in the office. Some offices just aren't geared up for mm. taking people back on board, but where an office can accept staff, um, they might have to rely on public transport, so yeah. ha having sort of that confidence to get back on a bus or on a train, etc. So what sort of role can you play in, in helping give um, the workforce the confidence to step back on a bus? I mean, you obviously had the massive congestion issues before lockdown, which have sort of evaporated overnight, mm. but um, there's still some transport dilemmas there. The, the transport's a massive issue because um, actually car journeys in, in and around Oxford are sort of between about 80 to 90 percent of what they were pre COVID. So they're sort of getting back to levels, and we'll, you know, we may very well see congestion occurring again. But actually, the park and rides are operating about 10 percent of the capacity, yeah. public transport about 20 percent of the capacity. So you can see there's an awful lot of capacity there, and how do we? work with the companies so that people are say it feels safe on, on on the bus obviously it's important to wear a mask uh, but then when you're actually on a bus uh, if you're in a, your family bubble you can sit next to each other so obviously from a bus company's point of view sort of having zigzag seating isn't appropriate all the time um, and even standing at the bus stop because if you look at bus stops there's a lot of bus stops are even on fairly wide pavements, it's people passing by. So all these things have to be taken into account. How do you make people feel safe, making sure that uh, they are able to get back onto public transport? I know the bus companies are working really hard with additional cleaning of the vehicles so people can feel secure. Um, just locally here, a uh, Sunday service was, was introduced uh, about a month ago and getting on the, the bus, it, it was the driver has the protection of the perspex. You've got to wear your glass. Contactless payment, that's so important uh, to make sure that we're not sort of passing on like that. And being sensible about it. As much as anything, it's what can we do as individuals as opposed to what can organisations do? The bus companies are working really hard to encourage people back on uh, because obviously what we don't want to do is return to a situation of gridlock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there any things that you're going to be doing moving forward that you've learned during this time? I said, well, I mean, remote working, and uh, you know, it's got to be the one, and for councillors in particular, it's you know, it's, it's absolutely incredible because we're having, and also parish councils. I mean, you know, mm. it's sort of big support. Uh, shout out to parish councils because they've adapted as well. It's uh, we all think of sort of the vicar of Dibley sort of parish councils, but they have adapted. They're all Zoom meetings. Um, so we're not going to go back to that, um, which it, on climate change agenda and carbon, you know, that's so important because if you're a councillor living in Henley, driving into the centre or in catching a train into the centre of Oxford is a really major thing. So having remote meetings is good. Um, so I think that's the key thing. And it's about being adaptable. I mean, flexibility and adaptability is so key to all these things, just to make sure that everybody can w operate in a different manner. So I wouldn't say there's one particular thing no. that's... Uh, what was it like the first time you did that, that Zoom or um, Teams meeting together? <laughs> well, I'd like to have been there. <laughs> Uh, which one? That, that's the question. I, I, I think the interesting thing for me is the fact we had the technology already, and I mean, that's exactly. just something... It's bizarre, isn't it? You know, it's, we're all reluctant to use it. it it's, nobody, it's not as if we sort of had to go out and buy it. It was yeah. there on our yeah. systems. But, you know, if we said, oh, we'll have a Zoom meeting, what's that? So, you know, of course, there's the inevitable, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wish I had a penny for every time something. But, you know, there's that. And uh, people getting used to it. The big difficulty for councils is actually voting, believe it or not, because... Um, in, in the chamber, obviously, you can put your hands up or you can signal, and you can do that. But if you're online, there's that, do we go through a roll call? Do we put our hands up on chat? Or what happens if someone drops out? So that's actually the biggest challenge we have um, for council meetings. But it was, it was quite interesting. And some of uh, our more senior members, should I say, uh, it was a, we had, had some interest, but I'm sure everybody's had it. I mean, can't, not just local government that have had their issues. 
Did people find it difficult the first time they put the camera on as well? Did you have some people it took a while before they decided to do that? put the camera on? What, <laughs> do you have a background or do you know, or what do you you know the people who just forgot that now they're showing not themselves but actually behind them as well? It's uh, that was quite interesting and inevitably you get the dog or the child interrupting. It's uh, so it's all. It's, it, it, I'm sure everybody else had the same sort of issues but uh, yeah the technology it, and I think it's that's the big thing for me that what we can't do is go back to the way we were we've made that quantum leap so we've got to really do it and we've got to have more uh, virtual meetings not just with councillors and officers but with actual residents as well so that get better efficiency uh, out of it however I think a lot of people are looking forward to face-to-face -face meetings because, I mean, this is much more enjoyable than that. The last time was fantastic, uh, but, uh, you know, just having this ability... I'm used to seeing you like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's it. Having that ability just to talk to each other, it's, uh, it, it's how we act as humans, and I think that interaction for everybody will be great when we get back to the new normal. Well, we've heard that a lot today. We're all social animals, aren't we? We, yeah. we crave this interaction, so... Um, yeah, the more we can do things like this, the, the better. But uh, if you've got one big hope, I know obviously you know, we all hope we can, there's a vaccine on the horizon somewhere, but uh, what's your big hope for, for the County of Oxfordshire over the next six months? Well, over the next six months, that we actually rebuild and recover and restart the economy because the economy is so vital, and that is about businesses being able to operate successfully. Uh, the sort of ending of the furlough scheme is going to create it. I know there's a new announcement but you know could create a tipping point for businesses but people have got to be adaptable they've got to retrain it's a bit like some of our librarians had to retrain to be customer service operators or to be marshals at a recycling center just and that adaptability because if you just remain as you are you're never going to sort of progress we've got to learn from what uh, what's best in out of the uh, pandemic and make sure that we build that economy because we've got a strong Oxfordshire economy then UK PLC will be strong and actually we've got an awful lot of um, funding to make up for in the future. Brilliant, but well, I really appreciate you joining us. Okay, Enjoy thank your you. out the door, straight head for the church. Okay, cheers, <laughs> good to see you. Good to see bye you bye. too, you take cheers. care. Bye. Cheers. Yeah. Right, so next up we have, who have we got next? Emma. Oh, that's my headphones. So we've got Ruth next, uh, Ruth Sharon from Broad Broadman, Hawkins and Osborne LLP. Let's see. Ruth, are you there? Cheers. I think we're just waiting for Ruth to join. Hello, hi there. Can you hear me okay? We can, Ruth. Yes, we can definitely hear me yeah. So, um... Oh, I see you now. We've we got one technical... Uh, no, 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 you just get the video. Ruth, Ruth is this is specialising in domestic, domestic violence, violence and sexual assault, assault. At Baldwin Hawkins and Osborne LLP. Ruth, good afternoon. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm really well, thank you. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to come and talk about what I think is such an important subject. Brilliant, fantastic. Well, you're going to be talking to us about identifying and dealing with, with domestic violence in the workplace. That's right. I think one thing might be useful is to start off with looking at the, the scale of the problem. Before we had the pandemic, it's reported that one in four women in the population suffer from one form of domestic abuse or another. So already it was huge. And of course, that's all been exacerbated by the pandemic and lockdown and women and children being locked down with their abusers. And in fact, I'm just talking to an A&E doctor who works locally, and he was saying that cases coming into A&E increased by nine times over this period. So it's all around us. It is going to be in our workplaces. This is not a poor problem or a working class problem. It is no respecter of boundaries. So we're gonna have it all over the place. 
And I think really just to, if I can, you know, blow the horn of raising awareness about what a big issue this is. When you talk about that, that increase in numbers, I mean, that's, that's huge. And uh, uh, Do you see that rising or do you think? I think it's levelling off slightly, but you see what used to be the case is that work was often a safe place for people to be in. It was a place where they could express themselves, be out of scrutiny. And of course, they're losing that opportunity now. And, you know, the water cooler moments, you know what I mean by the water cooler moments? The, yeah, we earlier with, with Dom, yeah, it's, they've all gone. Yeah, we, just those comments that were made that you could catch somebody's eye or something like that, those have gone. And don't forget, when we're talking about domestic abuse, we are rarely talking that you're going to spot it by a black eye or a physical injury. Perpetrators are very clever. They'll either cause injury where it cannot be seen or otherwise it's a case of coercive control and all that kind of thing that doesn't necessarily involve violence. So how do we spot that when we're not seeing people face to face and we're not seeing any injuries? So I would be looking out as employers for things that are a bit different, for things that are not said as much as the things that are said. Is there a lack of availability amongst your clients? I mean, amongst your employers? Are they withdrawing a bit? Has their productivity gone down? You know, we so often think productivity goes down. We'll go to a critical view. But what if it's because of something that's going on at home? And just being less available generally. So how do we create those water cooler moments remotely? And I would be really encouraging employees and colleagues to be touching base with their staff and their colleagues on a regular basis and ask the next question. Ask the additional question and try and just be really alert to anything that um, is being given away or is, is, is by the absence, you know, that you can just know that this person has changed a bit from how you saw them last time. Obviously in, in a one-to-one -one environment, not, um, not with, with colleagues, obviously. Exactly. And I think that you just touched on something there that's really important, which is, I mean, I come from this from a professional point of view, but I have learned over 20 years experience in this work, the shame that women feel when they've suffered from domestic violence. They feel it's their fault. They're made to feel it's their fault. So there is such a reluctance to say anything, not just because they're afraid of the repercussions, but because of the shame. So I think you're quite right. Any conversation should be in a one-to-one -one, or if you create a buddy situation, you know, buddy groups or things like that, where, and, and make it very, very clear that it is confidential. And I would say another thing is that um, people, they, they've lost control, so much control when they've had domestic violence happen to them. And it's giving them back control, not telling them what to do, but giving options and signposting. I often think that, that knowledge is power. And when people are told what they could do if they want to do it, that is such a, a lead in to, to moving forwards and getting the help. Have you found that more men are coming forward with a, a similar issue, that they feel more able to, to talk to someone if they're experiencing the same kind of issues? Yes, I think I understand what you're saying. And um, I think it's harder for men. You know, as hard as it is for women to come forwards, and I, and I do use the word women most of the time, because I have to say, in my experience, 99 out of 100 times, it, it, it is a woman, but it's not exclusive to women. Absolutely, it's not exclusive to women. And I think for men to come forward, we talked about the shame that a woman feels. I think that's even more exacerbated by the shame that a man feels because of society's stereotypes around this issue. It might sound a strange thing to ask, but obviously we're talking about domestic violence and uh, sexual abuse, etc. But for some, I'm sure going back to working from home was a was, was a welcome change for them to escape those particular challenges in, in the workplace. Yes, yes, that's true. But the difference is, is that you're not locked in the workplace. Of course, but uh, it still can be traumatic, like you know, a kid going to school that gets bullied every day. It's, you, know, you don't find out about it necessarily until it's too late sometimes. But uh... This is not just a COVID lockdown issue. This is something that I think we as a society 
need to be aware of all the time. You know, if you think that figure of one in four women or one in four people, you know, have, have, have suffered, that's people around us. I don't know how many people are in the room with you. I can only see the two of you. But it's like it's, it's, two it's a big production. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's 10 in the room. room. There's 10 in the room. Okay. Yeah. Well, statistically, probably two people in that room will have suffered some form of domestic abuse. And yet we so rarely talk about them. I mean, we're way ahead of where we were when I started 20 years ago, but we're really not far enough on yet. But I'm glad to say that there are helplines, there, are, there is help available. And um, I can certainly signpost people to, to help. And there's also solicitors like our own that are um, very, very happy to help in, in confidence situations like this. And very often there's legal aid as well, so that people don't have to pay for the legal costs involved, because there are all kinds of remedies that can be provided through the court system, either through the police or the family law system. But even if somebody doesn't want to go down that route, there's all kinds of support services that are specially tailor made for these kinds of issues. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ruth. And if anybody needs to get in contact with BHO, your web address is? We would be delighted to help. Our whole team is committed to this kind of, kind of work and any, any inquiry would be dealt with very sensitively. I'm so grateful that you've given me the opportunity to share today. And I wish you the rest of the afternoon. Thank okay. you. Can you just share your web address with us quickly? Sorry? Your web address. My... Um, BHOs. BHO's web address is not on the top of my mind. Oh, I'm oh, really sorry. sorry. I can give you my email address. I've recently joined them, so I haven't learned all these things off by heart. We'll post it out. Don't worry, Ruth. We'll post it out. But look, great, great to see you. See you. And we'll no. catch up with you soon. Thanks, Ruth. Pleasure. Bye-bye. So next up, we've got Jackie Jarvis from The Walking Business Coach. And Hi, Jackie, Jackie Jarvis. So you want to give a little bit of an intro? So Jackie's a practicing walking business coach, co-founder of Natural Networking and passionate long distance hiker. Jackie Jarvis has experienced firsthand the value and benefits that walking can create in business and life. Jackie helps business owners and professionals use walking and talking as a transformational tool to stimulate business development and greater well-being. Hi, can you hear us okay, Jackie? Hello, yes I can. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a plug here, uh, Jackie. In, in, your, in your inspiring talk, Walk and Grow Rich, Jackie will share the insights she gained from her experience walking over 3,000 kilometres on the famous Camino Way pilgrimages and their application in business and life. So, how, Jackie, we did a ride together from Edinburgh to, uh, to here, to Blenheim Palace, what, four years ago, five years ago? Yeah, we and, did. That's and that right, took four Richard. days. So how long did this take? My Camino way. Well, I've walked over three thousand miles over the last five five years. I walk a different oh, pilgrimage every go, year. Yeah. <laughs> it's not quite all in one go, no, Richard. That's right. So you, you've got a few uh, slides to share with us. Talk ready, and uh, so as soon as you give me the nod, I will I will start. Over to you. Over to me. Okay. So hello, everybody, and uh, thanks very much for joining me uh, this afternoon for my talk. And as Richard did a great introduction there, um, I'm going to be sharing with you some of my Camino experiences, my Camino hiking adventure. And as I do that, I'm gonna be sharing with you some of the insights that I gained from it. And as I speak, I want you to have the opportunity to reflect. And maybe there are some very important messages in my talk that are just right for you right now. So we've all had to deal with an awful lot of change um, since March um, this year, and there's more to come. And it may be that you're, you're just kind of feeling tired, I know I am. But back in 2015, I was actually feeling tired then, and we didn't actually have a pandemic to deal with. And um, I was basically tired, tired of my endless to-do lists. I don't know if you have a similar feeling. I was tired of all the pushing for endless new business. Um, I was tired of a project that I was actually running with two business partners at the time and we weren't seeing eye to eye on it. 
I was basically exhausted. And the worst thing about it was that I was starting to lose the, the excitement and the passion that I had for what I did um, in business myself. I don't know whether you've ever felt like that, but that was quite frightening because without that, I felt like I didn't have anything. And I think what was actually happening to me was that I was actually reaching that point of burnout. I wasn't sleeping so well. I was, I was worrying too much about the future and I wasn't really living in the present moment. I basically knew that something big needed to change, but at that point, I wasn't actually sure what it was that needed to change. But I don't know about you, whether or not you believe in synchronicity, but I just had that thought about something needing to change. And I was out in my local town in Wallingford, uh, just walking through the, the square, and I bumped into an old colleague, and the old colleague was named Tim. And Tim is somebody that I'd known in business before. And two years hence, he had looked like I felt. Um, he was exhausted, um, trying to build his business. He was looking after two elderly parents. Um, he'd just been through a divorce and the stress was actually piling higher and higher on his shoulders. And um, I spoke to him in the, in the square and he looked actually completely and utterly different. He had a, an energy about him, he's excited, you know, he, he looked almost like he'd fallen in love. And I asked him, Tim, what happened to you? You've changed completely. And he told me that he had just come back from walking something called the Camino de Santiago de Compostela. And he'd walked 500 miles and he looked amazing and he sounded amazing. And so I wanted to find out a little bit about it. So he recommended that I watched a film called The Way, which I promptly went off and did. And that made my decision at that point in 2015, I was going to walk the Camino way and make a change in my life. The thing about walking the Camino is that you have to take everything that you need on your back. So I had to pack something like this full of everything that I needed for the journey. So typical me at the time, I was feeling overloaded. So I typically completely and utterly overloaded my rucksack. I filled it with everything I probably didn't need, including even a plastic water, water, water bucket I remember packing in there. And the thing weighed a ridiculous amount. I think I tried to carry about 14 kilos, including my water, on my back. And I actually ended up looking a bit like this. In fact, it was exactly like that. So what I didn't realize was that I was actually walking um, up to 25 uh, kilometers every day, carrying that 14 kilo pack. And what happened to me, I don't know if it's ever happened to you like this, where you think you're gonna go away for a break and uh, you're gonna be able to leave everything behind. But all I'd done is actually I was a mirror or a reflection of the me that was exhausted and overloaded back in the UK. I was carrying too much, uh, my back ached, my legs ached, um, everything ached, my brain ached from overthinking too much. As I walked in such beautiful surroundings, I wasn't even paying attention to them. I didn't even notice where I was. So I started to get really frustrated with myself. I'd taken this time out and all I'd done was recreate something that I was experiencing back in the UK. And in that moment of frustration, when I realized exactly what I'd done, I actually took that rucksack off my back and threw it to the floor, realizing that I just couldn't deal with it. I just couldn't deal with it anymore. And just at that moment in time, I turned my eyes just up into the trees and I actually saw a light shining in the trees. My rucksack was lying on the ground at the time and I just took a breath and just took a moment, just a moment of silence. And just at that moment, I don't know what came into my mind, but I just asked for help. I just thought, I need help. I just can't seem to let go myself. I need help. What shall I do? And just in that moment, I heard a voice. I don't know whether that voice was inside my head or whether it was coming from the outside. But the voice was gentle. It wasn't like the normal a uh, hard voice that I hear inside my head telling me what I should and shouldn't do. It was a gentle voice. And the voice said, I remember this message um, all the time, I reflect on it all the time, it's so, so powerful. And the message was, have the courage to let go of that which no longer serves you. And I'll repeat it because it was so powerful. Have the courage 
to let go of that which no longer serves you. And just in that moment, I reflected on that message. What did it mean? I looked down at my heavy rucksack on the ground and I realized what I needed to do. I needed to start with offloading some of the excess that I was carrying on my back. So that's what I did. I started taking out of the rucksack all the things that weren't absolutely essential. And what happened, I was then able to travel much more lightly. So I called that voice, my voice of slow. And once I was able to travel more lightly, I could walk forward with a purpose. I could actually see where I was going. Um, I could take steps forward easily. I could enjoy my surroundings. And it was amazing. It was an amazing feeling to feel so much lighter. And of course that had an effect on what was going on inside my head. I started to feel much freer and I was able to reflect on that message much more and think about some of the things that I might need to let go of when I came back to the UK. So in business, I think we all carry an awful lot on our shoulders. I don't know whether, you know, as I'm saying these things, you're thinking about yourself in business and how much of a load you carry. And sometimes what we do is we don't let go of the things that um, we should let go of. Um, we take on too much. We say yes to too much. We think about the past. We think about the future. And we don't let go. We carry it thinking that we've got broad shoulders and we can do it. And all that does is actually block our path, our path to feeling much lighter and moving much more freely through our business life and in life in general. So why not think about that message yourself? Have the courage to let go of that which no longer serves you in your business and in your life. And metaphorically speaking, if you had a rucksack on your shoulders, what would you really like to take out of it? So moving on, as I walked the Camino route, um, I used to walk where well, there was many, many different miles, many miles every day and across many different terrains. So you would walk um, along plains, up mountains, through villages, um, through farms and even cities. And every day, the same thing, walk, eat, sleep, repeat. And the amazing thing though about being out in nature um, is that you actually start to feel much more relaxed. Um, science and research are telling us that um, being out in nature and walking is so very good for your well-being emotionally, spiritually and physically. Um, you're breathing in that rich, rich oxygen, um, you're feeling good, you're moving your body, um, there's blood pumping around your body and going to your brain, you feel so much freer. And just that simple act of putting one foot in front of the other out in nature can have an incredible impact on you. I started to feel a lot more relaxed as I let go of all the thoughts that were wearing around in my head. Um, and being out in nature also enables you to feel much more connected with the others that are sharing that journey. And on the Camino routes, you did meet people um, on the route. I, a lot of the Camino walking on my own, but um, you know, you came across lots of different people on the way. And I always thought that the people you came across with, usually there was a reason for um, making a connection with them. Maybe they had some kind of important message for you. Um, and on this particular day, I bumped into a lady called Alice. And I always remember Alice because uh, she was walking very slowly uh, with two sticks and a rucksack um, just a little way ahead. And I, as I was watching her, I thought to myself, I don't know how she's going to make this. I don't know how she's going to make the journey, the distance. So I stopped and had a quick chat with her and found out a little bit about her purpose for, for making the journey and what her plans were. And as I left uh, speaking to her, I kind of thought inside my head, I'm probably not gonna see her again. She's walking way too slow. Now that was interesting because funnily enough, I bumped into her many times. Um, she always seemed to be at the same place that I was staying at, going to bed early. She seemed to be coming out of churches just as I was passing by, having visited one. She was often seen sitting under a tree, eating some nuts. 
And I wondered to myself, how is she doing this? Because she seemed to walk so slowly. So one day I had another conversation with her and what she said to me um, had a real impact. She said, Jackie, I plan my day by listening to my body. So when my body says I can't go any further, I stop and take a break. Um, I've come on this journey to enjoy it. So I do make sure that I stop in the little churches on my, on my way. And the other thing she said is, it's not a race, you know, this whole thing, it's about the experience. So I take my time, I allow myself to take my time. And the most important thing is that I look after my feet because on the Camino, you're walking on your feet all day. And if you get blisters, it stops you in your tracks. So we had that discussion and I reflected a bit on that and thought about my own business life back in the UK and how little I was metaphorically speaking, looking after my feet. I probably had a lot of blisters in my mind and also my body, metaphorically speaking, because I wasn't taking enough breaks. I wasn't setting boundaries around myself. I wasn't really looking after myself in the way that I needed. And if you reflect on that message yourself at the moment, you know, there's lots of change, there's lots of pressure, probably more than ever before. Are you looking after yourself? Are you looking after your feet, metaphorically speaking, in business and also in your life? Are you setting boundaries around yourself and giving yourself a chance to recover from the stress and pressure that you're putting yourself under? It was such an important message and I think that was another one from what I call my voice of slow, to really look after your feet, metaphorically speaking. So as I carried on, I've, I said earlier that I've done a number of Caminos. I found them so beneficial, these pilgrimages every year, that I take one every year. And last year I went on a route called the Camino Primitivo, which is um, uh, in northern Spain. And you walk from, um, uh, gosh, I've even forgotten where I walked from. <laughs> Sorry about that. To, um, from Oviedo, actually, all the way to uh, Santiago. And the route is about 350 kilometers. So it took me two weeks to do this particular route. And the picture that I'm showing you um, in this uh, talk is actually quite significant. It's a, a mountain that I climbed on one of the days on the route way. And there was the lure of something called the Hospitalis route, which is, um, was, a, was a famous part of that route. And apparently there was an amazing view at the top. Now I'd arrived at the bottom of the mountain and uh, I was planning on climbing it the next day. Obviously with my light pack, it was going to be a lot easier, but fog threatened on that particular day. And what happened was we were all deciding as a group of us in the hut um, at the bottom of the mountain, deciding whether it was actually safe to go. I wanted to go, there was a few other people wanted to go, so I thought, well, what can go wrong here? Um, you know, we, we can just, you know, there's yellow arrows to follow, follow, it's going to be fine, it's going to be fine. Anyway, I set off um, on the route, and on each Camino route, you follow yellow signs, and I could just about see some of these signs um, just in the mist. And I started off okay, but then very quickly lost sight of the group that I was walking with. And I was left with just one other person and we were pretty lost to be honest on the mountain. Um, at first it was funny because we couldn't find our way. But um, as we went, went on, we were getting a bit worried that we wouldn't be able to get to the top and maybe we should go back. And we both talked about it and we just said to each other, we want to do this, we need to trust in the path. And that was an important message. We decided to just put our trust in the path and put our trust in the decision that we'd made to climb that mountain. So we took very small steps up that mountain and eventually we got to the top. It was very foggy and quite frightening and a pretty difficult uh, route. But having got to the top, you can see, I don't look my best, <laughs> but um, it was an amazing experience because just as I got to the top, the clouds parted and it was almost as if um, you'd reached the sort of highest point of the universe. Um, there was just, it was just an amazing feeling. The energy was amazing. Uh, There's a, a real sense of um, happiness and fulfillment and contentment of being in that place. And myself and the, the guy Don that I was with, we really took it all in and, and just felt so grateful to actually be there that we'd made it up the top of the mountain. So we really took it in 
and, uh, and we're really proud of, of making it all the way to the top and experiencing such an amazing view and an amazing experience. And I think there was a lesson in that, um, and I call it thrive, not just survive. Um, and it is about, um, in business quite often, I'm a, as a business coach, um, I talk to lots of business owners about uh, achieving goals and achieving their, uh, their vision. And sometimes I think what happens is you can achieve a goal, you get to the top, you make that journey, sometimes it's foggy and you can't see the way, but you get to that very top of the mountain but you don't give your yourself a chance to take it all in and take in the experience. What you do is you just walk on and take the next mountain on without ever reflecting on what you've achieved. So maybe you've been uh, struggling on through the fog um, for the last few months um, with not knowing quite what direction you're gonna have to go in and not necessarily seeing, seeing all those yellow arrows. And maybe you've had to take much smaller steps than you would have normally, but you've got somewhere and that somewhere might be amazing. Um, it might be something that you've achieved that really you're proud of and your team are proud of. So why not celebrate that and be grateful that you actually got to the top and you're able to see the view. And I think gratitude is also a message that came through loud and clear from the Camino experiences that I have had. The boots that you see in front of you are my, my walking boots and I've actually walked in those for probably 2,000 kilometres I think mm. at least um, and I've never actually had a blister so um, I always say thank you to those boots um, all the time, uh, thank you for getting me to the destination, thank you for keeping my, my feet safe and actually that's an important message too because so many people in life help us on our journey and uh, so many people contribute to where we find ourselves today. And I think uh, saying thank you to those people that support and help you and to the things that help you as well. And it might be something as simple as your walking boots. So that's really an important message that I have to share from, again, my voice of slow. Jackie, we're... Um... So, we're just about out of time, I'm afraid. So yes, I'm just about to wind you, you, up. You're actually, just about there. So I don't want to interrupt your walking boot flow, but you, you, that's all right. I'm just about to stop. Thirty seconds. That'd be great. So um, just to to wind up uh, my talk, the the important messages from the voice of slow: um, have the courage to let go of that which no longer serves you. Um, look after your feet, metaphorically speaking. Thrive, but not survive just think about being grateful and say thank you to all those people that support you in your business, helping you to climb those mountains and achieve those goals. So thank you very much. Jackie, really appreciate it. Sorry I had to cut you short there, but uh, thanks for your time and uh, we hopefully uh, we'll see you soon. Hey, thanks Richard. Thanks for having me. Pleasure, take care. So next up we've got Ellie Dimmock from Special Effect. Are you there, Ellie? Hi. So, Special Effect is a charity for gamers, uh, and Ellie is the events coordinator and has considerable experience working in charities and organising events. Hiya. Hi, Ellie. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Brilliant. So, can you tell us a bit more about one special challenge that you've been doing over this period? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we've been inviting companies and individuals over the course of September and October to participate in one special challenge, which is tying in with our one special day, which is this Friday. So everyone can take part in one special challenge. They will get a medal at the end of it and it is free to take part in. You just devise your own physical challenge so you can do it as teams or as individuals. You can choose what kind of exercise that might be. So we've had all sorts of things. It could be walking, it could be running, could be cycling, anything you want really. And you choose your distance and how long you want to take do it over. So whether it's over a day or whether it's by the end of October. So there's been a couple of companies doing taking part that are doing a set distance. So something like 262 miles that they will complete as a team. So they'll each do a certain distance 
uh, Richard was also doing a hit uh, challenge oh, in right. September. Natalie, please, please. I failed. That's amazing though. I'm, I'm sorry. 17 out of 30 is not good enough, I'm afraid. But that's one example. You could do some hit challenges and um, We've got somebody else, a uh, Hutch company called Hutch, go, doing a Grand Prix. So they are trying to complete 307 kilometers as a part of a company by the end of October. So it's free to enter and it should be lots of fun. So if you're looking for some a well-being boost over October, this could be something that you might be interested in doing. Just give a bit of a plug for special effects. I mean, a number of people watching will, will have experienced a special effect, but uh, you can't fault what all of you guys are doing um, for your passion and energy that you give to everything that you do and such a nice bunch of people to deal with. Um, an absolute pleasure to, to raise funds for you. I know we did so during bio. Uh, we tried in September but failed, but we'll, we'll, we'll have another go. But I, I strongly recommend, even if, just go onto the website and have a look at the, the, the regular news items that you're posting. Um, if you want some well-being in your workforce, um, you couldn't go much further wrong than, than appoint uh, special effects as, as a, as a well-deserving cause and, and great people to deal with. So um, it's been a great pleasure to deal with you and great to have you on today and, and good luck for Friday. So what's your hopes for, for out of, uh, coming out of Friday? Sorry, what was that? What are your hopes coming out of Friday? Well, we've got a lot happening. So there's also streams, gaming streams happening all over the weekend as well. So as a team, we're all going to be super busy. Um, and as I say, the one special challenge, which is tying in with it, is happening right up until the end of October. So it's going to be quite a busy month for us. So yeah, it's going to be great. I keep seeing these social media tweets, tweets about, about the Ninja, Ninja. Um, donations. Could you shed a bit of light on that? Because there's been some astronomical figures banded, banded around. around. Could we give some clarification on that? I'm not quite sure which one that one is. That wasn't to do with the Fall Guys then. Uh, it was, no, it was it was talking big numbers in terms of donations. Of one is, is it the Ninja guy that was looking? To... A lot of support from Ninja. He's fantastic. That's not quite falls within what I do, so I'm not quite so familiar. Uh. Okay. Which one that is, I'm afraid, sorry. No, no worries, no worries. Has there been any challenges that you thought, oh, I'd like to see more of those types of challenges that people are coming up with? Um, we've had all sorts of things. Uh, we've had some crazy ones, which I, I don't know how people do it, like lifting crazy amounts of weights over the course of a month and things. Um, I quite like the biking challenges, so I I'm quite like cycling, so I'm keen particularly when we're back in the office and doing things to have more bike challenges that take place. So we have had companies looking at doing sort of distances over in the Alps and places like that. So a real challenge in terms of uh, height gain as well. Um, so that that would be great seeing lots of more biking challenges. Um, I think running and walking is particularly easy, particularly given the circumstances at the moment. It's really nice that you can just get out from your own house and do stuff like that. It's a win-win really for businesses because they can not only get the feel-good factor for taking part in an event like this, but they can um, also improve in well-being by, by doing something that's a bit different from, from sitting at home. Yeah, it's also been a great way to perhaps um, connect as a team as well. We've certainly found that, so quite a few of um, the staff at Special Effect took part in our 10K in July as well. So it's a great way to be able to connect and talk to people about what you're doing. Um, so it's that both that mental and physical well-being boost, really. And uh, just to round, round off, off Ellie, Ellie Twin, Twin Town, Town, that's been rescheduled to next May, is that right? Yes, fingers crossed. It's going to be a, a, a bit of a plug because I'm not sure where you're up to. I know Brendan and, and the guys uh, do a fantastic job getting support, but uh, obviously it's been a bit stop start having had to postpone this year. But hopefully, all guns blazing for May. Yes, so it will be um, hopefully, I think it's the first bank holiday weekend in May. Um, people will be with their cars making their way over to France, and there'll be lots of activities. Hopefully all the ones that we have planned for this year will be taking place next year. So I, I think it's still in the process of being sort of planned out at the moment. And given the current circumstances is a little bit tricky, but fingers crossed it's all going to go ahead and be fantastic and lots of fun. So uh, do check out our website if anyone's interested in that. Um, there's lots more details on there. Brilliant. Well, wish you well for Friday. Great to see you.
and uh, we'll do the 30 day challenge another month but this time we'll finish it I can, I can promise you oh Christ, Christ I promise now live on, on air but, uh, there we go brilliant to see you Ali take care thank you bye 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 so next up we've got Jonna Mundy from UHR Consultancy and I think she's on the line now hi Jonna Jonna can you hear us can you hear me? We can hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. Good to see you. And you. So, with the country in recession and the makings of a second lockdown looming, John will be going through what business leaders need to be focusing on right now to nurture their own well-being and that of their most important asset, their people. So, over to you, John. Thank you. I will just attempt to... Uh share screen so you're over at Hanbury. is that right i am over at Hanbury. i will explain uh, why i'm over at Hanbury in just a moment you don't have to explain where you are john i was just being detected <laughs> i saw that office for about five minutes and recognize where you were okay can everyone see the screen okay we can do yeah brilliant okay so first and foremost thank you good afternoon everyone um and a biggest thank you to Richard. It's a pleasure to, to join this first uh, B41 event. Um, and I will just um, explain right now, we've had um, a power cut in Chelsea as we often do in our village. So it was an impromptu switch to the office. I'm glad I've managed to get set up okay. I think you don't uh, struck a voodoo curse on us now, uh, Jonna. <laughs> but we also we don't need to go down and power, I can assure you. We, need, we also have building work going on at home, so the dogs actually come into the office as well, and the slightest <laughs> noise outside, so if you hear barking, don't be alarmed. Uh, um, what a but great also, uh, for a well-being tool. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's like, what else can challenge me for, um, before I do a well-being talk? Well, you look fantastic, don't you, despite all those oh, challenges. You're too kind. You're too kind, Charlie. Maybe I should explain <laughs> to everyone whilst I call you that. Oh, dear. Um, so yeah, and a massive thank you to everyone for, for joining us um, today. Um, as, as Richard has explained, um, you know, we take great pride in, in going through and sharing our experience um, in wellbeing, um, not just from running a small business uh, for the last decade and all the challenges that, that come with that, but also we've got probably over 50 years, I'd say, combined experience of working within the health sector across the team. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be able to, to share some of our experiences in the wellbeing arena um, and just fulfill our desire to, to share that synergy with people that care about their most important asset, as Richard said, their people. Um, it is our strap line, as you can see on the slide there, it's all about the people. Um, and I just want to make sure that I'm touching on um, the, the continuous tracking of, of wellbeing that we're undertaking right now in, in UHR. Um, so we've I guess, you know, dare I say, mention it first off to the, the, the pandemic and then also the country going into recession. We've really been looking quite closely at what is well-being needed um, uh, right now, what, what is needed in, in that arena for, for businesses with all the challenges that we are facing. Um, so hopefully what I'm about to, to go through will be fitting for whatever circumstance you're, you're experiencing right now. Um, particularly if you, you have employees that, that you have an obligation to, to look after. Um, but even if, you know, we've got sole traders on, on the call, um, whatever the experience might be that you're going through. Um, so what do we need to, to, to focus on right now? So just to, I guess, put into context some of the, the, the research that we've been looking at. Um, so you'll see over on the right um, a, a survey that was conducted by a CIPD with um, a, a collaboration that they do and have done for a number of years now with Simply Health. Um, so that was a survey undertaken this year. And the latest stats from, from the Office of, of National Statistics um, as of 20th of, of September. So our environments are constantly changing. Um, work and home life, uh, you know, continues to, to need to be adjusted um, to whatever greater or lesser extent that, that may be for us. Um, and as distancing um, becomes kind of part of the norm, um, now that we all need to, to contend with trying to get to grips with our daily routines and, and the latest announcements that might come from number 10, you know, what do we need to deal with um, 
today, tomorrow, um, months ahead, possibly even, you know, the, the aftermath of, of the pandemic is going to go on for, for years at least, um, you know, for, for some sectors. So trying to find the ways that we can nurture well-being as part of daily life and, and recharge our resilience is, is definitely something that I was keen to try and home in on a, a, a bit more um, to prepare as best um, for, for what might become like a, um, you know, the, the odd electricity um, failure that you might get in your local village and realise you've got no power, no phones either. So it was a real challenge. Um, so as we're dealing with the unprecedented change that, that we've ever experienced before, um, and the overlay, as I mentioned, of, of the recession, um, you're seeing reports from, example, the Institute of Employment Studies, you know, some groups in the community are going to be um, more disproportionately affected by the recession than others. Um, so we really need to, yes, look at a collective, but look at each individual circumstances at the same time as well. And whatever that situation may be that we're, we're working through with individuals, just really trying to make sure that, you know, we're inclusive for all um, and we're supporting each other as, as much as we can. Um, we've seen some real cases of, of you know, admiring um, some people's resilience, going the extra mile, the compassion to care um, and really just demonstrate, you know, that, that teamwork, um, that support network. But despite those, those positives coming out of a, a bad situation, I guess we need to ask ourselves, how long can we sustain that? And if we're not looking after our well-being, um, you know, when we're going um, full on all the time, it's naturally going to have an, an impact if we're not nurturing and looking after ourselves at the same time. So the headlines that, that we're kind of really focusing on at the moment, as, as the, the big box on the slide there shows, the impact of well-being clearly remains a, a concern, and that's whether you're in, you know, work, um, work environment, or, or working remotely, or even, you know, still experiencing um, the, the the tail end of furlough and whatever the new scheme um, presents, and and you know, you're being part of of, of that activity as well. Um, so it needs to be nurtured and, and managed to to the different circumstances. Um, what are the degrees of, of flexibility that, that we can apply? Um, if it wasn't the norm before, it certainly is now. And therefore, you know, the, the level of engagement will be different, different measures that, that we need to put in place and not allowing that kind of feeling of isolation to, to, keep, uh, to creep in and, and to keep relationships, you know, progressing um, and that contact and, and communication um, you know, being maintained and particularly looking at workloads and making sure that, if people are feeling a bit detached, feeling a bit isolated, pressure with the workload, it's all starting to get a bit too much. Um, so how are we ensuring that we are keeping on top of, uh, keeping in touch with those that, that work remotely? So, you know, monitoring the, the, the workloads as I've just mentioned, um, and the unpredictability of it as well. And I'm, I'm sure a number of you that will be able to, to relate to where I'm coming from when I say that the change in demand, you know, for, for us in, in the HR, sector um, you know we are dealing with a lot of well-being um, matters to, to be worked through a lot of structural changes some organizations we're seeing with some real growth uh, and, and pressure of demand and they can't bring people in quick enough to support that uh, sadly we are seeing some businesses needing to, to downsize quite dramatically um, all sorts of different change that's that's arising and changing direction, a lot of clients that we're seeing that, that are changing their, their products or the services that they provide um, and different dilemmas that, that might present themselves. So most importantly, we need to, to make sure that, you know, we're attuned to be able to, to spot those signs when we see individuals that might not see themselves, um, we're hearing the indicators that someone's struggling um, and be prepared to have those conversations and, and be equipped to, to find the solutions. Um, we, we, done a, we haven't totted it up most recently, but we've done um, a quick check, I think, back in um, end of July. And we've given away, since lockdown, 120 hours of, of free support out to business leaders for, for various different means across our, our service lines. Um, and that's continuing to happen. We're, we're still promoting that. We genuinely want to just help people wherever we can. So if you can't find the solutions to, to what your problem is that you're facing right now, please do get in touch and I'll share our contact details at the end. So what can we do then when we put that into context of, of looking at the, the current issues? And yes, as much as I can say to you, I, I know my team, I probably 
didn't know my team anywhere near as much as what I do now as a result of, of lockdown. Um, we're coming together um, more disciplined now than, than ever before. We are having daily huddles, regular catch-ups, um, that visibility, because we are still continuing to work remotely in the main. Um, so just making sure that uh, we have those one-to-one -one times that that is vital. Um, you know, health and well-being needs to be at the top of that agenda. And we need to make sure that, um, you know, even in team meetings, it's, it's a, a topic that is there and is discussed, not unique individual circumstances, but that people understand that it is there. It's, you know, a very important topic to, to, to work through. Um, on an individual level or even on a, a team level, you know, as I mentioned, discuss and, and, and work through the, the, the pressures and the workloads together. Um, find ways that motivate your, your, your people and, and motivate you. Um, there's different things. If, if you're connected with me on LinkedIn, you might see that I took on a challenge to, to mosaic a table. And it's really quite therapeutic. Um, so a, a bit more kind of mind well-being than, than, than physical well-being, although my arms were aching with the, the delicate kind of placing of the, the mosaic tiles. But um, some of the, the, the fascinating things that I've found, we've got a macrame um, specialist in the team um, who knitted our um, you uh, recently. Uh, during lockdown. Um, so, you know, things that in, entice and, and encourage and, and motivate um, people, uh, you know, how often do you ask that and, and see if you are actually, everything that you're putting out there is, is really serving a purpose. So that engagement, you know, the, the, the two-way communication to see what um, entices people to, to kind of get more in, in, involved. Understanding and, and, and again, as I said, you know, being aware of what those triggers are of where you feel that people might start to seem anxious, um, you know, stressed um, and knowing what will help them to, to be more resilient. Um, helping them wherever you can to, to, to feel that security um, in work and even where there are circumstances, um, some of what I described earlier, you know, where the, unfortunately we've got situations where jobs are at risk you've even had to make reductions um, but the pressure's still on to, to, to deliver um, you know how can you try and still create that that culture of, of togetherness um, and inclusion to, to make sure you're working through those difficult times together um, and knowing what really is important and what matters to, to your team um, I think again you know lockdown has proven that there's a lot of um, situations that, that have changed um, I think before some people might have been of a view that that money motivated people, um, you know, I think there's a real um, support that's satisfying, as I said, you know, the resilience and that, that um, commitment that we've seen over lockdown. So there's different triggers now, you know, people's mindsets and their whole outlook um, on the situation has changed. So how are we seeing and identifying what really does, you know, um, matter to, to the individuals within your, your team? Making sure that people feel they can come to you, that, that you know, they're able to talk through whatever concerns they've got, um, whether that's personal circumstances, work circumstances, um, and making sure that you're demonstrating that you are available and, and able to, to, to talk through whatever situation um, there may be. Um, I've mentioned... Um, you know, looking at the, the um, needing by example and, and the health and well-being. Um, yes, if you're in the workplace, I think it, we're, we're all attuned now to making sure that we're social distancing. If I could turn the screen around, you see we've got tape. I've got posters up behind me everywhere. We've got screens up. Um, and I went and washed my hands again for another time before um, I came on screen. Um, you know, so making sure we're, we're, we're maintaining those levels of, of hygiene to give that, that safety and security. And even if people are at home, you know, encouraging them to, to, to do the same, um, just to, to, to get it part of the everyday kind of routine. Um, and making sure that, you know, that there are breaks. Um, I, I do continuously go out to the team, making sure that people are taking breaks, that they're exercising, we encourage um, you know, we've got a, a WhatsApp group, so we encourage, you know, um, conversation constantly, um, daily throughout that to see what people have been up to and what they might find out on their run or their travels, out on their bike, um, whatever that may be. Um, and also looking at the, the, the flexibility that you've got in the team, as the previous slide showed, you know, with, with um, the, the stats from ONS, there are a lot of people, even if not working from home before, not working remotely, they are working remotely now. Um, what else might you be doing in terms of encouraging flexibility? We've had 
um, a change of work days, we've had change in hours um, across our client base. There's, there's been some, some real radical changes that, that have been put in place. Um, and making sure as well that you're leading by example, you know, if for whatever reason you might feel under the weather, um, are you one of those individuals that continues working? You don't rest and, and recuperate or you're stretching yourself too far and you're starting to, to feel you know, burnt out. Um, think about how you're, you're demonstrating to, to, you know, your team um, and, and, and looking after and, and leading by example, you know, what they should be doing. Um, the excessive hours can easily creep in, etc. You know, so all those different indicators where you might feel that you're kind of subconsciously encouraging the team to, to follow in suit with how you're practicing. Um, so taking care of your well-being is, is first and foremost the, the most important. You, know, you need to, to, to drive the rest of the team forward. So how are you leading by example? Um, I touched on earlier around reviewing workloads and, and kind of you know, people's duties, responsibilities, whatever way you want to, to, to um, phrase that. Um, but making sure, you know, don't lose sight of the fact that people can still um, develop, learning their role, People have been learning new skills throughout lockdown, whether that's because they've been on furlough or, you know, even in the office um, or whatever the work environment is, um, they're picking up new systems, new processes to, to, to work through. Um, and they're great opportunities, but again, you know, can still impact on wellbeing if it presents a different pressure, et cetera. Um, so making sure that clarity is there. And again, you know, links back to, to, to the, the workload of activity um, and making sure that if there are deadlines or there's you know big deliverables to, to, to focus on that they're realistic and you know the expectations are, are clearly understood and it's it's doable it's manageable um making sure again you know whenever the team say um that i don't know for example they're giving you ideas of, of how things can be, be delivered so that autonomy you know um, I've seen a lot throughout lockdown about um, you know, creating and, and generating and, and promoting, advocating more of that, that trusted relationship. And we're seeing it now more than ever before. I think a lot of people's mindsets that might not have um, willingly just have um, working from home as part of their practice, are certainly doing so now. Um, you know, that, that trusted relationship is really starting to, to get formed um, from that as an example. Um, so, you know, how can, are we entrusting people to just leave them to get on and do the job, to not feel like they're being micromanaged or you're checking in all the time, you know, because again, that can create a, a degree of, of pressure and anxiety. Um, reflecting on your own style. So I've started to kind of touch on that a bit, but, um, you know, do the team know where they stand with you? Um, do they feel that you're, you're demonstrating fairness, openness, um, consistency, you're being decisive? Um, again, go back to the unpredictability. You're able to, to just make decisions, um, collaborate, engage them where you need to, um, or at least, again, demonstrate that you're driving you know, the, the team forwards, but that you're also asking for feedback at the same time. Um, a lot of what we're going through is uncharted territory. So as much as you might have those ideas and, and put them in place, or even if the team have been engaged whilst you're doing that, once things have been put in place that, ha that have introduced the change, are you checking in to make sure it's worked? Are you seeking that feedback to, to make sure, you know, it is um, the right way forward for you and your business and it's sustainable? Um, again, as I mentioned, you know, treating people um, on an individual basis, um, inclusive um, when you're spending time with them on a one-on-one -on -one or as a, a group session as well. Um, and encourage that feedback both ways. So as much as you're asking for feedback, um, you know, from on, on your own style, um, be prepared to, to strike that balance and, and give that feedback also. Um, I've got a couple of tools if people want to get in touch. As I said, I'll share my details in, in just a moment. Um, so if people do want any more information, um, I've got some free tools that, that you can use to reflect on your, your, your leadership and management style. Um, Touching on the, the last couple of points then, discourag discouraging presenteeism and a new one on me, leaveism. Um, so how many times have we gone on leave and, and carried on working, the, the odd check on your phone of what's up on email, um, or you're just, you know, logging in and, and doing whatever you need to. But we need to take those breaks, um, you know, for whatever reason that we're absent from the workplace, there is a reason for, 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 for that being so. So having that time to rest and recuperate is, is absolutely you know, vital. Um, and again, that we're leading by example to, to make sure that's the case. Um, 
and nurturing the, the mental as well as the, the, the physical health of, of the team. And again, leading by example to make sure, you know, you, you do do that. Um, so, you know, being in tune with all that I've said um, just now and where you are identifying areas that you need to focus on, you know, start to, to, to concentrate on the actions that you need to put in place to, to make a change. So what can you take away from what I've said so far? I would hope that a lot of what I've said um, isn't new to you. And a lot of this isn't, you know, I always um, have said, and, and Richard, I'm sure will agree um, that he's heard me say that before, you know, I work in HR because a lot of this is common sense. Um, it's, it's, it, we're all, you know, individuals and, and so much of it isn't rocket science. It's just good practice of treating others as how we expect to be treated ourselves. But it was interesting writing. Stop because we've run out of time. Um, are we facilitating the slides and things afterwards? Yeah, 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 we can do. Yeah, of course we can. Yeah. Oh, I'm really sorry, John. We, if you give, give you've got thirty seconds, I'm sure we can wrap up in thirty seconds. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, shall I just carry on talking? Yeah, yeah, yeah thirty seconds would be great, John. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, so this slide is just giving you a, a takeaway um, of of what you can concentrate on. Um, it was great to, to produce a slide set because it was really just a reminder for me to, to, to demonstrate what we can practice. Um, so here's a, a, a kind of idea of, of what you can do to just concentrate on the areas for, for well-being um, that you might have forgotten about or some of the bad habits that, that you need to, to move on from. Um, but as I said earlier, if anyone needs any more support and advice, you've got our contact details. Um, by all means, do get in touch and thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Jonathan. If anybody does want the slides, are you happy to give out your email address? I know you've given out the web address there, but... Um... Yeah, sure. The email address is on there as well. So by oh, is it? I can't see my eyes are appalling. Sorry. It's a long way away. It's about 50 feet away, this map from us. <laughs> <laughs> is that OK? Brilliant, Jonathan. Thank you very much. And hopefully your uh, uh, afternoon improves um, yes, following all the too. trials and tribulations. <laughs> Love to see you. You take care. Thank Thanks, you. Jonathan. Cheers. Bye-bye. So next up, we've got Darren Aston from Aston and James. Darren's role and experiences, experience has developed since his first position in telesales through to eventually progressing to managing director owner in April 2012. Darren heads up diverse family business with an experienced team, which includes five of his own family. Darren is continuing to learn from others and share his own knowledge and experience. I think we're we've got a video actually first, which isn't anything to do with Darren, but I'm sure Darren won't mind. So we've got a brief video that we're going to show for Oxford Business Park that, uh, that we shot last year, which sort of showcases their new facilities. So we've got that coming up, guys. You need to have an environment that is full of life, that is, embraces well-being in the workplace. And I think what we've got now at Oxford Business Park ticks all those boxes. So our community aspect of the business park is obviously very important to us moving forward. Um, we really are enjoying getting to know more people on the park mm -hmm. and having the amenities here helps us do that. It's really lovely to be able to have these wonderful event spaces as well because it gives us the opportunity to offer them out to everybody on the park. Yeah. The Oxford Park Life app really helps us to connect with our customers and offer services like fitness classes, seasonal events, lunch giveaways and so much more. The app is a really great addition to help service and build the business community we have. So we started off with the Oxford Works and then we had the Oxford Workshop which is the coffee pod down the way at the marketplace and now we've got the Oxford Factory. The Oxford Factory can bring a beating heart to the middle of its business park. We're here to serve accessible, locally sourced food and drink affordably um, to anybody. Everybody's welcome. The factory is a former site of the Morris Works, where our grandfather worked, and that is the idea of the design. So we keep it contemporary, high quality and industrial, and we feel it's in keeping with the surroundings of the area. It has been a uh, holistic approach with us developing new places to eat, meet and socialise that sit alongside business spaces with a personality. So whether that be the business lounges through to loft style office spaces, R&D or full production space, um, our aim has been to create a community that works for all types of business in Oxford. It creates a great community and uh, mm -hmm. gets everybody connected and involved. The city centre location because we are the business quarter of Oxford.
and Darren Aston. Robinson Crusoe got unshaven there, Darren. <laughs> it's not my lockdown looks, but it's my lo lockdown locks, but it's my lockdown look. We were told it was a sign to look out for, for well-being. So how are you, Darren? Are you okay? Doing okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank good, you. Good how's, stuff. How's it going? It's been a good yeah, day? Yeah, it's, um, apart from the world, well, although we are inside, we're not broadcasting outside. It's, uh, it's, it's chucking it down outside, so definitely. Is it? Yeah, autumn seems to be upon us. How are you? Yeah, doing, doing okay, thank you very much. Yeah, all well, family's all well. That's the most important thing at the moment. But, so yeah, um, challenging times, but working through it and lots of lots of positive things being talked about today, which is good. So it's, um, it's been a really good event. No, good stuff. Well, I mean, anybody that knows Darren and the team, Aston James there, you know, one of the sort of uh, standard bearers for responsible business in Oxfordshire. They do a lot of great work um, in the community and supporting other businesses and they're in great support of B4 and a lot of the B4 members over the years. So real pleasure to have um, Darren with us today and part of the B4 community. Um, and if you ever want a decent office stationery or furniture company, um, then you couldn't do much worse than, than, than Darren. He's fantastic and all his team are. So a bit of a plug for you there, Darren. And, and are you gonna do a, you got some slides you're gonna show for us today? I've got a few slides, yeah, if I, if I may. Am I okay to um, you crack on, Darren, um, yeah. share, my, share my screen? Please, let's do it. Brilliant, thank you. Right, I am there. I'll just put it into present of you. Perfect. And uh, good to go. So we'll just give you a mark. We're on time, Darren, but you crack on and we'll ask you any questions at yeah, the end. Yeah, I... It, I, I've timed it. Hopefully, not, hopefully, won't overrun. So we should be good. Can you go um, into uh, main screen view, Darren, please? Main screen. Yeah. Have you got? Um, so you should be able at the top. You should be able to switch to full screen view. Oh yeah, full screen view. Is this actually? Oh, sorry, I, I should have. Uh, you are screen sharing. Is that main screen. View? Display settings correct. What? Display settings. Display settings, sorry. The mouse is on that, yeah. And then choose. You forget? Swap. 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 Got it. There we go. Perfect. Right. Sorry about that. That's right. You're on your own, mate. Oh, good. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for um, inviting us along to be a part of today. I mean, workplace well being. Workplace wellbeing is very much important and at the, sort of the heart of everything that we do, certainly in the past and now so more so now in the future. Um, so um, Rich has given a bit of an overview on, on who we are and thank you for that. Um, the point of our, or the, the, the reason or the message for our presentation today is to take you through some thoughts and um, uh, on connection between workplace wellbeing and work performance. Um, the connection between the workplace wellbeing and performance so we've we've continued to live through these challenging times and we're experiencing it from our own perspective working in our own teams but also as we carry out our lives and um, learnings through supporting our customers and their interactions with us it's an evolving picture and the way we do business continues to evolve um, the way we work has and, and will be continually challenging um, and this does and will continue to impact on our productivity um, the changes to the work environment over the last few months have created a new reality for today's organisations. Workplace wellbeing was a common and understood phrase pre-COVID-19, and it takes on a whole different meaning, um, certainly from our, our, our current experience um, as things continue to evolve around us. And so the last six months, I'm going to talk about uh, two, two six months, so the last one that we've experienced and the next one that we'll um, um, yet to experience, but we kind of know the sort of path that we're on from the journey we, we've begun. Um, the, the workplace well-being um, part of, 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 of our um, current setups um, in, in teams, in, in our workplace where we choose to work, continues to um, evolve at a pace and how and, and, and where we work um, is something that's um, changing from um, hybrid systems from the best of both working some days in the office some days at home supporting both areas and both environments um, does have its its own challenges and impact in, can, can impact productivity from a um, from a physical point of view to, from to a mental point of view um, now we've been supporting people in their workplace um, reassessments working from home and we continue to help people in evolving how their workplaces um, are set up safely and, and responsibly. 
Um, probably, I'd say certainly now more than ever, some people might um, recognize this as a bit of an image from the matrix, but we are plugged into the matrix, uh, certainly at this moment in time today and, and, and other, other times um, where we're working distantly and um, the, the, the um, flexibility of working and uh, has changed. The, the remote working obviously has increased, longer hours, heavier workloads, people putting in really um, you know, long shifts working from home, just, just probably more not just not discriminating the workplace to working from home, but I think there is an element of people working longer hours working from home because they feel like they, they cannot disconnect from, um, from, their, from their, um, um, their devices perhaps because they always need to be reachable. And so by doing that um, and, and carrying out those duties and tasks, we are increasing our sedentary behavior. The average person sits seven hours a day and that's average. And there's a lot more people sat for a lot longer periods of time, people eating Aldesco and just not taking the breaks that they need to in, 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 in encourage and incorporate movement and mobility into their days. In the office, you move around a little bit more than you do at home. I, I, I know and appreciate some people on this, the, the screens today watching will, will probably have got this pretty well locked down from their point of view and doing it better and better all the time. But you know, if working from home was it's, it's going to still be continually necessary, most workers didn't have, don't have, and I haven't perhaps still got in the true sense of the word, a home working office. So we've had makeshift um, offices, and these remain present issues for working from home employees. And 54% of work, working from home employees didn't have a have don't and still possibly don't have dedicated space. Um, um, so ones that potentially have got a setup at home um, may have worked remotely from time to time, not full time. I know there's a lot of people that do work from home and have worked from home full time and they do. We can learn from them and, 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 and certainly experiencing from them um, in order to sort of in, in, encourage and support the, the, um, um, the well-being element of um, um, sharing that, sharing that best practice and good advice. Um, an inefficient setup could lead to repetitive strain injuries, back or neck issues. And you will you will want to consider ergonomics and efficiency and mobility as, as part of a working from home strategy or certainly a well-being strategy. Um, we're, we're continually connected. We're always on. And uh, certainly from my point of view, uh, you, you really only properly switch off when you sleep. And sometimes it's hard to get to sleep if you haven't had the mobility and the movement in your day. I know that's the advice I get from from my uh, smartwatch saying you've not moved enough today or your, 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 your heart rate has dipped today because you did do a little bit more exercise. So we know that exercise and movement definitely impacts on our sleeping patterns and our headspace and how we think and, 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 and um, live and work. And the balance of um, the blurring work-life balance continues. So um, some stats um, we shared in our previous Bio 2020 um, continue to be um, present um, alarm bells. And these, these are gonna get continually worse if we don't put time and attention to what really matters. We sit for too long periods of time without moving and um, it's an increasing um, uh, in, uh, problem for obesity and um, a good number of people are unfortunately putting weight down through lockdown working from home not being able to exercise and um, seeing increasing inquiries of things like um, sit stand workstations uh, treadmill desks and things that people have just gone absolutely mad for which is good for business it doesn't replace what was there for us previously but we're trying to understand and support people in how they wish they want how and well and wish they how they wish to work um and and uh, the, the slide to the, to the right is uh, sorry the picture to the right um it, it reminds us that if we don't encourage the right um, mobility to the way we work now we will have severe problems because uh, by 55 by, by uh, 2030 we've got 30 30 percent of the population will be over 55 and those problems will um, um play out um in in um, in our older society um so the way and how we, we, we work impacts our productivity and, a, and a, certainly a, from a well-being program, incorporating ergonomics and best practices in your work environment helps employees improve morale and productivity. Um, when, uh, when, when employees are less fatigued, uh, they're able to work without discomfort and they're able to be more productive, more alert and happier overall. Um, and, um, uh, and certainly we, we need to reassess that um that, that understanding working um certainly with teams remotely that um we can't always um walk through the office and see exactly how people are set up so the so sort of red flags aren't as obvious um we we always look for uh supporting the zones uh, to ensure that people are um, looking at the prevention of back tension uh, zone one zone two avoiding wrist pressure uh, avoiding the neck strain by being sat at the desk, leaned over a device, and not having the, the right, the right, right um, 
productive setup to support a, um, uh, um, a, good, a good working day. And, so, and again, in reducing the inactivity, which I've alluded to a few times. Um, the, the, the sort of suggestions that the ergonomics, ergonomists recommend um, when working in an office or at home from, a, from an ergonomics perspective on well-being, we suggest a chair adjustment so employees' thighs are parallel to the floor, feet should be flat on the floor and on, or on a footrest, knees should not touch the seat pan and should be a couple of um, um, finger um, uh, measurements behind your knee, uh, in, in, in not in touch with the waterfall front seat, so enough distance there to um, encourage blood flow when being sat and then look at the employee's chair with potentially looking at backrest if it doesn't already support with a lumbar support um, and provide um, of the employees with relief um, from any of those tension areas um, leading into something that looks a little bit like a um, picture from the 1980s show blockbuster um, the examples shown here represent a hive of solutions to consider for anyone and everyone um, in um, wanting solutions to support their activity um, the num number of these in, in, these new zones, um, sorry, sorry, these zones include new products that have antimicrobial elements, so that the antimicrobial pro um, products that we now have available within these zones help kill or slow the spread of microorganisms. Um, so wellness now and in the future, and looking ahead, ergonomics will remain part of a core workplace wellness program, and as things become more normal in a present state of mind. Um, we know that certainly from uh, the messages that we are given from the government and the best guidance and health and safety, that, that certainly um, social distancing is something that we should um, respect and, and remind ourselves of because in an environment such as a workplace where you feel safe, those kind of barriers may drop a little bit and we feel a little bit more relaxed around others. Um, so we need to make sure the standards that we, 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 we uphold, we maintain and, and lead by example. Um, and if we haven't already started to reassess um, our plans and, and requirements for the future, it's time to review how see, our remote workers um, and ergonomics stack up. So most businesses have dealt with an immediate challenges requiring the provision of um, minimum of set of tools and working from home products such as laptops, mouse pads, mouse rest, wrist rests, and advanced cases and additional monitor. While these pieces of equipment can get staff up and running, there is more that can be done to improve employee productivity with home office equipment. We, in our workplaces, need to continue to maintain safe and um, practical, clean working environments. This is something that's going to have increased focus and providing the right safety measures and peace of mind and confidence to have that productivity level because people are feeling safe, happy and protected in their workplace. We, um, we, we this is something that from the pandemic, we know that this has changed the world in which we work in and the plan, the A plan or the B plan, sometimes um, it's, it, it, the, the plans and the measures that you can put into place. Um, we need, we, un, we understand there's an urgency that um, we need to protect ourselves perhaps more than we're already doing. Um, so uh, looking at um, the studies of the fact that the, the virus is airborne and that the air that we breathe is, is, is um, um, potentially um, um, could, could be problematic in a workspace um, to uh, facilitate the, um, the health and well-being of those employees within that workspace, even with social distancing measures in place and hand sanitising and clean surfaces. A safe and clean healthy environment is good for morale, well-being and performance. And um, we've got a sort of a triangular um, effect or approach to ensuring that all of those things are maintained and supported not just in our workplace, but um, supporting customers, businesses, um, employers and employees in their establishments in creating um, that sort of triangular protection message of hand sanitizing, cleaning your hands more often, clean work tops, and now air purification systems is the sort of third element to that sort of protection triangle that we see as a, um, a help, a solution, and a, also a, a confidence piece to productivity in workplaces as people return and are able to return to their workplace. 90% of the air that we breathe is polluted and some um, stats um, that, that, that certainly alarmed me when I really looked into this recently. Um, we know that we intake, we have to intake water to, to, help, to support our well-being. We have to take in food to support our well-being. And obviously, depending on what we eat, depends on how much we, we consume. But the average person would, would normally consume what you see on the screen. And the most alarming thing, without taking it for granted, is the air that we breathe. Um, 10,800 litres of air per day consumed and then um, re-exerted um, re into 
um, a workplace or a space or a shared space. Um, I have um, a few examples here for considerations in our daily lives. So the elements that you see, the germs and viruses at the moment, we've got cold and flu um, viruses out in, in, in the air as well. Um, children with colds and, and adults with colds and coughs. The most, the, the, the quick, the quick um, decisions for people at the moment is what is it? I better stay at home, I better self-isolate, I better do the right thing. But probably, probably a good proportion of it is colds, coughs, and just common, common viruses that get picked up in, in the spaces and places that we, 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 we are from, from home to, 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 to school, to work. Um, and back again. So um, by a, a incorporating purification systems into your headspace for um, the future, I think that, you, that we would certainly be able to eliminate some of the things that are on here or certainly protect ourselves more so. It doesn't say that it would eliminate um, or, or protect us completely from COVID, but it gives again um, um, a, a, a certainly a, a supporting um, element that um, um, the research that people have done is that the virus is a similar size to the flu virus, therefore um, air purification systems of a certain grade and standard would play their part in, in um, giving us that sort of protection triangle that we're looking for in, in, in incorporating safe practices for, um, for, for well-being. And, and again, we're looking after your well-being, you're ultimately looking after um, your productivity and your interests, um, in your interests in, 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 in not just people, but in your business. Um, there's a small bit of my presentation um just just mentioning the fact that you know that gives peace of mind to some people above and beyond what we have been going through um to support businesses in their workplaces and just just get people safely moving around socially distanced clean and, and set up and appropriately working from home wherever, wherever possible we are here to help Thanks, Darren. Darren, unfortunately, I, I don't know if it's true for everybody in, in, in the outside world, but we couldn't hear the video. So, could you just talk through the essence of what the video was was showing us? Great narrative to it. It's it's more visual, but the um, the over narrative of the video is to um, show that um, by implementing um, this as an additional solution within our sort of COVID measures and practices that. There is an invisible um, invisibility of air that um, these systems are there to help um, to provide some peace of mind. And with the digital display saying that you've got air circulations happening every hour, so many every hour, being in a shared workspace or workplace socially distanced is just it's um, incorporates another um, safety uh, message to bring that confidence um, to people's um, minds when um, when attending uh, work or, um, or working from home because there are. Um, options for people working from home as well. I'd say that the importance of air intake is probably, with all due respect, we, we forget it, we take it for granted and it's um, second nature. We breathe in, we breathe out. We don't, we don't count how many times we're doing that. And it's, um, it's, the, it's the, certainly the most important intake. And there's just there's so much around us at the moment that we don't see. Fantastic, thank, thank you. you. So, I mean, how, how much learning have you had to do, Darren, uh, as a business and changing what, what you do? I mean, it must have, You've had to transform your business significantly from selling 
boxes of photocopy paper to rubber gloves and, and sanitizer. It's been a tough paper round, um, but I'm certainly learning um, very quickly and sharing as much as we can with the team. And just you, 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 you well, basically, there's there's a lot of people that, um, that have to step up, and um, we're one of them because of our relevance. Um, as you guys have done in stepping up, doing all of this, it's um, we all play our part in a in a community, and there's a there's a wider picture. And I think it's part of a, a part of a jigsaw puzzle. We we have to sometimes go out and find the pieces of what is going to make a better picture um, and deliver on that. Do you see um, your business? I mean, obviously, you know, the uncertainty of all of this situation is what's hanging over all of us, but um, you, you've adjusted for the long haul or do you still need to find new um, channels of, of revenue or is this your business now? Yeah, I mean, this is the this is sort of our frontline business right now. Um, this where, where, where and how we support businesses and just gain an understanding because it is a bit of a moving picture. Lots of um, conversations go from, we've got everything now where we want it, and then something changes and their plans change, which impact us. We don't have any kind of what I would class as reoccurring um, contracted business. It's all on all on good service, good, good, good name, good um, representation of what we do and positioning ourselves. We have to be relevant for the audience. We have to be relevant for people and businesses in functioning safely, soundly, responsibly. I mean, we, we, we will look as much as possible to support people in their digital and, and document solutions, because clearly document solutions um, dig digitally is something very different to um, passing paper around the office. And certainly lots of businesses have already adopted good digital ways of working. Difficult to replace the stationary cupboard. Um, and so we're having to look at, and wanting and needing to. And we were already on part of that journey with ergonomics and workplace wellbeing. I mean, workplace wellbeing has been a, a key feature of ours, probably certainly more uh, progressive key, key Aggressive. It's certainly been a feature for the last sort of four or five years, and you know you, you've helped us with that as well in, in in distributing that message and getting that message out there. It's you know it's key to our existence. Fantastic. Emma, you want to go? I was just wondering if you've got uh, if you're suffering right now, you're working from home, and you've got a bad back. Um, how can people find out about some of these ergonomic solutions? Like that? We've got um, on our um, uh, landing page of our website, we've got some top tips on um, reassessing your setup. So you may even have the kit at home and just not know how to use it. Um, and that's something that we found multiple times over that most people have a, you know, a, a reasonable chair. Some people don't even sit on a proper chair, which is obviously something they need to reassess and rethink. But when you have got the equipment, sometimes you just don't use it properly. So we, we, we do give some guidance on helping people understand how to make the best of what they've already got. And if they feel that if we feel and they feel that agreeably that there's some improvements that could be made, then that's where we might be able to um, help. And we have a, um, a furniture showroom in Whitney, which is available by appointment only at the moment. Um, my brother Craig is our sort of head of furniture, and, and he's been in the business 20 years, and he's he's le he's learning as quickly as I am on all the things that uh, that go with um, trying to support people in being set up more productively. The amount of people that have rung in and said, "I need to re reassess my my needs." We are, we are here to um, sort of understand what those requirements are. It's one-to-one, -one, it's consultative, it's not online. So um, we, we, chat, we chat things through, really. We just try to qualify what's required. Do you have any other on the website that people might find useful? Sorry, I misheard you, sorry. Do you have any other guidance on your, on your website, like the information on the ergonomics? Yeah, um, there's a whole whole suite of um, sort of move more. Um, so it's it's a section on sort of creating happier, healthier workplaces, um, from even just you know collaboration tools that we've perhaps taken for granted in the office in brainstorming ideas. There's just there's various things that we we try to continually blog about features and 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 try to be again relevant to what's happening around us so that people um, people partake in that and they can relate to it. But yes, there's, there's plenty of growing good content. We're trying to add as much relevance um, to it as possible. Need to follow you on Twitter and LinkedIn. Well, certainly a highlight for me in lockdown was uh, it was back in March when uh, Darren, and I, Darren, <coughs> Darren and I were trying to track down toilet rolls. Darren, do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a case of Paul the other one. It was finding them. <laughs> no, it was... <laughs> I don't know, I'm going to say they came in handy, they nearly so it uh, just goes to show that uh, time has flown um, and you've been a great support Darren, really appreciate everything you've done for us and I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all your customers, uh, really appreciate everything, make sure you look after yourself.
Have a shake. Have a shake. Thank you. <laughs> I'm getting used to it. Are you? Are you? <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll give I don't it, mind it. The upside down a bit. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, guys, it's pretty good. Yes, thanks, James. Thanks again for, for joining us, and hopefully, we'll see you soon. Brilliant. Nice to see you. I think we're, we're turning the lights out because they've all gone. So, uh... cheers, James. Take care. See you soon. Bye bye. We've got a video next up. I think so. Yeah. Next up, we're joined by Carmel Conwing, um, and she's the Regeneration and Economy Officer for Oxford City Council's Rege Regeneration and Economy Service. I think we can see, see Carmel now. Hi, Carmel. Can you hear us? Uh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we certainly can. Carmel, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you, Carmel. So, you can know, talk to us about workplace wellbeing at uh, the City Council. Um, yes, I'm going to give a, a quick synopsis of uh, Oxford City Council's uh, wellbeing strategies and of mental health awareness, um, but just promoted within the council. Um, I think the first thing maybe to start with would be to say that the workplace is in and of itself a community. And uh, when people within that community are empowered and uh, to understand mental health, um, the positive attitude that is fostered within the community or, or in this sense, the workplace um, is fed through the organisation, and as a result, there's a, a regard and a kindness very foreign towards each other. And um, I think, with with that in mind, it's not just about having policies and strategies in print, but of promoting uh, an actual culture of respect and caring, of li of listening, and communicating in a non-judgmental way um, to help to promote well-being in the workplace. And it is with this in mind that Oxford City Council is developing or has developed a people strategy, um, which is a, a live document um, and a, a, no, a live dynamic plan, um, which responds to changes in many, as in many aspects. And it links, um, I guess, workplace well-being by um, linking all the strands of someone's career development. Um, into their actual well-being because the two are you know linked in, in lots of ways and to balance a stimulating working environment with the need for a healthy lifestyle or life cycle um, which the council does encourage and um, and I, I I think a key aspect of this is to make every I guess to um sorry to understand that mental health is everyone's business and uh, the promotion of uh, good mental health is is, should be and it must be of concern to everybody and um, the, you know with, with this the council has actually not they don't just have strategies in print they train mental health first aiders and you know we're encouraged I'm one encouraged to wear our green lanyards so that people can approach us um, if, if they do need to talk confidentially and, uh, and non-judgmentally and um, I think the attitudes and beliefs that society holds about mental health and mental ill health especially and, and well-being have a powerful impact on someone's experience um, and their experience of, at work and uh, I, I think it's about empowering uh, I guess employees and empowering each other and to you know it's not just one in four that will suffer mental ill health it's it's everyone whether it's true uh, you know um, um, you know, the, the death of a, a loved one, which we'll all experience at some point, um, and the grief that that brings, or if it's, um, you know, uh, a mental health condition in and, in and of itself. Um, and I think you can't 
can't have mental, uh, sorry, you can't have workplace well-being without the promotion of well, of good mental health and of uh, taking away the stigma um, that's, you know, long being associated with it. And uh, the council is working hard to promote, I think, uh, a positive attitude towards uh, mental well-being in the workplace. Just so, so, um, about sort of the, the whole managing the workforce at the city council and working remotely, because correct me if I'm wrong, before lockdown, you were you were making a move to work at least one day uh, a week from home, was that right? Or some of the council work? Actually breaking up, I can't fully hear what you've uh -huh. just said. Can you can, repeat? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Is that any better? Yeah, so correct me if I'm wrong, but talking about sort of managing the workforce at the city council did, was it is it right to say that before lockdown you were um not experimenting or a lot of the workforce were working from home one day a week yes uh the, and thank you for reminding me the council actually has a very good uh, a very good uh, flexible work strategy where um most people, um, sometimes it's, it's not uh, conductive or conducive to the role, but most people uh, can actually, um, sorry, can you still hear me? I'm still here, yeah. We still got you. Oh, good, sorry. Um, thank you, sorry. Um, I thought my sound went. Um, that most people are encouraged to work from home if, if they can one day a week. Um, and there's also flexible working within the council where we have certain hours, our uh, core hours that have to be available, but um, otherwise there's a, a bit of leeway within in the hours. And I think that does help to facilitate um, a well-being because uh, for example, I used to, and I go to the gym because I was right beside work in my lunch break. And uh, you know, it took me 15 minutes there, 15 minutes back, and a half an hour quick workout. And it was also the central location of the council being next next to the gym. Um, but it was also having that leeway that you know that you could take an hour and a half for lunch or two hours sometimes with your manager's permission. So um, the council has this attitude that we're all one team. We're not just service areas, and uh, I think this feeds true and how everybody works together because it's like a bicycle you need all the parts or it doesn't function um so yeah there is flexible working there's uh mental health first aiders are trained and visible and even now with um our virtual meetings we're still encouraged although i do sometimes get to wear my mental health um lanyard um and um yeah it's, I, I think it's having a whole pardon Maybe you could have a green backdrop, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I could carry it around with me. Um, but thank I'll probably you. forget it. Um, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, thank no, you, Carmen. I really, really appreciate you joining sorry, us. Sorry, we're going to have to bring, bring it to a close. Right. There. We've got the next speaker coming up. But thank you uh, for joining us today. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully we get to hear more from you in the future. Thank you, Carmel. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you very bye much. Bye-bye. Thank you. So next up we have Kate Reid, um, it's not a typo, she's from B3, not B4. So Kate is a director at B3 Potential, an organisation which brings a practical science-based approach to professional development and learning through coaching, workshops, assessments and programmes. Uh, their understanding of the deep connections between brain, body and behaviour, the B3 connection, enables them to fast-track behavioural leadership and organisational change that sticks. Kate is also a leadership development specialist, executive and team coach, and part of an advisory group to the mindful workplace community. Kate, sounds like you're very busy. How are you? I'm really well. How about you? It's been a great day. Yeah, you've enjoyed it. Yeah, we're, we're, we, we feel like we might, uh, we're sitting to get, we're going to get, we're going to get deluge when we, when we leave the orange. I don't know if it's, it's raining near you, but. Uh, it, it has, it has started, but I'm warm and cosy, so I'm happy working uh, from home like everyone else. So, so I've got Emma here with me as well, so hi. Hi. <laughs> so have you got some, you've got some slides to show us today, Kate? Um, I decided I was going to chat instead of, uh, of doing slides and, um, yeah, so because I do have a tendency to, do, you know, to go on, just jump in at any point if you've got, you know, questions or if anyone, you know, watching has has anything, you know, if you ask questions, if I'm able to answer them, I'll be glad to do so. 
Well, we Unfortunately, we don't have the chat function, function today, but um, obviously if anything uh, comes up between Emma and I, we'll, we'll jump in. But you, you carry on. And, uh, Challenged. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous. Uh, you set the, uh, yes. set, the, set the marker for us there. So the thing that I wanted to talk about was mindfulness. And I, and I know that's something that has come up a lot, you know, sort of during the day. Um, but one of the things that, that we have found, particularly, you know, post-COVID, is that we're getting lots of calls from organisations, uh, you know, companies who are wanting to introduce mindfulness or at least just talk about it. And it kind of makes sense because, you know, mindfulness practice is, is one of these areas that contributes positively right across the full mental wellness spectrum from, you know, the severely clinically, you know, depressed, you know, even in hospitals, all the way through to um, people who are already well and are using it in a sort of positive psychology sort of way. Um, so we're getting lots of calls from, you know, people, but, you know, what we're noticing is that often there's a real disconnect between what people um, want, you know, what they want in their organisations and what realistically they can get. So I thought it might be useful just to explain, you know, some of the questions we're being asked, what it can do, what it can't do, um, you know, and, you know, and what other companies might be doing in sort of mindfulness, you know, sort of programmes. So I've called this a skeptic's guide, you know, it's why, and I guess largely it is because I, you know, I am one. Um, I spent years as a journalist at major broadcasters and I was really trained to, you know, to look for evidence. And I also covered a number of stories where just a little bit of knowledge created quite a lot of, you know, sort of damage. So I always want to go a little bit deeper than what's just on, you know, on the surface. You know, so I, I am a bit of a research geek, you know, and because I work in the corporate world, I also know the value of time and resources, and I, I really don't want to waste anyone's time, including my own, on passing fads of, of which there are, you know, are many. Um, so even my introduction to, to mindfulness, I came across that because I thought I was uncovering a scam. And it was 20 years ago when um, we still used to have uh, faxes. And a press release came across my, uh, my desk, and it said that... Um, if you did this particular mindfulness program, uh, meditation program, you would end up getting discounts on your health insurers. And, and I kind of thought health insurance don't tend to kind of give discounts without, you know, reason, they're profit making. So I went to investigate it and, and that's where I started to learn, actually, this is true. And because there is so much evidence about what works. But equally, there's a lot of spin out there at the moment. And um, so what I'd like to do is, you know, is just pull apart a bit of what we actually do know and what might just be sort of marketing of people that are, are trying to kind of uh, ride the wave, you know, of, of interest in this. Um, so I guess the first thing is, why is it so popular now? Well, there is a robust amount of evidence going back about, you know, 30 years, and I could give you all the sort of the details, but it's, it's about how it works in, you know, health, education, government departments, corporates, and so on. Um, and, and people started to see that actually it worked in, in, in some areas and it did certain things. And we also had the introduction of the fMRI, which showed us what it actually did to our brains. So we can now see you know, what it's been, what it's really doing and how we might kind of use it. Um, so there, there's some credibility there, but there's also a lot of kind of pseudoscience. So, so just be careful, you know, there about, you know, your resources when you're, when you're looking at this. Um, I think there's also been a tipping point. It's no longer seen as something really flaky. You know, it's generally secular now. Um, and I, I realized about 10 years ago, you know, that we had reached a tipping point when uh, I was doing some postgrad study and my lecturer, who was a neuroscientist at UCLA, so only neuroscience, that's, you know, that's all she did. She said that she had to start meditating because she was losing credibility as a scientist for not doing it. And I kind of thought, OK, some, something has changed, you know, here. Um, and, and we're also starting to see it being used in all sorts of organisations. You know, in the last couple of weeks, I've talked to, you know, LinkedIn, GlaxoSmithKline, SAP, Google, you know, all of these companies that are actually using uh, sort of mindfulness as part of their, their core uh, leadership development and wellness programmes. So 
What are we hearing? We're hearing from um, organizations about three different things. One is they're interested in mindfulness because you know it's it's the wellness. You know, it helps stress, depression, emotional well-being. Um, and largely we're hearing from organizations because they recognize that they have a duty of care. So what we're actually finding here is that we actually have to ask organizations about this balance. You know, are they trying to put all the personal responsibility for duty of care and wellness? onto their, their staff members, their employees, and where is their responsibility? So are they just kind of ticking a box, you know, sort of about this? Um, productivity, huge amount of evidence that this, that mindfulness practice plays a huge part in increasing, you know, productivity. You know, and, and we're talking about the attention economy here, that, um, you know, everything is buying for our attention. Our minds are, you know, are scattered. You know, we're being asked to think about all sorts of things, all, you know, different times. Uh, we're not getting much rest or uh, recreation. Um, you know, people's attention spans are, are diminishing. And we know that mindfulness practice does help, you know, it helps grow the prefrontal cortex, that executive functioning, you know, area. Uh, we know it decreases the amygdala, which is a lot of where our stress comes from. Um, so we're talking roughly, the, the belief is that for people who are long-term meditators, they tend to have about 40% more capacity for, you know, for focus. So one of the questions here we're having with organizations is why are they wanting to do this? Are they wanting to increase productivity? Because if, if we feel productive, you know, if we're, we're able to do the jobs that we want to do, it makes us feel better. So huge, you know, boost in emotional well-being. Or are they looking for, I guess, the equivalent of kind of battery chicken farming, you know, just to get more and more out of their, um, their people. And unfortunately, sometimes it's the latter, more often than I would, you know, like it to be. Um, it's been said that, you know, religion is the opium of the people. You know, we're starting to debate now whether mindfulness is the opium of the, of the workplace. Um, the other area we're seeing it in is leadership development. You know, this, you know, being able to learn to manage yourself, build emotional intelligence and regulation, build presence, and being really comfortable in difficult times, whether that's conversations or decision making, well, you just take a look at what's happening around us, you know, at the at the moment. And, um, you know, these are very difficult times and some very difficult conversations that are, you know, being had. So how do you lead? How do you, you know, create an organisational culture when not only you are living through difficult times, but everyone else is? And, and mindfulness meditation seems to be able to help us be a lot more um, able to, to ride sort of those waves. And so it's for all of those reasons that, you know, mindfulness is, is taking a much more central stage, you know, in the workplace. Um, but we're also saying there's a lot of myths, you know, as you know, everyone's heard of mindfulness now. Um, I kind of, I've gone off the word myself a bit. I think it's kind of been overused. It's been, you know, used to mean so many different things. So I thought I'd just go through a couple of the myths that, um, that we often kind of hear. So mindfulness and meditation are the same thing. They're not. You can be mindful without ever meditating. You know, just as if, you know, you can meditate without being mindful. You know, mindfulness, you know, for me, it's really about heightened awareness, you know, of, of body, of brain, of behavior, uh, and not necessarily, you know, all at once. You know, and one hopes that when you have that awareness, it comes with this sort of non-judgmental awareness. To be honest, most of us have to learn that non-judgmental bit. Excuse me. You know, the, the words get used interchangeably, you know, and I think it's because so many people are turning to meditation as a way of training themselves to be mindful. You know, we have this scattered gun attack on our attention. So most of us find it really difficult to focus on one thing for any length of time at depth. And so the mindful meditation courses, all the evidence is it's like boot camp for the brain you know, training your focus, improving your cognitive abilities, reducing stress, and that's what a lot of people want. And because people are using mindfulness uh, meditation to train to be mindful, that's why I think the two things get, you know, com you know confused quite a lot. Um, so yeah, courses can really fast track your mindfulness ability, but you don't have to do it. Other people find all sorts of other practices that work for them. You know, people talk about running, or cooking, 
or swimming, you know, anything that brings current moment awareness that you can bring your focus to, that can really help, you know, build all those cognitive abilities. The other thing is that, you know, a lot of people think mindfulness is about emptying your mind. Well, good luck with that. You know, I know lots of people who, you know, meditated for years and still have never been able to empty their mind. If it is empty, you're probably asleep, you know, or unconscious. You know, it's not a relaxation tool, although it can lead to that. It's an awareness tool. Um, and, and regular mindfulness practice, whether that's meditation or, or whatever else you're using, um, you know, can really bring greater self-awareness and improved awareness of what's happening around us. You know, one of the first things that happens once we, you know, start to be mindful is we actually start to notice how full our brains are. You know, and a lot of the stuff our brain's full of is um, not much use or it's quite negative. And so it can be quite disheartening or uncomfortable, you know, and also wonderful to start noticing more, but it can also be exhausting. Um, so, you know, as I say, you know, even experienced meditators, you know, very rarely have empty minds. Uh, and let's face it, empty minds at work, you know, aren't really, you know, sort of valued, you know, anyway. It's the awareness, it's the noticing that's valued. Uh, another myth, mindfulness doesn't work for me. I've downloaded the app, I've tried it, just didn't work. It does work for most people, but it's really not easy. And, and most people either give up at the early stages or they've got really unrealistic expectations to start with. Um, those who find it hardest are often the ones who benefit most, but just downloading an app will not help you focus. You know, listening to, you know, a meditation with someone with a soft voice to help you go to sleep or, you know, or to help you calm down, really useful. But for me, that's kind of the equivalent of having a glass of wine. You know, it's comforting, it's soothing, but it's only a, you know, a temporary, you know, solution. And, and to get re the real benefits, often we've got to do a lot harder work. You know, anyone that says it's easy, and I've seen the books, I've seen the courses, seven days to a relaxed mind, um, you know, sort of, you know, one year to an effective, you know, sort of leadership, you know, that's, that's marketing, you know, becoming truly mindful is really quite hard work, um, and, you know, and you can't believe, that, you know, that it's not. Um, another myth, introducing, you um, a mindfulness program will absolve me as a company from my duty of care. It won't do that and nor will it solve a management problem. You know, yes, through mindfulness practice, we can learn to be more resilient, we can handle difficult situations more effectively, you know, be more productive. You know, but it doesn't mean organisations shouldn't be dealing with the situations or the people that are causing difficulty. Um, you know, it, it may be a, you know, a poor relationship, it may be, you know, poor working practices, maybe infrastructure. They, they sit side by side, one will not solve, you know, the other. Um, so I guess, you know, one of the, you know, some of the conversations I'm having with organisations who are, you know, getting in touch is, you know, if you want to introduce mindfulness, there's a couple of things to consider. And one of those is actually a mindfulness program is not what you actually, um, you need to put in place. But if you are going to put something in place, get someone who understands both mindfulness and business. You need someone who can translate mindfulness speak into a language that workplaces understand. You know, if it sounds too foreign, people switch off and then it's just, you know, pointless. You know, you need someone who can understand organisational and team dynamics and hopefully can measure return on investment too. Um, get someone who's got a long history of practice and has been trained. At present, this is an unregulated profession without agreed standards. Now, you know, to clarify, there are centres of excellence with really robust, you know, training, but it's not all agreed upon. You know, there's a lot of amazing, you know, mindfulness teachers who haven't been trained but have a long practice. And equally, lots of enthusiastic teachers who don't have much mindfulness, you know, experience or training. And that's really important is because there is growing evidence that mindfulness practice is not without risks and it can trigger trauma in a small amount of, you know, of people. Um, if you're going to start, start with a small talk or a workshop, you know, in a professional space, people want a framework and a truthful discussion of what it can and can't do, then they can make up their own mind. 
it, it's not like a mindfulness practice because you're clinically depressed and that's the catalyst for starting. You know, there, there's got to be a different catalyst in, in the workplace and it's usually around stress, emotional intelligence, leadership and, you know, and, you know, and so on. Um, it may be that actually uh, that you don't create a, um, a mindfulness program, you know, at all. You can still take steps to create a mindful workplace, even without introducing mindfulness formally. Um, so have a, have a think about, you know, what the current, you know, what your current awareness is of your organization's state of mind. What's taking up their headspace? What's getting in the way? Most of the time it's meetings, management, interruption and emotional and unintelligence. So a couple of tips, create space, not social distancing, you know, but brain space. Consider how you do meetings. They're often, you know, one after the other. Everyone's rushed, they're annoyed because people are late. Try scheduling meetings with breaks in between so people can physically or virtually move between meetings and have the time to, um, to actually be present, you know, and to be there physically, you know, presently and mentally present. Uh, and then productivity and effectiveness, you know, um, you know, increases. Allow focus time, you know, create chunks of time that allow people to do their job without interruption. And we're talking here about a minimum of a couple of hours, depending on the task. It could be, it could be days. Deep thinking or focused thinking is so valuable, particularly because it's so rare and we need that to do a job well. And in reality, we schedule meetings all random times of day and we don't allow these big chunks of time or we're interrupted by people. So create space for you to you, you know, have time to do some deep focus, but let people know because you might enjoy that time yourself being able to focus. That might help your own mental well-being. Doesn't help the mental well-being of people who think you're just not answering their calls, you know, or, or so and don't understand, you know, what's going on. Um, and learn how the brain works, you know, how it needs, how it works best for creativity, teamwork, collaboration, leadership, you know, and learning some of this creates some life hacks that, you know, for you and your teams, all will be different for different people, but it's really going to help your, your mental um, sort of wellness across the, you know, the team. Um, if you're looking for, you know, people to, you know, to work with, I'd start with the Mindful Workplace community. You know, it's more of a think tank that uses the latest research and experience to find best practice, full of organisations who are already using this, full of teachers and academics. They're not trying to sell you anything. They will have a proper conversation and you can sit in on some of their, um, their networking and workspaces and that can help decide where, um, you know, how you might want to start introducing it into the, your organisation. And I, I think last thing I'd say is, you know, mindfulness in the workplace often starts with one person and not always at the top. Start by, you know, modeling your own behavior. Uh, pause, become aware of your own state of being, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally. You know, that's the equivalent of putting your own oxygen mask on, you know, first. So hopefully that gives you that whirlwind of, you know, sort of mindful sort of organizations. Um, and I don't know whether you've got any questions, but if anyone else has, get in touch with me on LinkedIn or email me. Um, I'm happy to chat about this, you know, all the time. Whirlwind, and with the rain pummeling the windows here, it's like, <laughs> it was a bit of a whirlwind, Kate. So I'm not sure. No, not at all. No, it was it was it was whistle stop, but it was very informative. So thank you. But I think you just opened up. You know, it's a it's a bit of a. Um, Pandora's box, isn't it? It's it's never ending, really. Yeah. It's, it's it's a huge huge subject, Emma. I was wondering if it's actually possible to be mindful remotely, and how, is there any activity? what? Be mindful remotely. Is there any activities you can do remotely? Oh, absolutely. So we we have been doing all sorts of well teaching remotely. We've often you know um, done leadership development and coaching, and and now a lot of <coughs> mindfulness training remotely. But it's about for example, if you're having sort of Zoom meetings, you know, making sure you get up, but thinking about the other person on the other side, you know, are you dealing with introverts? Are you dealing with extroverts? You know, how do you get people to, uh, you know, to be involved? Yeah, you know, we often forget that people need to stand up and go to the toilet or get a drink. Usually we would do that between physical meetings on the way and we forget. And so suddenly you're in four hours of Zoom meetings. Um, so there's all sorts of ways about being mindful. Um, 
thinking about the situations that people are in as well you know you know some of us have our own offices some of us have got you know the one room and you know a shared house there might be kids dogs postmen you know coming in and going so it's sort of being mindful that we're in a different environment and um and allowing that to be okay well, when the postman come through the door now okay <laughs> yes he's been <laughs> Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, fantastic. So I'm sorry, you haven't given your web address out yet, have you, Kate? Yeah, yeah. So it's at b3potential.com, and you can find me, Kate Reed, on LinkedIn as well. And and happy to throw around any you know conversations or uh, yeah, just discuss further. I want to hear more from you as as one of our more recent joiners of the B4 community, and uh, uh, hopefully you've got lots of good content that you can share with the rest of the community and and beyond. Yeah, no, fantastic. Brilliant. Well, good to see you looking so well and, and energetic, uh, giving us a real boost at the end of the day. So thank you for that, Kate. Okay. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you soon. Okay. See you later. Take care. Bye. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Bye-bye. Brilliant. So um, now we're on to, um, so we've got Joe Hart from Mantle. Joe, are you there? So Mantle, I'm now unmuted. <laughs> you're there, you're there. Okay, yeah. How Hi. are you? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. Yeah, Sounds like you had a bit of a traumatic afternoon, so I appreciate you uh, you joining yes. us. How's, how's the dog? Uh, fine. All good. Brilliant. Excellent. I believe. Well, well Joe, Joe um, you're from Mantle. Do you want to give a, a, a really bit of a background about Mantle and, and what you do? Um, so Mantle are a serviced office operator. Uh, we have seven locations. Um, in, uh, we've got three in Cambridge, um, one on the Cambridge Science Park, one in the centre of Cambridge and um, a, a business centre in Duxford. Uh, we've got one in Stevenage, uh, Elizabeth House in Chelmsford and our head office is at Stansted. And we provide um, serviced offices, meeting rooms, virtual offices um, and just sort of any um, office needs that people have really, especially in these times. You've forgotten the most important one, Joe. The one in Abingdon. The one in Abingdon, the main one. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so um, we launched our building in Abingdon in, in March. Uh, we opened the doors in March, literally just as um, lockdown set in. Um, so it's been a, a slow start for that building, but we've now got tenants in the building. We've got some happy tenants. Um, that are just pleased, I think, to be back in the workplace. Um, yeah, so as you came and visited us kindly last week. Um, no, 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 uh, no doubt they're happy. I mean, it's like a, like a hotel. It's uh, beautifully um, refurbished and, you know, you, you've left nothing to chance and everything's been thought of. Lovely communal areas, nice open spaces, um, really tastefully done. I can see that... Uh, it's going to be increasingly popular as, um, as hopefully we, we begin to come out of lockdown at some point in the not too distant future. Yeah. Um, we Before we sort of opened, we were looking around the Abingdon area and um, we sort of identified that there were not a lot of um, business spaces that people could go and work, you know, on an ad hoc basis, um, who, you know, can take sort of smaller serviced office space. Um, or just, you know, co-working. Um, uh, when we went into lockdown, we, we had, we thought hard about what people might want, you know, sort of moving forward. What does the, um, what will workspace look like and what will people be needing um, at this time, you know, as, as people were gradually being able to sort of come out of their homes and, and get back into the workplace. Um, and so we looked, um, identified an option, a sort of hybrid option that would allow people to um, both sort of work from home, but also have the choice to go and work in, in office space um, for one day a week, you know, two days a week, three days a week, wh whichever they, um, you know, wh whatever the need was greatest. So we launched our a new product called the Home Flexi product which allows people to just on a sort of monthly rolling basis um, choose how many you know number of days they they wanted to work in the space um, and just kind of open the doors up to let people come in and work as they need 
Which, I mean, uh, in lots of, uh, in this uncertain time, you, you're solving a massive dilemma for some people, giving them that flexibility and not putting them under, under pressure of long-term commitments. Yeah, and I think for people's well-being, you know, having having that choice that they've got the flexibility. If people are struggling to work at home, um, some people are, are used to working from home, um, but others aren't used to working from home, and so we're kind of all, all um, kind of forced to work from home, and then some people are struggling with it and we were kind of just listening to people that are saying you know we want to be able to come back in and use the office um just on short short term sort of flexible basis you know so i think it really helps people with their well-being with with, with sort of collaboration with their teams they're able to use the meeting rooms safely you know we've got sanitizers everywhere and um, you know, the social distancing in meeting rooms so people can sit safely in a room with their teams, they can collaborate um, and it just kind of boosts productivity. Um, so, yeah, it's been it's been good. It's been good to be able to, you know, facilitate that at our centres and give people that freedom and the choice to do that. There's so much larger office space available at the Lambourne in Avondin as well, haven't you? Yes, we do. Yeah, we have um, three floors of um, much larger space. So um, they are ideal for bigger occupiers that, you know, maybe have had a bigger headquarters but want to downsize into a smaller wing, but be able to use the space as as they see fit so that they might have their own reception, they might have their own meeting room area, and then they can space plan their office to suit their needs. Um, I think a lot of bigger occupiers are looking more at maybe the flexible working patterns of people and how um, they, you know, they can offer to their staff the flexible working. And, they, and so they're looking at, at finding space, you know, rather than taking on big buildings with, um, you know, long leases. They're looking at sort of the smaller space and being a bit more dynamic about um, their office space and, and where they place their teams. And uh, anybody's interested in finding out more about the Lambourne, obviously you've got the website, uh, mantle.co.uk, I think that's right. And then uh, yes. they want to come Mantle. and see it in, in the flesh. Yeah, it's mantlebusinesscenters.co.uk. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, half a bit right. Yeah, half a bit Um So if, if you go onto the website, you can easily um, click down to the locations page and find the Lambourne in Abingdon. Um, and then there it will introduce the team to you. Amanda um, is a great centre manager. Really yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she's a brilliant centre manager. Um, and she's available, you know, she's happy if people just want to do a tour and have a look around the building just to just to see what's there. She's more than happy to show people. Well, hopefully we can begin to see you um, with the people from the scene stage in the, in the not too distant future, but obviously uh, have to be on the safe side for now. But Joe, really appreciate you, you joining us this afternoon in difficult circumstances and, and give our best to the dog. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye bye. We've got the, the last of our presentations coming up now. It's gone very quick. It has gone quickly, um, yeah. So we're joined now by Catherine Pickup from Oxfordshire Mind. Hi, Catherine. Catherine has worked on Oxfordshire Mind's information line and for the community fundraising team, as well as delivering virtual training. Catherine has a specific interest in workplace wellbeing training and researched the effects of mental health and wellbeing on employees during her studies at Oxford Brooks. Hi, Catherine. Hello there. Can you hear me okay? Can, he, can, can you hear us? us? Lovely. Yeah, I can just about hear you. Yeah. Good to see you. Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. So you're going to be sharing some slides? Are you? I am, yes. I'll just Excellent. share my screen for you now. There we go. Let me know when you can see it. Yeah, I can see it. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Lovely. So, yeah, like you said, I'm Catherine. Um, I've recently joined the training team at Oxfordshire Mind. Um, I'm really passionate about workplace well-being and how we can look after ourselves and others whilst we're at work. Obviously, especially considering the amount of time that we are, will be spending at work throughout our lives. 
just a brief introduction into Oxfordshire Mind. So we support over 30,000 people a year who are experiencing mental health difficulties through a range of services across the county. Uh, as a training team, we help to raise awareness of mental health across businesses throughout Oxfordshire, um, again, through a range of different training courses. Um, and what's great is that the funds that come through those uh, those trainings, the training that we deliver, and then put back into our services to help more people across Oxfordshire who need us. Um, obviously, it's changed a lot recently with a lot with most uh, with, with all of our uh, courses now being online. So this afternoon, I'll be talking to you about some ideas just to help you maintain some good well-being as we continue to work from home. Um, things that you can do for yourself or share with others. So as we just, uh, before we get started, if we just share the definition of well-being, I know we will have heard a few different definitions um, through the course of the day, but I'd just like to share briefly the World Health Organization um, definition. So they say good well-being is um, defined as being able to be comfortable, healthy and happy, achieving your potential. So not, not about comparing yourself to anyone else, but it's about what you see as your potential. It's having that ability to cope with normal stresses of life. So stress will happen and we will have ups and downs as, as we go through our lives. But if we have good well-being, we're better able to cope with that. Well-being is also um, defined as being able to be productive. So that's not only in work, but also home life and the ability to make a contribution to your community. So what are the effects of workplace well-being on uh, working from home on our workplace well-being? So the last few months have been a catalyst that's accelerated the time it's taken us to embrace the benefits of working from home. So, for example, we've not had to have any commutes. Um, I haven't had to cycle in the rain if I don't want to, which has been great. Um, we can save time and money whilst working from home and we can work more flexibly um, and with much more autonomy. Having said that, working from home can affect our mental well-being. Working from home can feel more intense than working in the office with work and play overlapping in the same physical space. Our living space becomes our workspace. So, for example, if we have to take a difficult call and it's happened, in a, it's, then it's happened in our living area rather than a workplace that we can usually leave at the end of the day, which makes it much harder for us to switch off. It can also be really stressful and feel quite isolating when we can't see our colleagues as we usually would and can lead to a low a feeling of low self-worth if we feel like we're failing or not adapting to working from home effectively. On top of this, there's lots of anxiety around health and keeping safe at this time, which also have an impact on our well-being at the moment. The fact is we might be in this position for a while. We might be working from home, working remotely for a while longer. So through this talk, I just wanted to give you some practical ideas into how to make this work for you and for your team, just to help you keep well moving forward. And what I go through probably won't be anything new to you, but just trying to use this as a, as a reminder to get back into good habits and that you might have started earlier on in the lockdown um, just to maintain your well-being. So firstly, just a note about stress um, and the definition definition of well-being we talked about that normal stress and our brain doesn't like uncertainty so if you do feel stressed it isn't just you it's just our brain reacting to that uncertainty that's going on around us you can be reassured that it's completely normal if you're feeling stressed or unsettled due to covid and the restrictions around it however as the current situation does continue we do need to be aware that stress can cause mental health difficulties especially if that stress is prolonged and quite intense and it can impact on existing mental health difficulties too and um, shortly um, if it works hopefully you'll be able to hear a snippet from a podcast that was recorded by ian robertson um, who's a neuroscientist and clinical psychologist talking about his definition of stress so let's see if this works Stress is a perception. Mm -hmm. It's the percep yeah. it's a it's a perception <clears throat> that the demands made on you exceed your ability to cope with them, and right. the resulting emotion is anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and so, whether you experience that anxiety, whether you experience that not very pleasant emotion, depends right. on on your outlook and your you know how you perceive the situation. So if you heard that there, Ian explained about um, stress and it's whether you experience those feelings of anxiety that are caused by stress actually depend on your outlook and the actions that you take. 
So bearing this in mind, we can take action that could enable us to cope better with this stress and with the changing world that is around us and enable us to keep mentally well. So the simple practical ideas and of actions that you might be able to take that I'll discuss today will relate to two things. So one is setting a good routine for yourself and two is using separation activities to differentiate your work and home life. Really, really important as we're working from home. So regular routines are essential for our self-confidence and sense of purpose. Our brains like routines, so try to find something that works for you. Separation activities are activities that tell your brain that it's time to work or time to relax. Differentiating home and work is really important whilst working from home. And as I said earlier, working from home can feel more, much more intense. So this could be a really great way to reduce that intensity and allow us to relax after our working day is complete. So one exam example of this might be to get dressed just before work and get changed straight after, um, straight after work, just to mark that the start and the end of the day really clearly to yourself and others. Um, so I heard Anne Worrell's talk earlier, who spoke um, and highlighted the importance of, of what we're wearing as, as getting into the right mindset. So this is a really good example of that. And remember embedding these activities uh, these kinds of separation activities into your routine really helps others in the household as well to differentiate your work and home too. So for example, when you've packed all your, your work things away and gone for your after work walk, that's a really clear sign to everyone else in the household that you've finished work for the day and now, now it's time to, to relax or spend time with, with, with others. And remember by doing this, you're really creating a great example for other colleagues or children in your household and um, putting some some of these simple habits in place will allow them to see you prioritizing your well-being, setting a great example for them to do the same. So it's something that could really help us to set a, a great routine could be um, could uh, a good routine and be used as a separation activity, in fact, is exercise and keeping moving, keeping active. So this doesn't have to be anything necessarily strenuous. It's just something to get us moving, release those endorphins, those feel good hormones, even if it's just a 10 minute walk around the block or some gardening. Um, I've been doing Joe Wick's HIIT workouts over the last few months, um, which I've used to set my, my, my morning routine. Um, maybe some of you might have been doing that too. Um, and what I love is that he really focuses on the importance of exercise on your mental health as a motivator to do the exercise. So it's about how you feel after the workout rather than how you look. And physical activity, like I say, could also be used as that separation activity. I actually recently spoke to someone who gets ready for work, gets changed, then he goes for a short walk near his house so that when he comes back through the door into his home, that's when his working day begins. And this action just tells his brain it's work time, it really just almost simulates that um, commute to the office and gets you into the mentality to start work when you arrive back home. Again, moving around during the day could also help you to avoid that screen, screen fatigue um, that a lot, a lot of us will be experiencing sitting in front of the laptop um, probably more than, than usual. So do, and doing your work doesn't necessarily mean that you need to sit in front of the screen all day. So remember, we can still be thinking and planning whilst we're out for a walk or walking around the house. Um, it'll just give us a our, our, our eyes a chance to just have a rest from the screen just for a few minutes and just stops us be, becoming chair shaped really. Uh, next have a think about your working space so managing this effectively could be really useful for separating that work and home life um, and keeping mentally well. I liked how uh, in an earlier talk Professor uh, Simonetta Manfredi um, described the importance of this as it was kind of as if the office is coming into our home and those physical and psychological borders between them have been permeate, permeated. So this can impact on our mental health um, as work is kind of always on our minds whilst we're at home and potential home life difficulties or stresses are then always on our minds when we're working too. However, we are the ones that are in control of these borders. So I'm just gonna share a few ideas that might be able to help in uh, relation to your working space. So first things first, as tempting as it might be, try not to work from your bed and do get up and dressed. When working from home, it's more important than ever to have that space that's purely for sleep and relaxation. Also, try to have a dedicated room to work in and try to make it as attractive as you can. This can really help you focus and get into that working mindset in the morning. 
Now, I definitely appreciate that as a having a designated room to work in might not be accessible to everyone. For example, if you live in a one bedroom flat or maybe there are multiple people working from home at one time. And if this is the case, maybe try to create just a corner of a room that's allocated to your working or find your own way to differentiate between your working space um, and your home. Alternatively, you might actually prefer to move around during the day. So you might stand in the kitchen to send emails, um, you might walk around the house for phone calls or sit at the desk then to write your reports. Just try different ways of working and, and really see what suits you. Um, one of my colleagues sits on the sofa um, when they're having informal chats and, and phone calls and team calls with colleagues and then moves to the desk for those more formal conversations um, and meetings later. So it's, it's thinking when we're in an office, we'd, we'd move around the, the office space and the meeting rooms, depending on what kind of a meeting we're having. So again, try and simulate this at home. And a really important note on working space is do make sure that you're able to work comfortably. So talk to your manager or HR if there are barriers to doing this. Uh, just last tip on space, actually, um, is at the end of the day, what I do is, is hide my work things in uh, a designated space. So I, I um, put my, all my things in a bag and hide it in the wardrobe. Um, one of my colleagues actually puts a blanket over theirs, um, their items. And, and again, she's um, someone who works in a, a one bedroom flat, so doesn't have as much space to be um, to be completely having a, a room designated to that uh, that work so again doing this and hiding our work items just can help us switch off as we then aren't getting constant reminders of when we see our laptop or phone just sat there leading on from this do make sure that you do switch off and allow your brains just to have those breaks during that downtime switch off your work phone when you're not working as, as tempting as it can be to to kind of keep an eye on your work phone and emails try not to your brain will need a, re a break and a rest overnight to um, to be able to be more effective the next day so know when to switch off and really try to stick to this now i appreciate but that for some of us it won't be as simple as switching on at 9 a.m and switching off at 5 p.m for example those with children um time might be needed to take out the day to spend time with them and then you might actually choose to do to work later on into the evening um i've actually recently got a very energetic puppy uh, which means that i'm taking more breaks in the day than i usually would um but then starting work a little bit earlier and finishing a little bit later just to compensate so the important point though is to schedule some time into your um into your evening or your morning just so that you could have some time to relax and some time to yourself. Again, work in, when we're working from home, it can also be really tempting to take, to skip breaks. And um, I loved uh, Darren's uh, talk earlier. He mentioned having lunch al desco. So again, I think a lot of people are, are getting tempted to do this as well and not having a proper break from the screen um, to take their lunch. Um, sometimes when we are working from home, we don't feel like we can have that five minutes to take a break or step away from the computer. However, when we do take that break, it'll help us feel and stay more, much more energised. We need to be extra dis disciplined um, and aware of this when we're working from home. And if it helps, you could actually schedule in these brain breaks into your work calendar. So not only you, but even others know that you're going to be stepping away for a few minutes just to have a break. And because just think in the office, we would actually be having those natural brain breaks when maybe we're walking from one room to another or just having a chat with a colleague by the kettle whilst you're making a drink. So just try to look for ways to, to simulate this when you're in your own home. Something that's actually been raised by our training participants um, over the last few months is that some people are actually using what used to be their commuting time as extra time to do work. But remember, actually, this is extra time for us to do what we want to do. So why not use that time to, to maybe read a book, spend time with family, listen to interesting podcasts, take some time out for you. That's what it's really all about. And if you feel guilty about doing any of this, remember, we have the right as workers to be happy and healthy at work. We are allowed to switch off and it will improve our well-being and thus improve our productivity later. As I said earlier, what I'm talking to you about today isn't rocket science and you might actually be going along and noticing that some of these things you're doing already, but you might also be noticing gaps um, in what you're, you're doing and, and think of areas that you might want to work on moving forward to maintain your well-being or um, 
maybe you've even picked up some ideas that maybe you wouldn't use, but other people might do, so you might be able to pass on to, to them to help them out too. This leads on to my next piece of advice, which is stay connected. Stay connected with your colleagues and your friends. Um, connecting is really good for our mental health. It gives us that sense of belonging and, and feeling of being valued and, and accepted. By having these positive connections, we really create that network of people to turn to when we are experiencing difficult times in our work or home lives, which helps us move forward from those negative experiences more easily. So try to keep in touch with your colleagues as much as possible. Maybe you could set aside time to have non-work conversations with your team or others you haven't seen in a while who maybe you would have bumped into, a, um, into for a conversation by the kettle when you were in the office. Or even have those impromptu check-ins with your colleagues, just like you would when you'd pop, the, pop your head over the desk in the office. Be a bit spontaneous about it. Within our team, we actually have uh, regular team meetings. So just half an hour, um, a couple of times a week just to talk about something other than work. Sometimes we might incorporate a little quiz or a round of dingbats um, or just share photos of walks we've been on recently. Um, it just gives us a bit of an opportunity to just have a little bit of fun um, and talk, to, talk about something other than work and check in on each other. Uh, one of my colleagues actually during those check-ins is usually on a, a lunchtime walk um, as they're, you know, they're really in, uh, an informal time um, and they, they allow my colleague to get out and about during the day. And especially with us getting into uh, getting it, especially with it getting darker um, into the evenings, into kind of through autumn, into winter, being flexible and getting out and about in the middle of the day, maybe rather than after work or in the evenings will be really important moving forward. As an organisation, um, we have continued to do our tier three, um, which we used to do whilst we were in the office. So uh, normally in our tier three on a Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock, everyone would usually stop working for half an hour or so, gather around the kettle and usually um, some baked goods would, goods would be involved as well. And the only rule is that we can't talk about work. And we've kept this going now, and although it's now virtual. We've also got a virtual wellbeing afternoon every few months. Um, that's for everyone who works at Oxfordshire Mines. So basically a huge teams call with a hundred plus people signed on. Uh, so far we've done Ready Steady Cook. Um, we've done a Guess the Baby. We've done some quizzes. Um, another colleague uh, held a session of chair yoga. So we've just been doing little things just to have a bit of fun um, and allow us to see the faces of our colleagues that we haven't seen in person for, for several months. Getting to know our colleagues really allows us to better notice if they're acting differently and might be struggling. So staying connected with them really gives that opportunity to provide support where we can and make sure that we can look after our colleagues too. Just a few other um, ideas that I quite liked that I've come up in training that we've done over the last few months. Um, some ideas from our training participants. So one participant actually shared their idea of a phone picnic. So this involved, um, she decided she needed a bit of a break from the screens, um, like a lot of us do at the moment. And, and what she did, she got a friend, her friends together in their respective living areas. Everyone made themselves a little picnic and put their phones on speaker next to them. And they had just a catch up over the phone without having to look at any screens. And I thought that was a really nice idea, still getting to know, uh, still getting that time to catch up with each other, but without having to stare at a screen and do Zoom meetings and things like that. Another participant um, to, again, differentiate that work and home life balance and just make sure that they can stick to their routine actually sets their alarm 15 minutes before the end of the working day. So that means that they then at that point they start logging off, tidying up, winding down so then they can actually switch off when they plan to, meaning that they can finish there and start their home time at that point. Um, another training participant at the end of every week they actually write down and think of their achievements and positives that have happened in the week previously and um, before they switch off for the weekend. And I've actually started doing that myself since, since they told me about that. So at the end of every working week, you end it on a positive note. And when you're doing that little activity just for a couple of minutes at the end of, you know, on a Friday afternoon, it's a sign that the weekend has begun. Again, it's those things like those separation activities that I talked about earlier, really getting your mindset from work to home and vice versa. So proactively embedding some of these habits and some of these separation activities into your day-to-day -day routine 
will really enhance your ability to adapt to these changes as we continue and will really help to be able to promote positive well-being for yourselves and others. So just two last things before I finish. Um, firstly, if you are struggling or if you are feeling low, do talk to a friend or your line manager or a colleague. You can also call Oxfordshire Mines information line to find out a little bit more about um, what, what services are available to you across the county, not only as, as in our charity, but charities and organisations across Oxfordshire. There's lots of, of support out there. I actually volunteered on the information line before I started working for Oxfordshire Mind and really think it's a, a great source of information if you're experiencing mental health difficulties or if you know someone who is. I almost see it as that front door to the services where you can find out how we can support you and how others can support you too. And remember, these aren't normal times. So it might be actually um, that not possible to apply those normal work practices um, or have that kind of normal output that we normally do. So remember just to take it easy on yourselves. If any of these routines or habits or activities that I've mentioned that you might take up, if they go out of the window and you end up spending your day in pajamas or working from the sofa all day or feeling stressed and unproductive, please don't be too hard on yourself. It's a very, very strange time. And let's just acknowledge that we're all in the same boat. We're all in this together and we will pull through this. Now, this has obviously been a bit of a whistle top. Uh, whistle stop tour um, about working well from home. Uh, if you are interested in our workplace wellbeing training or know anyone else who might be, um, here's just a few of the other online courses that we're offering at the moment at Oxfordshire Mind. Um, we have a range from uh, our one hour five ways to wellbeing workshops uh, to our more kind of time intensive mental health first aid where you can get the qualified become a qualified mental health first aider. Um, and in celebration of World Mental Health Day coming up shortly, um, we're actually offering 10% off our five ways to wellbeing workshops throughout October. Um, so this would be a really great addition to maybe your virtual team away day or maybe a relevant team building, building activity um, that you incorporate into your team's calendar. There's lots of information on our website and, and social media. So feel free to get, with, get in touch with us um, as well if you do want any information. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you've picked up a few ideas um, to help you keep mentally well as we go, um, as we move forward. Um, I hope you enjoy the closing sessions um, and stay safe, healthy and happy. Keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I really appreciate that great presentation. Uh, are you keeping well? Yeah, I'm, I'm keeping well. Thank you. Well, ups and downs as as everyone, but but generally well. Yes, thank you. Okay, we'll pass on our best wishes to uh, to the rest of the team. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the time. We've just got a couple of videos now. Hi everybody, right, we're back for the final session and one missing piece of our jigsaw today was Melissa Noten. Mel, Mel, are you there? I am here, yes, hello, sorry for being very late. No, no, no it was no, great to see you and um, how did the presentation go earlier? Really well, to myself, well practiced now. <laughs> did you get any questions? No, I was a very, very compliant audience. Oh, well done, excellent. So, so a bit of background, Mel was recently, recently retired from 31 years of nursing and mental health services, uh, finally being a service manager for CAMS Oxfordshire, where she was part of the senior leadership team implementing a full service transformation. During her time working clinically as a nurse and health visitor and as a senior manager, Mel wrote and delivered clinical coaching and supervision training. She's now working freelance as a coach, specialising in coaching for executives and senior managers and leaders. 
So Mel, although we haven't got time, unfortunately, to see your presentation, and, and if you could give us a contact that anybody interested in seeing your presentation um, can get in contact with you and you can send it to them. Could you maybe just give us sort of a flavour of what you were going to be talking about earlier today? Yeah, so um, I was talking about maintaining mental health and well-being when working from home. Um, and I think there are some clear principles that we can take from um, leadership, from coaching, from reflective thinking that really help promote good, solid resilience and, and mental well-being at home when you're uh, perhaps at higher risk because you're in isolation. Um, it's in a different environment. You haven't got your normal coping strategies there. So it's using some of the tools that, that are much more familiar to other areas, bringing them in to, to work with you from home um, and thinking about actually just understanding and acknowledging that mental health is about promoting well-being, not just about illness. So we need to be responsible about our own mental health as well as we are about physical health and think about them equally alongside each other. And some of the models would be things like, um, there's a reflective cycle by a chap called Kolb, K-O-L-B, and it just gives you four stages of reflective thinking. And there's a coaching model um, called GROW, G-R-O-W. And again, you can look these up on the internet and they give you really structured ways of thinking and processing your thoughts and feelings in order to keep on track and on top of things. Fantastic. And, and, and how have you been during, um, during lockdown and you know, people that you've been in contact with, what sort of trends have you been spotting, good, good and bad? Um, I, I think it's, but it's been on the news recently that I think um, the mental health, uh, mental illness side of things has been escalating. Um, and I, I, in no small part, I think that's to do with isolation and um, people perhaps not really having known themselves so well before. They just were in a habit that worked really well for them. Um, one very obvious thing that's been missing for, for a lot of people is perhaps that normal morning banter that you get when you go into an office um, and you say hello to everybody and you have a quick cup of tea and you download what happened the night before and reset yourself for the day and then we're not doing that when, we, when we're working from home unless we actually put the effort in to make those contacts so I think it's I think that some people have been extremely good and quick about knowing their own weak spots and filling them and some people have thought it will just carry on being okay and that isn't necessarily gonna gonna get the right result for them so if anybody i mean so you're now coaching so in terms of engaging with you going forward and potentially having a look at your presentation that you were doing going to do for us earlier what's the best way to get in contact with email um so i'm on linkedin um and my email is melissa noton at icloud.com um, and I'm very happy to be contacted through B4 or through LinkedIn um, for anyone who wants to get in touch and get some further information or hold a further discussion about it. Perfect. Really appreciate you jumping on the call to, to recap on, on, your, on your presentation earlier. Great to see you and hopefully next time we do this we, we can get you on for the full presentation. But thank you again for joining us. Good to see you, Mel. Take care. Right. Don, I see we, you, you joined us. How are you, Don? Um, I'm very good. You look as fresh as a daisy, you two. Well, I'm not quite sure what to say to that because I can assure you I don't feel as fresh as a daisy. But uh, there you go. How are you? Uh, have you been with us most of the day? I've been with you for about 40% of the day. I think not oh, quite half. Not good enough. Your, your attendance record is normally a lot higher. <laughs> now, I, I, I got some really great presentations. Um, I... I, Frank was awesome, Frank Negrello, and you, you, you've got to admire organizations like Unipart who put just so much thought and resource and care into all they do to support their employees. And you, you, you kind of go, if I could grab just 1% of that, I'd be massively better off, but they're, they're so impressive. I, I was watching Ian Hudspeth and thinking, you know, th 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 there was this myth I'm sure it was a myth always that you know the private sector was entrepreneurial and flexible and responsive but the public sector was you know couldn't change was slow and everything but my word in the last six months the county councils the district councils town councils everywhere 
they, they've killed that idea. The way their teams have just turned their hand to anything is just, yeah, it's a lesson to everyone. And then I, I was watching Darren from Aston and James earlier and just like, what really caught my eye was the kind of longer term thinking of, we will go back to workplaces more, but we're going to have to be an awful lot safer about it. And yeah, some of the ideas he was sharing and some of the kits they've got was, was really, really interesting. But my biggest, absolute biggest takeaway from the day was yeah, the exercise, the nutrition. I, I watched um, Helen Money on nutrition that, and yeah, I just haven't looked at that. And once upon a time, we'd all be going, oh, it's no, it's no one's, it's no employer's business to start telling employees how they should exercise and what they should eat and that. But I think it, it's become such a big collective thing that people want to share that kind of insight and information. And, and the, just as we saw Frank and Unipart are able to get quite extraordinary levels of resource and advice for their staff, yeah, equally, the B4 community and big employers can really draw in that kind of thing to support their staff. And I think these days, most staff appreciate it. And yeah, I've not had enough exercise. I have definitely not had enough exercise. And I did find myself running out of, I can't remember whose presentation it was, but I actually ran out and got my vitamin D supplement and took it. Uh, excellent. Well, you look well, Dom, anyway. So uh, this is a bit of an un unfair four-sided conversation because we've been joined for the fi final stop by Wendy, uh, Wendy Ball, Head of Events at the Ashmolean. But unfortunately, although you might be able to hear Wendy, Wendy hasn't got a clue what you're saying because she hasn't got an earpiece, unfortunately. So uh, Dom's just recapping on the day and saying how unfit he is and how uh, lacking in vitamin D he is. So he tried to address both of those uh, this afternoon. But uh, so, um, so thank you, Dom, again for, for, for hosting us. It's been a wonderful venue to, to host from. It's, we, we were concerned about the rain and whether it would be um, audible, but um, I presume you can't hear the rain banging off the, the orangery, um, but it's a pretty murky day here and you're only in Cumna, so I'm, I'm sure you're getting rain as well. It's not actually leaking through onto you. If you look at the roof, <laughs> <laughs> mm, a bit dodgy. <laughs> You're not selling it, Doc. Thanks for coming <laughs> here for functions at some stage in the future. But thank you uh, very much. By all means, uh, you, you can hang around and, and listen to the, the final exchanges we, we have with Wendy before uh, we draw to a close. But um, really appreciate all your support. And um, stay around and listen to Wendy. Please, please do. do. Please do. So Wendy Ball, good to Hello. good to have you. So. To those of you that have been joining us during the day, we've been plugging that we've got um, uh, our next B41 is going to be hosted by your good selves on the 25th of November. And the subject's going to be um, equality, diversity and inclusion. What have you, um, you've been here today watching uh, as, a, as a silent observer. What have you, what have you learned from today? I have, um, and I've been very impressed. Um, not least, I mean, the team, if we could turn the cameras round, you would see that this... Well, I'm sure we can, but they just don't want to. They're quite, they're quite happy filming, but they don't like to be filmed. incredible team of people behind this, and um, they are making it look very smooth. And I think the big take-home is the, you've got to have a great AV team, which we have, which is fantastic. Obviously, it goes without saying, got a great venue. Thanks, Dom, it's brilliant. Um, I think, as far as we're all concerned, and we've talked about this earlier, you need to feel confident in doing what you're doing because actually it's quite different for all of us. Being, you know, walking into a space where you would ordinarily expect to have an audience, uh, an in-person audience of sort of 80 people, suddenly you haven't. So you've got to be able to cope with those kind of changes, those silences that you wouldn't ordinarily get. But as I said before, I think, you know, the, the big learnings from this is that more we do it, the more comfortable we'll get at doing it. And so really looking forward to the end of November. And so give us a little bit of an insight into life during lockdown at the Ashmolean and, and what you're doing now. And you had a, a, a fantastically successful hybrid event recently. Gives a little bit of insight into life at the Ashmolean. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll take that if I can remember in the, in the right order. Um, going into lockdown, it all happened uh, quickly and uh, whilst unexpected, it happened relatively easily. Um, closing the doors is a lot easier than reopening them, if I'm honest. Um, so the minute we closed them, we started to look at how we could reopen them safely. And that became sort of a bit of a life's work. We were able to take advantage of the furlough scheme for a lot of our staff, variable hours and full-time staff. Um, but many of us used our 
time to assist the museum in other ways. So you, again, I think we've talked about this before, I know Megan talked about it earlier with Blenheim, there are people that ordinarily would be doing one job, they'll be doing, doing another job, they'll be doing several different jobs. So we did find the same at the museum. Um, many of the teams carried on throughout, so the security team carried on throughout. Uh, obviously all the objects still needed to be protected throughout, so all of those things carried on even though the doors were closed. But we were able to open again successfully on 10th of August. And I would just encourage people to go back now because actually it's relatively quiet at the moment. People are pre-booking. Um, our capacities are a lot lower to keep people socially distanced, keep people safe. But actually it's a really nice time to go to the museum, exactly for those reasons. Fantastic. You are an Ashmolean girl? I am. I love going to the Ashmolean. And now I know that you can go and you can pre-book and, and you get almost a new, um, you know, there's not many people around so you can spend longer. Mm. Uh, I'm definitely going to be going. Great, it'd be good to see you. You're going to be pretty busy after all these talks I today. Know, I know, I am going to be busy. I've got to sort my nutrition out, I've got to <laughs> exercise more. Well you can take on Dom's 5-2 diet, that's, uh, we don't know, no, no, Christ, you don't need to, I mean, he's the expert of the 5-2, it's 5-2 two, you've done, you done, isn't it Dom? Is I can okay? hear you, you can talk. <laughs> Oh, can I? Okay. Yeah, it was the 5-2. It is the 5-2, and um, it's been really, really effective, and even I can stick to it. Well, there you go. Yeah. Did you see Dom earlier? When, were you here with Dom earlier? No, I was just arriving as Dom was doing his piece. Yeah, he's, he's half the man he was, so... Uh... Yeah, I walked you in. See, you can't even remember that that was Dom that walked you in. Oh, no, no, I remember <laughs> so him walking me in. I thought you meant, did I see him presenting? Oh, no, no. No, I remember that. But you see, for, five, for my, me, for five too, because I don't know what this amazing diet you've been on, we're just looking at, um, almost following in your footsteps, actually, Dom, because we're looking at doing afternoon teas again. And so for me, five is the five items on the, on the bottom plate and then the two items on the top plate of a tea tray. And that's the diet I've been following for the last couple of weeks, making sure we get it just right. <laughs> feel, feel free to respond via me, Dom, if you want. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think Wendy's 5-2 sounds a lot more attractive than mine. Apparently your 5-2 sounds a lot more attractive than Dom's. I'm sure it is. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> and tell Wendy I'll be there to sample the first one. I feel like I should be translating into another language. <laughs> He'll be there to sample the first one and end. I'm not going to keep doing this. Please do. Open tomorrow, actually. Afternoon tea bookings from tomorrow for a month. Really? So, yeah, literally hot off the press. The elite email's about to go out, so, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, well, good stuff. For a month. Brilliant. Well, great to see you, Wendy. I appreciate you coming in and observing, and um, maybe you can give us a, a bit of a debrief later on. But we look forward to coming to see, to see you in November. Yeah. So, equality, diversity, and inclusion, another really important subject, and hopefully we've got uh, Zaha is going to be um, joining us on video, I think, or... Uh, Depending on what the programme is, course, we'll yeah. get the right people in to have a yeah. conversation and, and, and take part, very much keen to participate, so yeah. Brilliant, Absolutely. fantastic. Dom, final word from you? Uh, just a big thank you. Right through this, B4 has been an inspiration to the whole of the business community, and I bet yet again you and Emma and Lorna and everyone else who's there is completely exhausted. But thank you for this incredibly worthwhile day. You continue to lift us all. Oh, bless you. Thank you, Dom. Dom was just saying what a, a horrendous community B4 is. No, no, he, was, he just, no, but it's, it's oh, oh dear. I'm quite good at I won't need to, Dom. I agree. I won't need to translate that one. <laughs> that wasn't 5-2, that was just 1-1, one, one, I think. But brilliant, no, thank you, Dom. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you to Barbara, to Abby, to Lorna, to Matt, to Rob, to Clark, to Justin and to Ed, and of course to Emma, uh, my co-host, and thanks to everybody for joining us today. Um, all of the talks will be available um, on video uh, maybe next week, I think, um, after we've had a bit, bit of a break. But uh, thank you again to everybody for joining us. So next one, Wednesday, 25th of November, live from the Ashmolean, EDI, Quality, Diversity and Inclusion, um, don't forget World Mental Health Day on the 10th of October and uh, afternoon tea at the Ashmolean from tomorrow. So on the, that note, and maybe afternoon tea at Blenheim as well. We'll maybe go and have a pizza with Megan if she's still in there. Take care everybody, thank you very much. Thank you.